नमस्कार सुप्रभात गांधीनगर केम छो मजा में एसीएम इंडिया ना वार्षिक कार्यक्रम में बदा महानुभावों सहभागी स्वागत है आपनी आटली मोटी उपस्थिति ये खरेखर आयोजक उत्साह में वारो करे छे। आशा छे कि तमने आ कार्यक्रम थी फायदो थे गुड मॉर्निंग एंड वेलकम टू द कलरफुल एंड वाइब्रंट गुजरात द लैंड ऑफ लेजेंड्स एंड लायंस द लैंड ऑफ लॉर्ड कृष्णा एंड महात्मा गांधी अवर हार्ट फेल ग्रेटिट्यूड टू आई आई टी गांधीनगर एंड ए सी एम इंडिया अहमदाबाद चैप्टर फॉर बींग वंडरफुल होस्ट्स वी एन्जॉय द टेस्टी फूड the music over the garden and the beautiful campus the organizing team has been very great and has made our stay very comfortable the hospitality of gujarat ke to kya kehne uh, to begin i would start of the event to uh, give the welcome address i request ahmedabad chapter pass chair dr hina timani who is also the acmw india chair Uh, to please come and give the welcome address a very good well morning and welcome to one and all present here for acm annual event at iit gandhinagar it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of acm india acm women india acm ahmedabad and gandhinagar professional chapter and computer science and engineering department of iit gandhinagar i welcome our distinguished guests dignitaries acm council members professors and researchers and students to acm annual event here we have with us professor cherry pancake from acm as a president professor vicky hansen as ceo of acm and uh, petrayan as a coo of acm and president abhiram ranade Prof professor abhiram ranade from iit bombay as president of acm india i welcome you all on behalf of iit gandhinagar and computer science department of Ga iit gandhinagar thank you hina uh, next i would uh, request professor harish pm who is the dean of student affairs iit gandhinagar to share his kind words please good morning everybody great to see such a strong participation so i would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of the guests and participants uh, it's an absolutely great pleasure to uh, great pleasure for iit gandhinagar to host acm india's annual event and it's really great to see so many of you here from so many different places so as you spend the rest of the day today and many of you i take it have also spent yesterday here Uh, i hope you are also able to experience iit gandhinagar the ambience of iit gandhinagar campus life the culture of iit gandhinagar and i hope you are able to see and experience in my mind three of the most unique aspects of iit gandhinagar and in my mind they are one i would say innovativeness and consequently distinctiveness and i will uh, say what i mean by that uh second i would say inclusivity and flexibility although they are two very different things i think they do go hand in hand uh and third uh, i would say just focus on excellence i hope you are able to see some of this over over the time you are spending here so in terms of innovativeness and distinct distinctiveness perhaps that's the most easiest thing to observe while you are walking around in campus you might see how the campus design has been shaped with new thoughts that there are 
no separate department buildings. They are all mixed together. Interdisciplinar interdisciplinarity is built into the culture. How uh, an electrical engineering PhD student can have a computer science uh, advisor as their sole advisor, there's a lot of flexibility uh, also built into the system. But you might also see the innovativeness in how the curriculum is uh, structured, for instance, how the dual major program is structured, where somebody gets in with an admission in mechanical engineering, but can pursue, after they join here, pursue two BTEC programs in parallel. They could get a BTEC in computer science and BTEC in mechanical engineering. You might also see the innovativeness in how we uh, structure some of our flagship programs, such as uh, start early PhD fellowship or early admit MTech fellowship. In these programs, an undergraduate student pursuing BTEC from any other college, after their third year undergraduate, uh, during their undergraduate program, they can apply to the direct PhD program here, even without having given gate, and they could get an admit here for a direct PhD right after they finish their third year. So there are very, uh, there are many things like that that we have tried uh, to respond to the current needs of the situation and you know, make it innovative and distinctive. Uh, coming to the second point of inclusivity and flexibility, that again, perhaps you will notice while you're walking around, but it's a little bit more hidden. You have to dig a little deeper. You might notice there are no boundary walls within the campus. Nobody is excluded from going anywhere. So if you, in the evening, want to walk, up to the hostels, have a cup of coffee there, you are most welcome there. Nobody will stop you, nobody will say, you know, sign in before you go into this area. We, we have tried to build inclusivity into everything that we do here, whether it's uh, welcoming outside students to spend summer uh, here, or doing a project here. And with that, I said, flexibility is also part of that. For instance, if any of you want to spend a summer here, uh, even if there's no formal arrangements, if it's a project worth doing, uh, IIT Gandhinagar has mechanisms to make it work. Right? If it's a special project which is outside the norms of uh, the usual kind of projects, IIT Gandhinagar has been flexible enough to figure out what it takes to make it work, and so on and so forth. So I hope you see a little bit of that as well. Um, and, then, uh, and then the third aspect, is a little bit harder to see, but uh, I'm sure you will see the focus on excellence if you look into how we are recruiting our people, for instance. The focus has been on long-term excellence, even if it sometimes means avoiding temptations for short-term gains, right? Avoiding temptation to boost up numbers, avoiding temptation to, to scale up quickly. Right? Our focus has always been on quality. And that you would also see in other aspects in terms of how much emphasis we are placing on culture, how much emphasis we are placing on citizenship, good citizenship of the institute, where everybody is, is taking ownership of how the institute grows. You know, somebody like uh, Neil Dara Mishra, who is you know, associate dean uh, of external communications as a young professor, is taking so much time to is, is really investing so much of our time in the growth of the institute. We think these all will bring long-term gains and long-term excellence, even though short-term, you know, it may handicap us a little bit. So anyway, with that, I again want to extend a warm welcome to all of you. I wish you a very productive day, and uh, uh, welcome to IIT Gandhinagar, and thank you, ACM India. Thank you, Professor Harish, for introducing us to the innovative and inclusive environment of IIT Gandhinagar, and for your kind words of encouragement for the ACM India mm -hmm. event. Uh, we are proud to be associated with ACM, which is the world's largest computing society that strengthens the community's voice through its leadership and promotion of high standards. It brings together educators, resources, and addresses challenges in the field of computing. 
On the global scale, ACM has gone greater heights. May I request Dr. Sherry M. Pancake, President ACM, to please come on stage and present the ACM report. I'm very grateful. Oh, is the mic on? Okay, thank you. I'm very grateful to the ACM India Council, ACMW, and IIT Gandhi Nagar for inviting me to come and speak with you. The India Council asked me if I'd talk a little about ACM, the international organization, and I thought it might be fun to tell you what are the things I really love about ACM and why have I spent 30 years working as an ACM volunteer in different capacities? We're all here because of ACM and as you may have already heard, ACM is the world's oldest society for computing professionals. You might not know that it was founded in 1947 by some of the world's very first computer scientists and their goal was to, and this is exactly what they said, to advance the science development, construction, and application of the new machinery for computing reasoning and other handling of information. I actually think they were pretty forward thinking to come up with this as the goal 70 years ago because it certainly still applies to what is happening today. And today, we're not only the oldest computing society, we're also the largest one. Uh, we've shortened our goal statement a little bit, and we tend to think of it as our goal is to advance computing as both a science and as a profession. But I'd like to talk to you about some of the things that make ACM unique. In a typical professional organization, what is offered to members is some kind of suite of services or products, and members pay dues or fees in order to get them. So it may be things like conferences and publications and special events. It may be software certification, licensing, that kind of thing. But the key difference between ACM and most other professional societies is that they tend to be run by people whose business is to manage not-for-profit societies. Why is that different from ACM? Well, fundamentally, ACM is what we call a volunteer-driven organization. That means that all the major decisions are made by people who are members and are volunteering their time, just like the members of ACM India Council the members of all of our committees, councils, conferences. So volunteers are the ones who decide which conferences we should have, which publications we should have, when we should start new awards, what kinds of initiatives we should have in primary school computing education, even things like where do we invest our funds and how do we handle the finances. We do have paid staff from ACM, but it's a relatively small number of people, and their role is not to make the decisions and tell members what they're offering as products. Their role is to support the decisions that volunteers make and to help with the implementation details. And so this kind of volunteer-driven approach is what makes ACM really unique, and it is the key to ACM's success over the last 70 years. So who is part of ACM? You know, it's a big global organization. We have kind of a flexible approach to membership. You may have noticed, if you've been involved with thing, different activities from ACM, that very few things actually require membership. The things that do are the ones that cost a lot per person. So conferences tend to have registration fees 
because they're expensive and it depends on the number of people who come. The digital library has subscriptions that often institutions do because the cost is fairly significant. But the truth is there are a bunch of kinds of membership and you don't have to be a member to take advantage of ACM's products and services. In terms of what kinds of membership we have, I'm going to ask you, how many of you are members of ACM India? Okay, how many of you are members of a student chapter or a professional chapter, either a SIG chapter or an ACM regional chapter? Okay, so some of you still don't know about those things and have lots of opportunities. How many of you are members of ACMW, ACM's Community for Women in Computing? So there are lots of things you can still learn about and see why it could benefit you to be, there are all kinds of memberships you can have and it depends on what you're interested in. So I'm going to talk just very generally about how our 100,000 or so members worldwide look at what we provide. Now, I will say that that number does not include the people who are members just of chapters. We don't track that in the same way. So let's do a little pop quiz. And you don't actually have to answer out loud, but I'm going to give you a chance to think of your answer because I want to see how well you can guess about ACM. We have roughly 100,000 members, we're not counting chapters. So how many countries do members work in? Have you got a number? The right number is about 190 countries around the globe. What percentage work outside North America? Roughly half, and the percentage keeps increasing. How many identify as males? Now you know in our field, it's very dominated by males. So about 75, but I should note that about 13% don't answer that question, so we don't necessarily know. And what percentage work in research and education versus how many work in actually developing and deploying software and systems? It's about 50-50. Now, I'll say I was surprised to find out I came out of an academic background myself, a research background. I was surprised to find out how many people from industry are actually involved with ACM worldwide. We're sort of a tiered community, and we only track some kinds of these memberships. So we have what I've shown here is volunteer leadership at the top, but under that we have the special interest groups and conferences, and each of those have their own leadership and organization and volunteers. And under that, we have all these other members who are members of ACM, members of SIGs, members of chapters, but who else? This is, ACM reaches a lot more people, hundreds of speakers and awardees every year, thousands of authors, and reviewers every year involved with our publications, tens of thousands of event attendees and participants, and millions of readers and listeners for our online products. So ASEAN is huge. Understanding all it does gets very hard. Even as president, I'm still learning more about what it does but it's because we are trying to reach everybody who is involved in the field of computing, regardless of whether they're an educator, a researcher, a student, a software developer, an executive at a computing company. So let's take a very quick look at what some of those products are. When I first got involved with ACM, the things I was familiar with were the ones that researchers know about conferences and workshops, journals, proceedings, the digital library, travel grants. The next piece I learned about was what else ACM does for educators. 
And you probably don't know these as well. Curriculum guidelines, we have many of them used all over the world. We have the Code of Ethics, which is the guidelines for professionals in computing. Online learning resources, training series, books, if you haven't gone and looked at any of those, you're missing out on a lot. We have student chapters, and we have publications that are strictly for students. And it wasn't really until, say, the last 10 years that I started learning all the things that we do for people who are busy developing and implying, applying technology. We tend to call them practitioners to distinguish them from researchers and educators, so that's the word I'll use right now. But the products they're most likely to know are a couple of our journals and the Code of Ethics, but also we do a whole series of tech talks, which are webinars that are available both uh, synchronously and on demand on the web. Our learning resources with the training and the book are really particularly for this audience. And then lots of different kinds of local activities, distinguished speakers, meetups, local and SIG chapters that they can participate in. So ACM does a whole lot of things, and I encourage you to learn more about them. We also do awards, and of course I have to mention that because you're going to see and hear from some of our top award winners from this year today as they give you presentations. So I'm really delighted that they, so many of them were able to come. We have major speakers programs and special activities, and one thing you really might know, not know about is that we're getting very involved in technology policy because there are so many social issues that are being affected by policy, so we've gotten very active in that field. We're always adding new things. We have special activities for women in computing, like ACMW's meeting yesterday. And the reason I mention these things is, first of all, for you to view ACM as a resource for you at any stage in your career. As your needs change over time, as you get different jobs or go back to school, we have resources that can help you. But more importantly, ACM is volunteer driven. So I'm hoping some of you will decide to volunteer your time and effort to get involved in ACM activities and help us keep ACM vibrant. Volunteering can help you. It certainly has helped me and all the other volunteers I know. We're, we go there because we're inspired to work through ACM to make some kind of a difference, but it also makes a lot of opportunities for us to learn from the other people we interact with. It helps us grow as individuals. Whenever we're having to discuss things and decide things as volunteer groups, we learn to, to build new relationships, we gain all kinds of experience in leadership, we have a multiplier effect. I can't do anything on my own that will have a huge impact, but by banding together with other volunteers and with ACM as an organization behind us, we can end up having global impact on things like computing education and how computing contributes to a safer environment for all of us. And finally, it gives us a unique opportunity to build our own personal and professional networks, to extend them to new people we would not meet through any other way. So again, ACM would not exist without its members and especially its volunteers. And for that reason, I'd like to give a special thank you to ACM India Council, a and the other groups that are represented here, like ACMW India and CS Pashala, all the other volunteer represented groups. Your energy and enthusiasm that I've had a chance to see over the last couple of days is truly inspiring, and I encourage you to keep doing this and working together, because we can make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sherry.
for an inspiring introduction to ACM, and I really feel proud to be part of such a great organization. Through year, ACM India also has done great job through its strong branches of student and professional chapters, which have been working to make CS interesting to the community and contributing to the academia and research. I would request ACM India President Professor Abhiram Ranade to come and present the report for 2019. On. Okay, good morning. It's really great to be here. It's always great to be in IIT Gandhinagar. I think it's, I, I think as the dean said, it really is a unique campus and there certainly is a spirit about it. And I would like to thank the organizers of this event for having done a terrific job and for their hospitality. I'm going to, I'm going to give a brief account of the work that the ACM India Council has been doing over the last year or so. Okay. So uh, let me begin with some highlights. Our council was established in, to, in uh, 2010, and uh, our goal is uh, similar to what ACM's goal is, to advance computing as a science and profession, but of course in India. And uh, the things that are dear to us are again paralleling what they are for ACM, so we would like to do things with research, education, we would like to uh, work for uh, professionals, continuing education, and we would like to establish linkages between industry and uh, academia, and we would also like to influence policy. Uh, gender issues, equity of uh, men and women in the work, workforce, and in general, is a topic very close to the values of ACM, and we are certainly committed to those values as well. And in some sense, we would like to be the voice of the Indian IT community, the Indian computing community, and as we go along, we are discovering that there are people who are in need of uh, being helped, and uh, they are in need of the kinds of activities that I'm going to talk about. But at the same time, there are people who are willing to contribute those activities and contribute efforts. And we can see that the people who are contributing are feeling, are getting a sense of fulfillment as much as the people who are helping. And that is really something that ACM, is, uh, ACM stands for, so people helping who are who are learning and getting a sense of uh, fulfillment, as well as helping out people who are in need. Okay. Um, we are, in India, there are about 10,000 uh, members, ACM members, 215 student chapters, 20 professional chapters. So that's a fairly substantial, uh, a substantial community. Okay. What do we do for research? Well, our, our major event, I guess our major, uh, one of our major initiatives is we have instituted this doctoral dissertation award for PhDs done in Indian institutions over the, last, over the corresponding academic year. And you will see that we will be awarding this award uh, in, the next, in the next hour or so. We bring leading conferences to India, and these are some of the conferences that we have brought to India recently, ICSC, POPL, VLDB, Mobicon, ICPE, and these are major conferences, and they bring in enthusiasm and they bring in exposure to the Indian community of what is going on at the international level. Okay. We give travel grants, and ACM and IARCS, which is another uh, uh, volunteer organization, together team up to give travel grants to uh, uh, good papers which have been accepted into uh, ma major conferences, so we support their travel. And this is a substantial program. Last year we gave grants of the order of 40 lakhs. Okay. 
we yesterday, if you were there yesterday and the day before, we had a program where PhD students uh, uh, showcased their work, and uh, there were events in which we we had uh, uh, we had people talking about how the PhD process is, what to expect if you become a faculty member, and so we offer guidance uh, regarding that. We do a PhD production survey, which is really important. We want to know where, where we are and where we, where, what are our targets and what are our bottlenecks, things like that. With, together with Microsoft Research, we hold a, uh, a academic research summit. And every year, this, is on different, this has different themes. The theme for this year was computer security. And this was just concluded in Goa about a month, about 15, 20 days ago. We have special interest groups in India, and uh, these are ISOFT, uh, IKDD, and six CSE, so uh, software engineering and uh, 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 data science and uh, uh, computer science education. And they have their conferences, and these are also, these are also quite popular and uh, vibrant. Okay. On education, in the, in the last year, we held 11 summer and winter schools. So each of these schools was supported with uh, industry partners, and I would like to extend uh, thanks to them. And they trained about, each school trained about 40 students, senior, undergraduate, and graduate, in various, various uh, spe spe uh, upcoming fields. And these are turning out to be very popular, and I think we will have a similar number, probably increased number, this year as well. So please, please look out for them. Please take advantage, to them, advantage of them. Okay. We have also worked on liaisoning with uh, uh, regulatory bodies to reform CS education. So CS education is something we are deeply concerned with, and specifically in the Indian context, we believe that there is a lot of work to be done. There is a lot of work to be done because, um, because, because frankly, I mean, as everybody knows, as everybody, as it gets talked uh, talked about in uh, newspapers, um, there are there is a long way for Indian education to go uh, to make it really deep and make our graduates be able to serve industry very well. And to this, to this end, we are working with uh, bodies like AICTE. And we have talked to them. We have got a mandate from them to design uh, courses, say the introductory programming course. And we have also created material for teaching and designing, material which will explain to teachers what is the rationale when you teach this course. So typically, what happens is that teachers are given uh, a set of goals and uh, a set of set of teaching material, but why why that material is important? What, what what were the motivations? That doesn't get discussed, and that shows up in the way courses get often delivered. So we would like to we would like to fill that gap, and we have been working towards that end. We also created an introductory programming MOOC, um, a massively online open online course. And uh, we have decided to dedicate one conference, the ACM India Compute Conference, substantially for this theme of education. So in this conference, we have talks about pedagogy and assessment. And uh, we are also creating resources. So uh, how do you design assignments? Uh, how do you design examinations? So we had talks about them. We will archive those talks, so you will soon. You will. So if you want to design an examination, and if you are, if you want to say, I would. I, I don't really want to ask questions which just involve recall. I would like to test students for their ability to apply and maybe even evaluate and maybe be critical. So we will. We would like to provide you with uh, uh, with resources, with material which will help you design uh, courses and examination in this manner. So we, we, we are planning to archive such material. We'll have talks and workshops. We have been having those uh, uh, spread across the country. 
The uh, another theme that this conference is going to encourage is research and education. So I think we, we would like to be, we would like, so, so, so our community, so, so we have a big, we have a big education uh, system. We have a huge number of colleges and a huge number of teachers, but somehow our psychology is more of firefighting. I think the year goes by, we have done, we have done our teaching, but somehow we don't necessarily do enough introspection. What went, what went well, what went wrong? And ACM has a number of conferences in which uh, education is actively researched. So what, so how do you measure effective, effectiveness of your pedagogy? How do you assess? So these are topics which are discussed quite substantially in several uh, ACM conferences and also other conferences. So this is a theme that we are encouraging teachers to work on. And we are hoping that we will be able to persuade regulatory bodies that education and research is, should be counted as, as, as research for the purposes of uh, considering the contributions of an institution, considering the contributions of an individual teacher. I think, I think given that teaching is the major business of a large number of our university professors, it is high time that we recognize this as a very serious, very productive activity, and we create, create knowledge about how teaching is reaching people, how it is not reaching people, because that's how we are going to get into better instruction and how, that's how we are going to create better, better trained manpower. The conference will, of course, produce better faculty networking, and that's certainly one of the goals. One of our major initiatives is to take uh, computer science and computing to schools. So um, CS Patshala is a group uh, affiliated with uh, ACM India, and they have designed a computational thinking curriculum for standards one through eight. And this has been adopted quite substantially. So it has reached about three lakh students in, in 1,100 schools, and this body has managed to train more than 5,000 teachers in delivering this, in delivering this uh, curriculum. And this, and this body, and ACM are committed to publicizing these ideas, and there are efforts to uh, uh, translate. So, so, so a lot of this is in uh, regional languages as well, and the material is being published uh, by uh, Cambridge University Press, but it's also available online. But, but we are also trying and hoping that we can push this material through newspapers, and we, have, we are getting some success. So, a Sunday newspaper will, will have some column dedicated to computational thinking, which might stimulate students and in, in uh, Indian languages. Okay. So uh, uh, this material is being developed, it is being refined, and it is being reviewed. So the entire, entire cycle is underway, and uh, we are very hopeful that it will serve the needs uh, of the coming generations. There is an international computational thinking contest called Bebras, and CS Patshala Group has, has been pushing that our students should participate in these competitions. And last year, about two lakh students appeared for, these, uh, for, for this uh, 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 computational thinking challenge. And they were in the wide age group, eight to 18, and in fact, there were five Indian languages, including English, represented. So, so again, we are, we are doing our bit for localization as well. Okay. CS Patshala has an annual conference, uh, computational uh, CT, CTIS, and uh, I would like to, where all of this gets discussed. And one of the noteworthy accomplishments of CS, CS Patshala is that the national education program, the draft, uh, the, uh, which has been re released recently, has recommended 
that computational thinking we taught from age six, thanks to the advocacy partly of CS Patshala. We are doing a fair number of activities for professionals and chapters. So by way of continuing education, we have the eminent speaker program. We have instituted a series of uh, industry webinars, um, and these are on the most recent technologies, typically uh, delivered by eminent industry, uh, industry uh, um, personnel from India. And these are, these are drawing a very good response. And we have also started blogs on various topics. And again, uh, these are also drawing good response. We instituted chapter, a chapter competition. And uh, it, it, it will, we will continue it uh, and we'll continue to refine it as we go along. Industry liaison is something certainly important. As we said, and a volunteer organization like this is based on people who, who want to contribute by way of funding, by way of efforts, and of course, people who need that contribution. And we have been, uh, we, have, we, are, we feel fortunate that we have, we have instituted an uh, in, uh, institutional partner program. And at the platinum level, we have inducted persistent uh, uh, Tata Consultancy Services, Google, and iCertis. And we are really happy and we are really grateful to our uh, partners. And uh, we, we have been working with them for quite some time. They provide us expertise as well as funding. And uh, that goes, that goes quite, quite some ways uh, in, in all our activities. Uh, for, for one thing, uh, the industry this year, all of our summer schools were funded by some industry. So the industry contributed funds as well as expert faculty. So, uh, uh, so if, you are, if you take up our summer schools, you can see that the benefits can be many. So you will get to, get to meet industry faculty. You will see technologies which are being used. And of course, there will be st uh, so, so strong academic content. And there will be academic faculty as well. But as I said, uh, from industry, we are getting funding as well as expertise and networking. And we are providing a platform where all our stakeholders can come together. ACMW, ACM uh, for uh, Women, um, conducted a number of activities. So there was a grad cohort which was conducted. And here, the major idea was to discuss to, to uh, see us as a career for women. We would like many more women to join the workforce in CS, and of course, all over, over the entire workforce, but uh, our, our special concern, of course, is CS. And these cohorts have been quite successful in the sense that we are attracting women who would otherwise not speak up and who, who benefit uh, from experiences of other women. And the feedback on this has been very, very positive. We have, we have held summer schools, again, uh, exclusively for women. One of them was algorithmic game theory. Um, and there is ACM India celebration of women in computing uh, and the Grace Hopper celebration. So again, these are events uh, where women are encouraged to attend, where somehow a space is created in, in which women can freely express themselves in some sense, we would, we would not like these events. We would like to get to a society where women-only events are not needed, um, where everybody is as free. I mean, the, the gender is not an issue at all. But until, until that happens, I think these events are fantastic. I think they are empowering, empowering women very, very substantial. Okay? There was a uh, hackathon held, and that also drew uh, very good response. All right, to conclude, I think I would like to say that we have had uh, a really great year with activities of many, many kinds. Okay? And we have scaled up older activities. We have remodeled some activities. We have started some new activities. And I think we are reaching out more of our stakeholders. Okay? 
And as I, as I said, we are providing a platform where stakeholders can come and contribute, stakeholders can come and seek contribution. And it's fantastic to see that there is a sense of energy and there is a sense of satisfaction for all parties concerned. Okay? And of course, we have, we have bigger plans. And please stay tuned. We'll, we'll reveal them shortly. So we have had some success at creating a dialogue between academia, industry, and government. But I think we need to do more with it. And um, one, one stakeholder which I would like to single out is the non-elite academic institutions, and specifically faculty in this non, these non-elite uh, 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 non-elite academic institutions. So these institutions are characterized by low funding. Somehow the faculty in these institutions uh, is stretched by conflicting demands, demands of research, demands of various activities, demands of teaching. And I think we need to, we need to empower this group of, uh, the, this stakeholder of ours. And we are, I think, I think this is one of the critical activities that uh, we'll, we'll need to focus on for some time to come. And I think looking at what happened this year and what has happened over the last few years, I think uh, we also need to look into the policy space. I think ACM India uh, can, can follow the example of other ACMs, in particular ACM US, which creates white papers and uh, provides a forum for discussion of policy. Okay? So we have, we have interacted with uh, regulatory bodies and policy making uh, bodies, but I think we, we need to do this a lot more because I think policy, policy related discussions have to become much smoother and much more principled and data based in our country. And I think that is certainly a area in which we need to work. That doesn't mean that we are done in other areas. We have miles to go in other areas, but these were some of the critical areas. Overall, to sum up, I think I'll, I would like to say that um, we are an enthusiastic, supportive, and vibrant community. Please join us. Thank you. ACM India annual event is a popular attraction for the senior graduates and research scholars. As Abhiram mentioned, the co-located IRIS event, which happened over the past two days, uh, has been very attractive as it allowed the students to present their published work and get feedback. It enabled the students to interact with scholars across institutions and have a healthy give and take of ideas. After getting motivated by the interactions and research discussion with peers during IRIS, the next big attraction and propeller, I would say, is the ACM India Best Doctoral Dissertation Award sponsored by TCS. Reviewing the several submissions, our panel of jury has arrived at the winners for this year. May I call upon stage Professor Supratik Chakravarti to present the report on this year's entries, the evaluation procedure, and announce the winners. Okay, good morning, everybody. So uh, after the uh, wonderful statement of uh, an activity of ACM India that Abhiram just pointed out, uh, I'm going to just talk about one of the, uh, 
of programs with the doctoral dissertation award. Uh, so this is the doctoral dissertation award for 2020. <coughs> so this award uh, recognizes the best PhD dissertation in computer science and related areas uh, that was done in the last one year from an Indian institution. Uh, the award was approved by the ACM Awards Committee in 2011. And our founding sponsor is Tata Consultancy Services. We are very grateful to them for supporting this uh, flagship program uh, in, in such a uh, huge way. Uh, so we've had awards uh, all the way from 2013, every year. And the current award about which we are going to talk now is for thesis defended between uh, August 1st, 2018 and July 31st, 2019. So we had 29 nominations this year from 22 academic institutions in India. So here is a listing of uh, the nominations received from various institutions. If an institution has more than uh, some 10 uh, nominations, uh, 10 PhDs that were granted in computer science in a particular year, they are entitled to submit more than one nomination. So what you see is that uh, <coughs> uh, we have nominations not only from uh, the premier academic institutes in India, but also from uh, other academic institutes, tier two institutes uh, in India. And uh, it's very heartening to see that, uh, you know, the, the catchment area for these nominations is increasing over the years. Uh, I also tried to uh, roughly categorize the areas in which the nominated dissertations were. And uh, I guess it's not surprising that machine learning has the highest number of nominations. Uh, systems had also fairly good number of nominations. Theoretical CS uh, followed that. And there were also things, the computer vision, which could not be classified into the machine learning area, the specific nature of this thesis, uh, and computer graphics and control systems. So uh, we are pretty much receiving nominations from uh, you know, uh, a good swath of areas in computer science. <coughs> so the logistics for this, uh, this year was something like this, that the announcements went out in July 2019. Uh, in addition, uh, emails were sent to all the PhD awarding computer science programs in India. Uh, the nomination process uh, is identical to that of the worldwide ACM doctoral dissertation award. The jury had uh, 11 distinguished computer scientists from around the world, representing a broad spectrum of computer science. And uh, here was the jury panel. Uh, Professor Arvind Srinivasan from University of Maryland uh, chaired the jury. Uh, and under his uh, chairship, the rest of the jury members went and reviewed uh, different theses. They also took the help of external expert reviewers whenever that was needed. Uh, and as you can see, the jury members are from, uh, you know, a lot of them from the US, from Europe, uh, from the industry. Uh, so we have from all the stakeholders, from all the stakeholder uh, sectors, uh, over here. The reviewing process uh, was that uh, we allocated nearly three and a half months for the jury members and the expert reviewers to review the thesis. Uh, at least two uh, reviews were uh, obtained for, the for all the dissertations. There were nine external expert reviewers and a total of 62 reviews were obtained. And based on these reviews, uh, three uh, top contenders were identified uh, and a very healthy mix of areas, one in theory, one in systems, one in machine learning. And then there were a lot of email discussions to decide on who would be the final winners. And the winners uh, were finally announced on January 7th, 2020. Uh, so the ACM India Doctoral Dissertation Honorable Mention Award uh, 2020 goes to K. Venkatesh Shimani from IIT Bombay. Uh, his thesis was titled uh, Optimization of Data Access from Imperative Programs Using Static Analysis 
and the doctoral work was advised by uh, Professor Sudarshan. And uh, so is, uh, okay, so and, and the ACM India Best Doctoral Dissertation Award 2020 goes to uh, Jatin Batra from IIT Delhi for his thesis titled uh, Dynamic Programming for Scheduling Problems. Uh, done under the supervision of uh, Professor Naveen Garg. Uh, and as I mentioned, both of these uh, awards are sponsored by Tata Consultancy Services. So I would now like to request uh, the awardees to come up on the stage and uh, along with yeah. Sufu yeah. Sufu yeah. Award. Yeah. Yeah. Along with, yeah. yeah. So I would request, uh, I would request uh, Dr. Jatin Batra, uh, who gets the honor, sorry. Pardon me. I would request uh, Venkatesh uh, Imani, who gets the Honorable Mention Award, to please come on the stage. I would also request his advisor, Professor S. Sudarshan, to please accompany in the award presentations. <laughs> Requesting uh, Sherry Supratek and Abhiram to also join the award presentations, please. The award uh, will be presented by Dr. Lipika Day, who is the principal scientist from TCS Innovation Labs. So Dr. Lipika, please. Thank you. Uh, next, the best doctoral dissertation award, Dr. Jatin Batra from IIT Delhi. I would uh, also request Professor Sanjeeva Prasad. Has he come? Yeah. Uh, the head of the department, CSC from IIT Delhi, to join the award presentations. Thank you. I would request all the award winners and the presenters to please uh, stay at the center stage for a group photo. Thank you. Congratulations to the winners, and I hope the audience, research scholars, are now motivated to get the award in the subsequent years. Okay, proceeding further, uh, we move to the chapter awards. So like uh, every institution derives its strength from the younger generation, student chapters are the lifeline of any organization, including ACM India. These chapters bring their energy, enthusiasm, and new ideas to make innovative contributions to the organization and society at large. It gives us immense pleasure to identify the best chapters annually. 
This award not only recognizes the hard-working chapters, but also encourages other chapters to set targets towards winning the title in the subsequent years. I would request uh, Mr. Shekhar Sahasrabuddhe, COO ACM India, to make the presentations, please. So good morning, all of you. Uh, as Abhiram mentioned in his presentation, uh, we have more than 200 students now. And uh, we actually decided that when we cross the threshold of 100 chapters, we'll institute this particular award. So six years back, we instituted this uh, best chapter, best student chapters awards. And uh, uh, we had done some changes in the process over the years. And last year, we made a major change in that. So what we did was we actually appealed all the chapters to actually post their work, whatever activities they are doing on the social networks, uh, because we were also very active on social networks. And uh, earlier we were finding that chapters report activities, but we don't have any means to check whether those activities are done or not. So we thought that we can cross-check it with their postings on the social media. So we encouraged them to post it on the social media platforms. And then we also did uh, try to automate the process by for the evaluation to reduce the work of the juries. The criteria has remained almost same. A, a few things were added last year. But main thing was that uh, the initial evaluation was done by tool, uh, thanks to uh, Professor Rajneesh Sharma from Chetkara and his team who developed this particular tool for us. And initial evaluation was done objectively by the tool. And then the jury members actually did two rounds of evaluation. During the first round of evaluation, they shortlisted seven chapters, uh, top ranking seven chapters. And then uh, we have subjective evaluation of those seven chapters. And then we were able to find out the winners and the runners up. So normally, we uh, award the winners and runners up, but this year, there was a close contest between runner-up and the one more chapter, so we decided that we'll give one more honorable mention award also. So the honorable mention award this year goes to JMR Institute of Technology. So, so may I request uh, representatives of JMR to come on the stage. I also request VK Hansen, CEO, ACM, and uh, Heman Pandey, Executive Director, ACM India, to come on the stage to give awards. Huh. I also request Dr. Kulkarni from ICRTIS to come on the stage to give away the award. Yeah. And then runner-up for this year is Pimpri Chinsford College of Engineering. So please come on the stage.
and the winner, PICT ACM student chapter. <laughs> yeah. So, in fact, they are winners for the successive second year. Uh, thank you. Uh, may I request the other award winners also to join on stage for a group photo, please? Thank you. So that brings us to the conclusion of the inaugural session. Uh, of course, definitely a big thank you to the organizers, Dr. Nildara, her team, and all the volunteers who are front and backstage running the complete show. Thank you so much. And uh, so before we begin all the sessions, we take a short tea break. Bina chai ke to India mein kuch nahi hota. Chai break banta hai. Thank you.
humanoid humanoid robot walked in riding a bicycle and asked people in the audience challenged people in the audience for to a game of chess or table tennis and defeated whoever took up that challenge how many people would be surprised by that i think i think we have the, we at this point we have the technologies which can turn this into a reality i think there are technologies and there are uh, which which will defeat humans at uh, uh many games including table tennis and chess and uh, programs today can do uh, conversation can do translation can read uh, x rays and do lots of things better than human beings and this is something remarkable which has happened over the last 20 years and today we are fortunate really privileged to have with us Dr. Yon Lukun, uh, who is going to tell us about it, and please join me in giving him a, a welcome. Thank you. Uh, Yon Lukun is a silver professor of the Courant Institute of Mathematical Sciences at New York University. and vice president and chief ai scientist at facebook he received an engineering degree from esiee and a phd in computer science from the university pierre m marie curie both in paris he has many honors and i am not going to read all of them it would just take too much time and but i'll mention some of them his honors include doctorates honoris causa from ipn mexico and ecole polytechnique federale de lausanne or epfl the pender award given by the university of pennsylvania the heist medal from the technical university of eindhoven and philips labs the nokia bell labs shannon luminary award and as you know last year he jointly with his collaborators yoshua benjo and jofre hinton received the am turing award for 2018 the highest award in computing <laughs> without more ado i present to you dr yan lakun who is going to tell us where this story is going to go next thank you very much thank you so much it's a, a real pleasure to be here um it's only my second time in india first time in northern india i must i must say um and i have wonderful memories from my uh, my previous uh, visit uh so i'm going to talk about uh a number of different things a little bit of uh, history a little bit about sort of basic things about uh deep learning and and the state of the art and then and then some questions about the future and some proposal for how we can make progress towards more intelligent machines so the root of deep learning is actually not completely computer science but more what i think used to be called at the time cybernetics but now is more part of uh, engineering in general electrical engineering in particular system theory um and it goes back to the 1940s with people who had the idea of using the 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 brain as an inspiration for uh, uh at the time not intelligent machines but like you know regulation systems and things like this and it became pretty uh, clear very quickly that what's characteristic of biological systems is their cap capability the ability to adapt and to learn in the in the more complex case and there was simultaneously a lot of work in neuroscience that sort of uh showed that adaptation in the in the brain uh works by modifying connections between neurons right um so that led to the invention of the, of the perceptron in the 1950s which was sort of one of the first learning machines that would sort of capable of learning something not too sophisticated but it was quite impressive for the time uh and this had a huge influence in the sense that it kind of laid the groundwork for what became uh, a field known as statistical pattern recognition and later later changed the name to machine learning 
uh, basically the standard model of machine learning. So the perceptron was actually a physical machine. It was not a program on the computer. Uh, it was uh, a, a sort of electronic uh, uh, system uh, that you show here, that you see here. Uh, each of those modules here is an individual weight that is adjustable in this perceptron. It's actually a potentiometer with a knob on it. I know there are electrical engineers in the room, so you know what a potentiometer is. Computer scientists, maybe not. Um, and so this was sort of very heavy. In fact, pretty soon they realized that it was easier to simulate those on the computer. And they went to the school where I teach now at NYU because NYU at the time had powerful computers and that, that's, that's, uh, that's where they went to uh, simulate the perceptron. So that led the groundwork for uh, what we now call supervised learning. And it's the idea that you can, instead of programming a machine explicitly, you can train it from examples. So really what supervised learning is all about is that you have a machine which is essentially you can think of as a, a, a function whose input-output relationship is defined by parameters symbolized by the knobs here in this, uh, in this little uh, photo. And the way you, uh, you train it is you, you have examples of, uh, let's say you want to train the system to distinguish images of cars from images of airplanes. You show an image of a car. If the system says car, you don't do anything. If it says uh, airplane, then you adjust the knob so that the output gets closer to the one you want, okay? Um, and then you show the image of an airplane and you do the same. If the system says airplane, you don't do anything. If it says car, then you adjust the knob so that the output gets closer to car. Uh, this process works really well for uh, situations where you have lots of data, things like uh, doing speech recognition, uh, performing uh, image recognition, finding the objects in an image, uh, doing face recognition, generating captions for images, or translating from one language to another. And there's a host of new applications that are popping up every day that are the basis of, uh, uh, of uh, that are based on, on supervised learning. So a little more uh, abstractly, so the, the problem with this is that you need a lot of data. A little more abstractly, um, the, the standard model of pattern recognition that was sort of first really uh, uh, came out of the perceptron is, is the fact that you take an input and, uh, and, uh, and, and you uh, process that input through a feature extractor that is going to extract relevant uh, characteristics of the input. That feature extractor in the classical model is built by hand. It has to be hand, hand engineered. Uh, and so that's the, the gray box here, phi of x. It produces a feature vector z, and then you have a, a classifier on top of it. In the case of perceptron, it's called a linear classifier. And it has those adjustable parameters. So it's the only part of the system that is trainable. Um, and you train it using a training set. And the training set is a, a, a set of pairs of input and desired output. So um, you measure the performance of the system by comp computing a, a sort of a distance, if you want, or a discrepancy between the output you get out of the machine, y bar, and the desired output, y. And that's measured by some cost function, for example, a squared error or something like this. Uh, and the, the game of learning is to minimize this uh, objective function averaged over the training set with respect to the parameters of the system. Okay, so you have a parameterized function, g or zw, w are the parameters. The cost function uh, for a single sample is this L function of x, y, w for a given uh, training sample x, y. You average this over the training set and you want to minimize this with respect to the parameters. Find the set of parameters that will make this objective function as small as possible. And what we're gonna do for this is use uh, something called stochastic gradient descent. So uh, what does that mean? It means you take one sample, x, y, you measure the value of the objective function for that single sample. So this is L of x, y, w, and it's just a discrepancy between the output you get and the output you want. And then you compute the derivative, the gradient, of that loss function with respect to the parameters. What's the gradient? It's just a vector that contains all the partial derivatives of that cost function with respect to all the parameters. And then you update your parameters uh, in the negative direction of the gradient. So this is kind of similar to a scenario where you are walking in the mountains and it's night and there is fog and you want to go down to the village at the bottom of the valley and you can't see anything. So you look around you and you, you you look for the direction of steepest descent and you make a step in that direction. And if you keep doing this and if the valley is sufficiently smooth, you will eventually reach the valley. 
So that's the same idea, except here you get a noisy estimate of the gradient because it's on the basis of a single sample. And, and, and what you're trying to minimize, what you're trying to find the, the minimum of is the average of all the samples. So you're going to follow a very sort of noisy uh, trajectory. And you might think it's bad, but it's actually good. It, it actually accelerates the convergence if you do it this way. And the math for this is complicated, but to kind of analyze, the program is very simple. It's three lines. Uh, the, uh, the math behind it to kind of come up with it is very, very simple. And it goes back to the 50s. Uh, but to explain why it converges is incredibly hard. OK, so what's deep learning? Deep learning is a very simple idea. And it, it always surprises me how long it took for people to kind of realize it was just a very simple and powerful idea. It's the idea that instead of separating the feature extractor from the classifier and only training the classifier, we're going to attempt to train the entire system end to end. So we're going to build a system as a cascade of parameterized modules. OK, and so each of those modules in the, in the cascade that you see at the bottom has trainable parameters. And we're going to uh, optimize an objective function with respect to all of those parameters. And the, the result of this is that the system will be able to basically learn its own feature extractor. We're not going to have to sort of hand design the, the feature extractor. Um, it's just going to fall out as a result of learning. It's going to require more training samples than uh, in the other uh, scenario, but it might work better. So if you are uh, a theorist, you might ask the question, why do we need all those layers? Because you can show there are theorems that show you can approximate any function you want as close as you want with two layers, uh, where the first layer is fixed, essentially. So why do we need layers? And there is no real true theoretical formal argument for it, uh, but there's a lot of intuitive evidence that it's the case, and certainly a lot of empirical evidence um, that you need layers. And the reason you need layers is because uh, the natural world is, is compositional. There's a natural hierarchy of abstractions that describe the natural world. Why is it this way? We don't know. Um, I think it uh, corresponds to the, 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 the famous quote by uh, Albert Einstein that the, the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that the world is comprehensible. And the reason that the world is comprehensible is because it's compositional. So if you think about Physics, you know, uh, the, the universe is compositional. At the bottom level, you have elementary particles, and they form atoms, they form molecules, they form materials and objects, and you know, etc. Right? Um, and it's the same for the perceptual world. If you want to recognize images, there are pixels, and pixels assemble to form uh, oriented edges and contours, and they assemble to form motifs, they assemble to form parts of objects, and then those form form objects, and at the end, you have a scene. Right? So you have this natural hierarchy. And uh, those, those kind of layered architectures sort of model this, you know, kind of mirror this hierarchy, if you want. Um, OK, so what are we going to put in those boxes, in the parameterized boxes? So the traditional neural net is a very simple uh, parameterization of a family of functions, if you want. And it's the idea by which you're going to alternate linear operations with pointwise nonlinear operations. OK, so we're going to have a layered structure. And each module is going to do uh, uh, one module is going to just do a linear operation. So basically, it's going to take its input is going to be a vector. It's going to compute weighted sum of those vectors. And, uh, and that's one component of the output. And you're going to compute multiple weighted sum. And that's going to be, that's going to form a vector of outputs. And then the next operation is going to be a pointwise nonlinearity. You're going to get, you're going to take each component of that vector and apply a nonlinear function to it. And the kind of nonlinear function people tend to use nowadays are those very, very simple half-wave rectification functions that Neural net people call ReLUs, OK? Rectify linear units. So you alternate uh, weighted sums, ReLUs, weighted sum, ReLUs. You can stack as many layers as you want. Uh, and you can show that with just two layers, you can approximate any function you want. But if you have more layers, you get sort of more powerful representations of uh, better functions. Um, so essentially, uh, if you kind of see this at a slightly more abstract level, those linear operations are basically multiplying a vector by a matrix. OK, and the nonlinear function are just applying a nonlinear function to all the components of a vector. So in the end, it looks kind of like this. Uh, you have uh, vectors. You, apply a, you multiply this vector by a matrix, apply a nonlinearity. You get a new vector, and then this, do this again, et cetera. The learning process is going to modify the weights, the coefficients in the matrices, which are the weights that you use for the weighted sums. Okay. 
And so a simple neural net is kind of represented at the bottom here. You have blocks, functional blocks, and you alternate those linear and nonlinear functional blocks. Uh, you know, multiply by a matrix, you get the vector of sums, uh, pass through a nonlinearity, you get a vector of activations, et cetera, et cetera. Now, now the problem becomes how do you compute the gradient of an objective function with respect to all the parameters uh, in that system? And that's done through the so-called backpropagation algorithm. And it shouldn't be called a backpropagation algorithm because it's really just an ap a practical application of chain rule. It's the most sophisticated mathematical concept that you need to understand if you want to do deep learning, chain rule, okay? You learned this in what, first year of college? Last year of high school, if, if you're lucky, um, or unlucky. Um, so it's, it's very simple. If you want to compute the, the, the gradient of some objective function with respect to the input of a module, so you take a module uh, inside of this chain of modules, you take a, uh, and you want to compute the gradient of some objective function with respect to the input of that module, it's equal to the gradient of the objective function with respect to the output of the module multiplied by a matrix called the Jacobian matrix of that module, which is the matrix of all the partial derivatives of all the outputs of the module with respect to all the inputs of the module, okay? And formally, you can see what's at the top here. Uh, it's, it's, it's very simple, you know, algebraic manipulation. If you know what those means, you know those are vectors and matrices. Um, and what it allows you to do is uh, basically have a recursive formula to propagate gradients all the way through the network. Uh, and there's kind of a similar formula to compute gradients for the, for the weights. Uh, using another Jacobian matrix for each of the blocks, which, are the, which is the matrix of partial derivatives of every output of the block with respect to every parameter, every component of, the, of its weight vector, the WIs. Um, and once you have all those gradients, you can do one step of gradient descent, okay? So there's really nothing more than chain rule applied to this. Now, if you generalize this a little bit to kind of more complex graphs of interconnected blocks, and the blocks can do more than just linear and nonlinear operations, and they can do all kinds of different functions. Uh, that's what deep learning is about. And in fact, that's kind of a little bit of my definition of deep learning. It's really a, a process by which you build uh, a machine, not by explicitly programming it, but by defining its architecture. So it's a graph of connection with functional modules, and the, function, the, the functional modules are parameterized. And then you finalize the function of this system by training it from examples, finding the settings of the parameters that, uh, uh, that, that you know, produces the function you want, or minimizes your objective function, whatever it is. Uh, you know, people have been doing this kind of stuff uh, for, 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 for many years in different contexts. Uh, the difference, I guess, here is that you, you get more power to express your prior knowledge about the problem by uh, setting up this architecture. You get in, in frameworks, software frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow, you get automatic differentiation, so you don't have to figure out how to compute the backpropagation. You just build your graph, and automatically you get the, uh, the gradients are, are calculated. Um, in sort of modern uh, versions of those frameworks, you can um, uh, define graphs dynamically, so in ways that depend on the input, so you get a different graph for every new input that you get. That's called differentiable programming. Uh, and so that's the definition of deep learning. Build a system by assembling parameterized modules into a possibly dynamic computation graph and training it to perform uh, a task by optimizing parameters using a gradient-based algorithm, okay? So a lot of people have been talking about the limitations of deep learning. Most of those critiques actually are really limitations of supervised learning, not limitations of deep learning per se. You can use deep learning in all kinds of different paradigms. And I'll come to this uh, later in the talk. So um, now, you have to, now you have to answer the question, you know, how are we going to build those, those networks? Because if you want to recognize an image, an image is you know, uh, very high dimensional, right? If you have uh, you know, a couple hundred by a couple hundred pixels, that's, uh, that's a very high dimensional input. And you're not going to have uh, a, a matrix that you can, you can multiply uh, that has that dimension uh, squared. So, that's when inspiration from biology comes in again. So in the 60s, there was really classic work by Hubel and Wiesel, 50s and 60s, uh, this Nobel Prize winning work in neuroscience, where they discovered that uh, neurons in the visual cortex look at localized receptive fields, individual uh, fields. So they are activated by particular patterns in particular areas, oriented edges mostly. And those neurons are kind of replicated across the entire visual field. And so there's this notion that you have local feature detectors in your visual cortex and they're kind of replicated all over your visual field. 
And so that suggests a type of computation in, in sort of vision model that we could reproduce uh, in the form of convolutions, which I'll come back, uh, come back to. The second discovery of Huber and Weasel is this idea of complex cells. So complex cells is a neuron that integrates the activations of a number of uh, detector cells in the previous layer and, and basically pools their, their answer. And the purpose of this is to build a little bit of shift invariance uh, in the representation. And so the uh, gentleman here whose picture you see, uh, Kunimiko Fukushima, had the idea of uh, building a computer model of, of this uh, architecture back in the late 70s, early 80s uh, that he called the uh, neocognitron, uh, which is pictured on the left. Uh, but he didn't have the backpropagation algorithm to train it. So he, he kind of used all kinds of you know, unsupervised uh, kind of uh, sort of com competitive learning algorithms, as, as, as we call them, uh, just like you know, sticking a, percept a perceptron at the top. Um, that, was, that was really inspiring. And um, a, a few years later, I uh, you know, came up with the idea of using very similar architectures, uh, considerably simplified activation functions, and then train those architectures with backpropagation. And that's basically what a convolutional network is. So a convolutional network, which is now universally used for image recognition and speech recognition and a lot of applications in uh, other areas, uh, is based on uh, computing uh, a convolution. So it has this idea of uh, a particular unit uh, looking at a local receptive field and then computing the dot product of the pixels in, a, in an area by a set of weights. And then you take the same set of weights and the, you kind of swipe it over the input and then record the output. That operation is a discrete convolution, hence the name convolutional net. So that would constitute the first layer here of a convolutional net. Each of those maps is generated by a different uh, set of uh, weights. Uh, those are called filters or, or, or convolution kernels. And they're not set by hand. They are the result of learning through backpropagation, I should, I should emphasize. And then the second layer is equivalent to those complex cells, consists in sort of pooling the activations of, uh, of, of, of the previous layer in a small area here, a two by two area, and then shifting the window by two. So you get a lower resolution map here than you have here by a factor of two. And then you repeat the process. Uh, this map here is computed by applying a, a conditional filter to each of those maps. It's a different filter for each of the maps. You add the results and pass the results for a nonlinearity, and then again do pooling, so you get further reduced uh, resolution, and then repeat the process for you know as many times as as you can. Um, and this is sort of a, a, one of those convolutional nets in action from the early 90s, uh, which I developed when I was at Bell Labs. And so you see the the input here. This is the first layer. So each pixel here represents the activation of a single unit. Then this is after pooling. The resolution is, is half. So if this shifts by two pixels, this shifts by one pixel. Then again, feature extraction. And you get more feature types to compensate for the fact that the, the resolution is uh, lowered. And then pooling again. So now this shifts by one half pixel if this, if this shifts by two pixels. And then again, convolutions. And now you get a very sort of distributed representation where every unit here is influenced essentially by the entire input. And so you get sort of a distributed representation of the entire content of the input. And pretty soon, uh, we realized we could train this to recognize uh, handwritten digits and characters. But even better, we could recognize multiple digits without having to separate them uh, from each other in advance, so we, without having to do explicit segmentation. Um, and that was sort of a. Uh, very important because that made us realize we could use this for natural images, which of course was the plan uh, all along. So this system here basically is a, a convolutional net that is applied with kind of a sliding window over the input. And for each location, you get a score, a, a winning category. So here you get a, a three detector and five detector fires and a seven detector, depending on, uh, depending on that. And then you do so a little bit of post-processing to figure out what the most consistent interpretation is. Um, applying a neural net with a sliding window, a convolutional net with a sliding window is very cheap. It can be done very efficiently. You don't need to recompute the entire network every time. You just need to compute the, co the convolutions over, over bigger fields. So it's very efficient. It allows you to apply convolutional nets to large images without really paying for it. And pretty soon we realized we could do things like phase detection uh, and then, you know, more recently pedestrian detection. This was about 10 years ago. Um, phase detection was more like 20 years ago. In fact, the first papers were from 1992. 
Um, and since you can apply a convolutional net with a sliding window over an input, you might be able to use it to drive robots or drive cars. You, uh, you, take a, you take a window of an image and you try to teach the system whether the central pixel in that window is uh, ground that is traversable by the robot or whether it's an obstacle, right? So you can collect data from stereo vision for objects that are nearby. You train a neural net to tell you whether uh, a particular uh, piece of uh, the environment is traversable or not. And uh, then you put those traversability indices into, the, into a map and, and you can do planning uh, in that map. So this is an example of what's called semantic segmentation where you, you, you use a, a computer vision system, in this case a convolutional net, to label every pixel in the image by the category that this object belongs to. And this is the, this robot uh, running around. Uh, this is Raya Hatzel. She's now uh, director of robotics research at DeepMind. Uh, and this is uh, Pierre Samanet. He's a research scientist at Google Brain, also working on robotics. And they're pretty confident that this robot is not going to break the legs because uh, they wrote the code. They trained it, too. So this idea of semantic segmentation uh, a few years later, so this was some work that was done between 2005 2008. Uh, a couple of years later, we worked on a, a slightly more sophisticated uh, semantic segmentation system that can identify categories like road and sidewalk and buildings, cars, pedestrians, trees, etc. cetera. Um, and this could run in real time on a special purpose FPGA. This was before uh, deep learning was cool, uh, maybe a year or two before, and so people didn't pay much attention to this. In fact, the paper was rejected from CVPR. Um, uh, reviewers that were really sort of skeptical about how well this could work, um, even though the results were record beating. Um, but uh, that changed a year later when uh, our friends at the University of Toronto, uh, Jeff Hinton and, and his students at Eskrzyzewski, uh, came up with a very efficient implementation of convolutional nets on GPUs. And so they were able to uh, run a very large convolutional net and train it on the ImageNet data set, which has 1.3 million samples. And it was pretty clear that those networks really strive when the data set is very large and the number of categories is very large. And that's where other machine learning methods basically start crumbling. So um, that led, as you, many of you probably know, to a huge improvement in performance of vision system from, on ImageNet from something like 26% error by some measure to 16% error. And that created really a revolution in computer vision. A similar revolution occurred in speech recognition a couple of years before. And so this, this, this was not the first one. And then a new revolution also in uh, natural language processing, maybe three years later, uh, around 2016, 15, 16. Since then, there's been a huge amount of progress in the error rate on this data set to the point that that data set is not particularly interesting anymore. Now we can train a, a system on ImageNet in a few minutes, and it will get 3% you know, error. Um, and what we've seen over the last years is the last few years is a, a, an inflation in the complexity of those networks, the number of layers, the connection scheme, et cetera. People are kind of searching for uh, good architectures. This is sort of the, the workhorse of convolutional net for image recognition called ResNet, which was invented by Kai Ming He when he was at Microsoft Research Asia. He's now a colleague at Facebook. Um, probably one of the most cited paper, you know, of the last few years. Um, I think it is the most cited paper of the last few years. All science uh, put together, it's amazing. Um, and people in, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest from industry uh, for those networks because they are they run everywhere. So there's a lot of work in uh, companies like Google and Facebook and Microsoft and NVIDIA and others to try to find architectures that are both uh, efficient uh, and compact in terms of memory footprint and have high performance on data sets like, like ImageNet. So the top side here is, uh, this is the number of billion operations that are necessary to compute one output of one of those networks. This is the uh, accuracy on ImageNet. Uh, and the size of the circle is the memory occupancy. Now, those networks are run billions of times a day by companies like Facebook and, and Google. Uh, they even run on your smartphone if you, if you do like effects in Instagram and things like that. Um, and so there is a huge incentive to really ma make them very compact and efficient. And there is entire teams of uh, engineers in various companies kind of working really hard to uh, make this efficient, including people designing hardware for it. So there's been a huge amount of progress in prevision uh, using techniques like mask RCNN, 
or feature pyramid networks, which are sort of two competing approaches, both from, from Facebook, actually. Uh, but you get results like this, where every object in an image can be uh, identified with some score and also outlined by some mask. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, you can apply it to all kinds of different images. You know, you can count sheets and uh, find cars that are partially occluded. Uh, even, like, you know, pick out elephants, which I guess might be more useful in India than in the U.S. Um, and also kind of identify background uh, regions, not just uh, objects. Uh, using so-called uh, panoptic uh, uh, recognition. Now, the nice thing about uh, the, the, the trend in AI is that a lot of the research is done in the open, so even research done in companies. So at Facebook, uh, we tend to open source pretty much everything we do, and this is sort of uh, a site from which you can download the, the latest, greatest uh, image recognition systems from Facebook. It's called Detectron 2, and it integrates a lot of different methods. You can just download it. It's pre-trained. You can retrain it if you want, and it's uh, in the PyTorch uh, framework. So this idea of semantic segmentation back in 2013 when I, or 12 when I was talking about it got in, um, sort of inspired uh, some companies to use this for self-driving cars. One company in particular is Mobileye, uh, so one person who was going to work at Mobileye uh, sat in one of my uh, talks at the time and sort of said, like, we've got to try this. And, you know, there was some skepticism within Mobileye at first, and then, you know, he tried it and he got much better results than they were getting with the previous method they were using. And so they completely converted to using this. The problem is that they already had a chip that they had designed for the previous algorithm, and now they had to shoehorn conventional nets onto that chip. But they eventually managed to do it, and they were the first to really kind of deploy... Uh, uh, in a kind of commercial car, the 2015 model of uh, the Tesla S model uh, was equipped with the Mobileye vision system that allowed the car to basically just drive on a highway by itself, more or less. I mean, you have to keep your hands on the wheels and, you know, brake when there is an obstacle and things like this. Now, those systems are pretty much standard in a lot of cars. Some European countries actually have laws that require those uh, uh, automatic emergency braking systems to actually be in every car, even low-end cars. And uh, what I'm told is that they reduce uh, collisions by 40%. And so the, the conventional nets uh, save lives, which feels really good. Another way that conventional nets are used for uh, sort of you know, human welfare, if you want, is for uh, medical image analysis. This is some work that I was not involved in. It was done by some of my uh, collaborators, uh, some, some of my colleagues at NYU. And they use a 3D convolutional net to uh, basically segment the the, the femur um, from uh, MRI images. So MRI images are 3D images, and if you are a person, you have to flip through uh, slices, but you can use a 3D convolutional net that will basically look at the entire volume altogether and sort of have a consistent interpretation of it. And in fact, uh, the 3D conv nets kind of work better than if you apply it sequentially to slices and, uh, you know, help surgeons that want to do hip, uh, uh, surgery, you know, hip replacement surgery. Um, you know, a, a team with a slightly different uh, set of people uh, have applied this to uh, detecting um, breast cancer in, in mammograms. So now it's uh, a set of 2D images uh, with uh, very good accuracy. There's, there's similar work in different uh, outfits to, to work on this. It's very successful. Of course, there's a lot of, you know, regulatory obstacles. So before this is actually applied, you know, in practice, it's probably going to take a few years. Uh, there's some work also in collaboration between uh, NYU and uh, Facebook on accelerating the process of gathering data from an MRI machine. So instead of uh, lying down in a noisy MRI machine for half an hour, it can, you know, the exam can, can take five, five minutes or so. And um, this is basically by using deep learning to do image restoration. And it's uh, quite, uh, quite successful. Uh, the, the data is, is public, so you can actually try your own methods on, on this to see if you can beat, uh, uh, I think the current record holder is University of Amsterdam. Um, and there's a lot of applications of convolutional nets. Uh, they are popping up uh, every day, new ones, uh, to science, particularly in physics, but also in chemistry and uh, environmental science and, and all kinds of other uh, areas. Uh, physics is particularly interesting, so a lot of uh, experimental physicists are now using convolutional nets as basically a phenomenological model of the, 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 the things they're observing. These properties of uh, materials or 
uh, statistical properties of, of things you observe in, in, the, uh, in space that are difficult to model from first principles, but you can train a neural net to sort of predict, uh, to model this thing and predict. So you can, um, uh, you can do things like uh, accelerating the uh, solving of uh, partial differential equations uh, and uh, uh, do a better job at you know, climate modeling, for example. There's a very recent paper that was you know, just published on Archive uh, in the last few weeks that talks about this by a large team. Uh, you can accelerate computational fluid dynamics uh, if you want to figure out the properties, aerodynamic property of a solid. Um, uh, very interesting work at PFL on this, and uh, a lot of work in astrophysics and high energy physics. Uh, a, a particularly interesting one is uh, from uh, uh, a, a team led by Shirley Ho at uh, the Flatiron Institute in New York, and they've used a convolutional net to basically accelerate the solution of partial differential equations. And because it's accelerated now, they can basically use this to simulate the entire universe in its first instant and then kind of figure out what is the appropriate properties of dark matter, density, and things like that that would explain what we observe today in the universe. So I think those are fascinating applications. Um, similarly, uh, uh, we are using uh, uh, neural nets, convolutional nets, graph convolutional nets, which is a particular type of, of convolutional nets for uh, things like filtering um, trajectories of, of particles out of uh, particle accelerators and things like that. So tons of applications, new pop up every day, and it's really uh, very inspiring for me actually to look at how you know, inventive people are uh, to use those, those methods. Um, there's a lot of questions for the, the theoreticians in the room, which is that um, you know, we of course have a lot of intuitive understanding of, uh, of those things and, and a lot of uh, ways to investigate how they work, but we need more theory really to kind of understand why they work so well in many cases. Uh, there are things that you know, people were really sort of in disbelief initially. A lot of people who were skeptical about neural nets would tell us, well, neural nets can't possibly work because your objective function is non-convex, so we can't prove anything about whether the optimization will converge. It turns out empirically the optimization does converge and converges almost every time to the same kind of level of performance, but every time it gives you a different uh, solution because the objective function you're minimizing, your, your, your mountain uh, landscape, if you want, has many valleys. And so which value you're gonna fall into depends on where you started, essentially. And so people think it was a problem, but in fact it's not. And it's because our intuition of how those processes work comes from low dimension, but we are in a very, very high dimensional space. The number of parameters in those neural nets typically is in the millions, sometimes in the hundreds of millions, sometimes in the billions. And it's very difficult to imagine, uh, to represent the, the, the sort of geometry of a, of a you know, mountain landscape in, in a billion dimensions. Um, what that means is that if there is a, a mountain in front of you, you can always go around it. There's always a dimension that allows you to go around it. And so local minima are rare, essentially. Okay. Now, here's a really surprising recent result from some of my colleagues at uh, uh, Guillaume Lample and Francois Charton, who are uh, uh, research scientists at Facebook Air Research in Paris. And what they've done is they've taken a very large neural net. It's an architecture called a transformer that people uh, in natural language processing are very familiar with. Um, it, it's a fairly recent um, type of architecture that people have been sort of starting to use over the last year, year and a half or so. And what they've done is they've generated a lot of formulas uh, and then differentiated those formulas, and they use this as a training sample to train uh, a system that does symbolic integration, right? So you give the derivative of a function, and you give the function on the output of the system as the desired output. You represent those formulas as a tree uh, of, of operations, right? A parse tree, if you want. And then you can encode this parse tree as kind of a sequence of symbols, and those sequence of symbols are kind of input to one of those giant uh, neural nets. And you train the neural net to produce the integral uh, symbolic integral of that input. And they've applied this not just for computing integrals, but for solving differential equations of first order and second order. And the amazing thing is that not only does it work, it works better than the systems from uh, Mathematica, MATLAB, and Maple that are designed by hand basically to do this with search algorithm. This is just a neural net with you know, a, a number of, uh, of layers, and you give it a formula, it gives you the integral. It's pretty amazing. So it, it appears to do symbol manipulation, but it doesn't. 
it doesn't do symbol manipulation at all. It gets symbol on the input. The first thing it does is that it represents those symbols as vectors, and then it's all vector manipulations and sort of the equivalent of some sort of simple intuition, if you want, to kind of figure out what is the formula that, uh, that corresponds. And of course, it's very easy to check whether the result is correct because you just differentiate and then simplify. Uh, so that's a, a pretty amazing feat, and it's surprising that it works so well, but it does. So, as I said, it works when you have data, and it saves lives, uh, either in the context of uh, automatic uh, emergency braking systems, or in the context of uh, medical imaging, uh, which is kind of getting deployed very widely, or even in the context of content filtering. So if you are uh, a, uh, a social network like Facebook or, or, or Twitter or YouTube or something like this, you have to be careful that uh, you know, people don't post calls to violence, for example, you know, that you know, cause people to kind of kill each other. And so it's very important to have good systems that detect hate speech, for example, or calls to violence and kind of suppress them or downgrade them. And you have to do this in every language in the world. Uh, just doing it with every language in India is already a big, uh, a big challenge, but uh, every language in the world. Uh, and and it's, it's very hard because you don't have that much training data to detect hate speech in, let's say, Burmese. Burmese turns out to be a really important case because there are sort of ethnic uh, and religious uh, conflicts in, uh, in, uh, in, in Burma and in, in Myanmar. And, and so it's, uh, it's very important. It, it saves life if you can do it better. I mean, it's very, very important. Okay, there's been a lot of excitement over the last few years about reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is the idea where you don't tell the machine the correct answer, you just tell it whether what it did is good or bad. Okay, and you don't tell it every time, you have to wait for the trial to complete, basically. So if you're playing a game of chess or Go, you have to wait for the game to end before you get the reward. It's not just uh, you know, one action. And so um, um, it's very successful for games. And the reason it's successful for games is because in games you can, you can run the game millions of times. Uh, so DeepMind, for example, is this really impressive StarCraft player, uh, which took the equivalent of 200 years of real time to train itself to play one map, one type of player, okay? Uh, for, uh, for Go, the, 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 the training is you know, millions of games, more than any person can play in their lifetime. For the OpenAI uh, single-handed uh, Rubik's uh, Cube manipulation, it took the equivalent of 10,000 years of real time uh, in simulation for the system to learn how to manipulate. So it's not practical in the real world. It works for in simulation, but it doesn't really work in the real world. If you want to apply this to the real world, you have to transfer from simulation to the real world, which is what OpenAI did, and it doesn't work every time. You have to use special techniques for this, or uh, you have to invent new methods. Um, you know, it's particularly important if you want to train a, a car to drive itself. Uh, if you were to let a car, you know, use reinforcement learning to drive itself, it might run into a ditch many times. Uh, you know, if you drive in India on the left side, um, you, you drive near a cliff, uh, the machine will have to actually drive off the cliff to realize that uh, something bad is going to happen because the system has no model of physics, right? It doesn't know that a car is going to fall in the ditch if you, uh, uh, if you, if you, if you turn the wheel. And then it's going to you know, probably take it several thousands of uh, such accidents before it realizes how to avoid them. So how is it that humans can learn to drive a car in about 20 hours of training without causing any accident for most of us? I mean, that's the big mystery. And that's how we need to, that's the question we need to find an answer to, to kind of make real progress in AI. Um, you know, re reinforcement learning is not really practical un unless you have a model of the world because anything you do in the world can kill you and you can't run the world faster than real time. So it's a really important question because until we figure out how a machine can build models of the world, we're not gonna have things like uh, intelligent personal assistants that are actually intelligent. Uh, you know, we, we can have uh, chatbots today, but they are kind of stupid. They're enter entertaining, but they're not particularly smart. We're not going to have household robots. We're not going to have, um, you know, human-level intelligence. We're not going to have even cat-level intelligence, right? A house cat has more common sense than the smartest of our AI systems. 
So that's one of the three challenges in, uh, in AI. Uh, deep supervised learning works for perception. Reinforcement learning works really well for action generation, but uh, when trials are cheap, which is mostly in simulation. And so the three problems that the community is working on or needs to be working on, and perhaps you might be interested in working on those questions. The first one is learning with fewer labels, fewer label samples, or fewer trials. Uh, and my answer to this, or my proposal, would be to use something called uh, self-supervised learning or unsupervised learning. Uh, basically learning to represent the world, not by training yourself to do a task, but just by observation, okay? I'm com coming to this in a minute. Uh, the second problem is learning to reason, so going beyond just sort of reactive, uh, uh, sort of feed-forward computation, if you want. Uh, what if we need machines to sort of reflect about a particular course of action before taking that action? How do we implement uh, reasoning in, in deep learning in ways that are compatible with gradient-based learning? Uh, and essentially, you know, making reasoning compatible with gradient-based learning sort of uh, is, is somewhat incompatible with a classical view of reasoning that is based on logic and symbols. So we need to replace symbols by vectors and replace logical operations by sort of continuous operations, but in a sort of homom homomorphic way. And then there is a third question, uh, learning to plan complex action sequences. And I have no idea how to solve that one. Uh, maybe I'll come back to this uh, question a little bit more. So how do humans learn, and animals learn so quickly? If you show the, you know, babies learn a lot of, a huge amount of background knowledge about the world just by observation. And if you, you know, even basic things like the fact that the world is three-dimensional, the fact that uh, an object, even if I hide it, you know it's still there. It didn't disappear just because you don't see it anymore. Object permanence. And then simple things like gravity. I mean, the fact that an object that is not supported is gonna fall, you, you know, we all learn this around the age of nine months. So if you show a six-month-old baby, the scenario here, where there is a, a little cart on a, on a platform and you push it off and it appears to float in the air, a six-month-old baby will not be surprised at all. We look at this like everything else. A 10-month baby, we, we go like the little girl here, be extremely surprised because after 10 months, you've learned that objects are supposed to fall when they're not supported. And so that baby you know, looks at this like, you know, what's going on? Is something I missed? Did I miss anything? You know. um, so my friend Emmanuel Dupou, who's a cognitive uh, psychologist in Paris and also spends some time at Facebook, put together this chart that shows at what age babies learn sort of basic concepts like face tracking, biological motion, object permanence, this is the age in month, uh, and things like gravity, inertia, conservation of momentum occurs around nine months, right? How does that happen? How do we learn all that stuff by just watching the world? Babies are kind of helpless, right? They don't really act on the world very much. Um, but they kind of learn all that stuff just by looking. How do we get this, how, how do we get to do this with machines? And it's not just babies, animals do this too. A lot of animals, not just, uh, so here's a baby orangutan and it's, it's being played a magic trick where there's an object put in a cup and then the object is removed but it doesn't see that and you show the empty cup to the baby orangutan and, and he uh, goes on the floor laughing. Uh, he finds that really funny because his model of the world was violated by the absence of the object, you know, this orangutan has learned object permanence. It's, it's figured it out. Okay, so a possible way to approach this problem is what I call self-supervised learning. Self-supervised learning is uh, the idea that you show a machine a, a piece of data. Okay, let's say, for the sake of simplicity, a video segment, okay? So imagine this is a piece of video, and you show it the initial segment of the video, and you ask it to predict the remaining the reminder of the video, okay, the next few frames. Uh, why is it good to train a machine to do this prediction? It's because if, if a machine is to do a good job at predicting what's gonna happen, happen in the future in a video, it probably has a pretty good grasp of the rules of the world, right? So for example, if I stand here and can I predict what my view of this room is gonna look, uh, is gonna look like if I, uh, if I move, uh, say, a meter to the right? I can predict that. And I've been trained since infancy to predict that. Um, and the way I learned how to predict this is that implicitly I learned that every pixel in the world, every location in the world has a depth. It's the best way to explain how the world, how my view of the world changes when I move, is that everything has a depth. So I can learn easily that the world is three-dimensional by just trying to predict what the world is gonna look like when I move. 
Uh, now, if I have this notion of depth, I also have the notion of uh, occlusion uh, edge. The fact that objects can move, you know, there's parallax motion in front of backgrounds, and so things move differently depending on how far they are, which means objects now, the concept of object just pops up. And then on top of this, you have animate objects whose trajectory are predictable, and uh, inanimate objects whose trajectory is predictable, and animate objects whose trajectory is kind of somewhat not predictable. And then, you know, intuitive physics, et cetera. So you can imagine sort of building a hierarchical representation of properties of the world just by training yourself to predict. It's not just predicting the future, it's, you know, predicting inside. So this is another example where here you show a, a bunch of frames of a video, and you ask the system to predict the frames in the middle. Or here you show the bottom of an image, and you ask the system to predict the top. I mean, all of this is kind of examples of self-supervised learning. Now, Self-supervised learning has been, over the last year and a half, has been unbelievably successful in the context of natural language processing. So many of you probably have heard about a model called BERT. This was proposed by Google in uh, October last year. The paper was put on archive. It was actually a submission to the uh, ICLR conference. But by the time it was presented officially at the ICLR conference in April or in May, uh, the archive paper had collected 650 citations. Um, and now it's in the thousands. So, uh, this really caused a revolution in NLP, and the idea of uh, how you train BERT in self-supervised mode is uh, a particular mode of self-supervised learning called denoising autoencoder, uh, where, or masked autoencoder. You take a, a segment of text, so each word here is represented as, basically you can think of it as a one-hot vector, and that, goes, that gets mapped by a lookup table into a, a more compact vector. So you show a, a sequence of words, but you, but you omit some of the words, you mask something like 15 or 20 percent of the words, and you train a giant neural net to predict the words that are missing. It's one of those transformer architectures. I'm not going to go into the details of what, what they are. They use those kind of self-attention, multi-head self-attention modules, which, are, which have those kind of multiplicative interactions, uh, slightly more sophisticated than the stuff I talked about earlier. Now, you do this uh, with you know, billions of segments of text, and at the end, you, inside of the network, there is uh, you know, the system learns to represent text in such a way that it can make those predictions. And it extracts, you know, it, it manage to, manages to represent a lot about the meaning of, the, of a sentence. And so you use the internal representation as input to a subsequent task for which you have supervised data. But you may not have a huge amount of supervised uh, labeled data. And those systems beat the, you know, performance uh, on a number of different NLP benchmarks. Uh, there's, one, there's one called glue, another one called super glue. It's a set of benchmarks for NLP, and those things basically have the record. Well, they're successors, right? Successor to the original paper. Okay, so that success, of course, it, it gave the idea very quickly to people that they, perhaps they could use the same technique for uh, learning features uh, of images or video, right? So for images, for example, take, a, take an image, blank out some pieces of it, run through a neural net, and train it to fill in the blanks. And those systems learn to fill in the blanks pretty well, but the features that they learn are not particularly good, unfortunately. So it, it doesn't work. And it's due to the fact that it's very hard to represent uncertainty in a high-dimensional continuous space. It's very easy for BERT to represent uncertainty because uh, when you produce a word here on the output, uh, you cannot predict the exact word that comes out, but you can predict the distribution over all possible words in the dictionary. It's just a big vector of numbers between 0 and 1 who's, uh, that's sum to 1, OK? We know how to do this. But we don't have the equivalent in uh, continuous high-dimensional spaces. So we don't know how to represent distributions over images. So if you train, for example, a system to do video prediction, you show it a few frames of a video, and then you ask it what's, what's going to happen next, what you get are blurry predictions. Why do you get blurry predictions? Because the system really doesn't, cannot really predict exactly what's going to happen next. And since you force it to make one prediction, it predicts the average of all the plausible futures. And that's a blurry image. Um, so how do we solve that problem? So I think this is the most important problem that we need to solve to make progress in AI. This sounds a little funny, but I really believe this. The main problem we need to solve is how do we train a system to make predictions in the presence of uncertainty in high dimensional continuous spaces. So by not forcing a system to make a single prediction, but by allow it, allow, allowing it to make multiple predictions. And my solution to this would be to use what's called latent variable models. So a latent variable model, you observe the initial P 
piece of the video segment. You run through a predictor. It extracts features, let's say. And then you run through another neural net, call it a decoder, uh, that also depends on a set of latent variables. The value of those latent variables is not determined. We're going to determine it by inference. And then you make a prediction, and you compare that prediction with the observation during training. So when you vary that latent variable, the output prediction varies over a, a set, a manifold, let's say. Okay? And so that would allow a system to make multiple predictions for a single input. Um, and using latent variable models, sometimes you, know, you, you can use it to kind of do short-term predictions that are less blurry, although this one doesn't use a huge amount of latent variable. Um, so that led me to this uh, idea that you know, this idea of self-supervised learning is really important because basically at each, at each sample, each training sample that you show the machine, you're asking it to predict a lot. You're asking it to predict an entire video frame or you know, which may be several hundred thousand pixels. Um, so you're giving it a huge amount of information and it can learn a lot about how the world works just by trying to do this prediction. The problem is that that prediction is unreliable because there is uncertainty in the world, so you have to deal with that, and that's the main problem we need to solve. But you get a lot more information from a trial in, in this form of learning than you get from supervised learning, where you know, in ImageNet, the number of categories is about 1,000, and so you only give 10 bits to the machine at every trial. It's really not that much. And in reinforcement learning, you only give one scalar value once in a while to the machine to tell, to tell it whether it did good or bad. And so necessarily, you're going to need way more samples here than you need here, and way more samples here than you need there to learn anything. And so that led me to this funny analogy that if intelligence is a cake, the bulk of the cake is really self-supervised learning. Everything that we've learned, almost everything that we've learned, and I'm speaking as a university professor, almost everything that we've learned, we learned when we were you know, less than one year old. Uh, and then we start learning through language, through being taught uh, at school, at university by our parents. But that's kind of the icing on the cake. The bulk of the knowledge we learned before that. And then the cherry on the cake, that's really reinforcement learning. That's what we learn by ourselves, by trial and error. So the next revolution in AI will not be supervised or reinforced. It'll probably be self-supervised. And one proposal I have for this is something I call energy-based models. And so this is an approach to deal with this uncertainty I was talking about earlier. Uh, immediate instinct for a lot of people in machine learning and statistics is to, is to say, well, what you want the machine to predict is a distribution, not a single point. The problem is we don't know how to represent distributions in high-dimensional continuous spaces. As I said, we know how to do this in discrete spaces. It's easy. But in high-dimensional continuous spaces like images, we don't have good models of you know, uh, distributions over natural images. Um, it just doesn't exist. And people have been working on this for a long time. So what's the idea of energy-based model? Is, is to basically throw away probabilities and replace them by energy functions. Think of them as negative logarithms of probabilities without normalization, okay, if you really want to stick to probabilities. Uh, the methods are very close to Bayesian uh, statistics in the end. Um, so, so again, I come back to this problem of uncertainty. Uh, if you have a deterministic function like a neural net, it can only make one prediction, and so you're going to get blurry prediction if there is uncertainty in the output. Uh, as, as I was uh, showing you earlier. And so uh, we're going to use implicit functions. So an energy function really is a scalar output function that takes two uh, arguments and it's parameterized. And uh, it, gives you how com it tells you how compatible Y is with X. So let's say X is the initial segment of a video and Y is the remaining segment. Uh, it tells you, uh, it gives you a low value if, uh, if uh, Y is a good uh, continuation of X and a higher value if Y is not a good continuation of X or is not even a, uh, you know, a good set of uh, frames. Um, so it's basically replacing an explicit function by an implicit function. To do inference, you have to do a minimization. You have to find a Y that minimizes F of X, Y for a given X. Okay? So let's take this example here. For this value of X, there are two Y's that are possible. Okay? And both are minima of this energy function represented by the grayscale scale here. OK, that's a very simple case. So how do we train an energy-based model? We train it by an energy-based model is an energy landscape. And we have to shape the energy landscape to take the right shape if we want it to be useful. The shape that it has to take is that it has to give low energy to our data points and high energy to everything else. Okay? So the training process will look something like this. If these are our data points, 
as the training pro uh, progresses, uh, those training data points need to have low energy, and everything else needs to have higher energy. And there are two methods to do this. Contrastive methods consist in pushing down on the data points and pushing up on everything else, basically, or chosen data points outside. And then architectural methods that are built in such a way that the machine can only have a kind of small volume of space that has low energy, and so automatically the rest will have higher energy. I'm kind of voting for number two, but right now in computer vision, what works best is, is number one. Um, Ooh. Okay, so here is a chart that I'm not going to read, and you're not going to read, but you can take pictures. <laughs> um, and it's a list of a lot of sort of classical uh, unsupervised or self-supervised running algorithms uh, reinterpreted in terms of those energy-based models, either as contrastive methods or architectural methods. And you will recognize familiar uh, uh, names here, like. Uh, uh, like say uh, k-means or uh, variational autoencoder for those of you who know what this is or a uh, um, mixture of Gaussians and things like this metric learning so you know there's a whole bunch of those uh, methods I, I talk about this in various tutorials uh, that you can watch but uh, right now I don't have time to get into this so I'm, I'm going to concentrate on on two things the uh, regularized latent variable methods and the, and the uh, a small number of contrastive methods so regularized latent variable methods are methods where the energy function is, uh, depends on the latent variable z. And the way you compute the energy with respect to the variable you observe is by minimizing this energy with respect to z. And you can call this a free energy if you are, if you are a physicist. Um, and so k-means and sparse modeling are kind of, or sparse coding are examples of this. Uh, I'm not going to go into the de details. Um, this is my kind of favorite class of method at this point. But um, I'll come back. I'll give just one example at the end of how you can use this. Uh, but here I'm going to give one example. This is work by, uh, uh, interesting work here by uh, Ishan Mitra, who is a research scientist at, at Facebook in New York. And he came out of uh, uh, IIT Hyderabad, I think. Uh, he was uh, coached by uh, Pijan Aryanan. So uh, He's from around here, and he did a PhD at Carnegie Mellon, and then became a research scientist at, uh, at Facebook. And he's been working on this system uh, that uses an idea that I proposed many years ago called Siamese networks. So you have, you have two copies of the identical network, and you show it two examples that you know are semantically identical. You take an image from your data set, you distort it, and you show it uh, to this other copy of the network. You run through the network, and you tell the network, whatever output you're producing, they should be the same, or they should be nearby for those two examples, because they really are the same. Uh, content. And then you, two, you take two images that you know are different, you run them through those neural nets, and you tell the system those vectors should be different, like far away from each other. Okay, So you have various loss functions for this. And uh, Ish Ishan proposed this method called Perl, which means uh, pretext, in pretext invariant representation learning. This was put, uh, put up on archive just a couple of months ago. Um, there's a somewhat similar method called MoCo by Kaming He, who is also from Facebook, the guy who also invented ResNet, um, also using those kind of contrastive method, um, you know, somewhat similar. And those really work. So they, they are kind of the first self-supervised methods applied to images that really sort of bring an improvement over pre-training in supervised mode on ImageNet. And you get good results on various data sets. OK. Um, let me skip ahead to a bit of a punchline. Um, I'm going to con conclude by uh, two things. First thing is uh, describe an example where there was latent variable prediction model can be used in the context of control for autonomous driving. And then I'll, I'll do a little bit of philosophy uh, at the end with one or two slides. OK. So the reason why humans can learn to drive a car in 20 hours of training without crashing is because we have models of the world that allows us to predict in advance the consequences of our actions and what's going to happen in the world before it happens. Okay? That's what, basically, that's the essence of intelligence, the ability to predict and to act on those predictions is really the essence of intelligence. Um, and so you know in advance that if you drive next to a cliff and you turn the wheel to the left, if you're in India, you're going to fall off the cliff. And so you don't try because you know in advance what the result is going to be. You don't need to try to know what the result is going to be. 
So the ability to model the world uh, without killing yourself, which means mostly by observation, is really crucial. Now, if we have a model of the world uh, and we have an estimate of the state of the world, the model of the world is going to predict for us what the next state of the world is going to be given the action that we're going to take. And there might be an extra latent variable here that, we don't, that sort of takes into account all the stuff that we don't know, OK? The state of the world, the part of the state of the world we don't know. So that gives us the next state of the world. And then we can, we can unroll this, uh, we can roll out a scenario of what's going to happen next. And for each uh, state, we can compute a cost, maybe, for the, the situation that we are in. So if we are you know, a self-driving car, the cost is how far, you know, how close am I to the other cars? Am I in lane? Am I uh, driving slower or faster than the target speed, et cetera? OK, so that's a cost function. So you can compute the cost function for you know, a, a scenario that you kind of roll out in your head. And then what you can do is, by gradient descent, you can backpropagate gradient through this entire system and then uh, uh, you know, backpropagate through the, this uh, network here, which is supposed to produce uh, an action. Okay, so this is a neural net, and you can, you can do one of two things through gradient descent. You can figure out an optimal sequence of action that will minimize the cost. This is called receding horizon planning and optimal control. Or you can pr propagate the gradient all the way through this network and then uh, train the weights of this network to produce the optimal action for every situation. So that's what we're going to do. Um, the state of the world is going to be represented by a little neighborhood around every car. So we're going to observe people driving around. Uh, put cameras, uh, you know, above uh, a highway, track every car, and then extract a little rectangle around every car. So the central car is really you, if you want, and then you kind of your state of the world is just the car that's around you. And we're going to train one of those neural nets. Given a few frames of ca what cars are doing around us, this is us, it's our car being uh, tracked. Um, train a neural net of some kind to predict the next state of the world. Now, that neural net cannot make an exact prediction, so it's going to have to rely on one of those latent variables to kind of parameterize the set of possible outcomes uh, of the future. And the architecture we use in the end is very, very much akin to a virtual autoencoder with sort of additional twists. I'm not going to go into the details, but basically there is a piece of a convolutional net that looks at those three frames. It predicts a representation of the world. Uh, and then there is an encoder that looks at the answer and then predicts some sort of value of this latent variable. Uh, but the latent variable is regularized in such a way that, it, that it, its capacity is limited. And this is really kind of a crucial aspect of those latent variable models. You need to limit the informational capacity of the latent variable. Uh, and then run through a decoder to predict the next frame. And these are kind of examples of predictions. So if you keep the latent variable 0, the predictions become blurry really quickly. If you sample the latent variables um, to reasonable values, you observe different future scenarios. So this, uh, these are autoregressive predictions produced by the system by just you know, running on top of itself uh, with different drawings of the latent variable. And you see you know, cars doing different things depending on the drawing of this latent variable. So it really is a multimodal prediction, if you want, using the latent variable. You can plug a cost function on this and measure the distance to the other cars. You can regularize the system so it doesn't do, go into parts of the space where it's unreliable. And in the end, you train the system end to end to drive a car. Uh, by predicting three seconds in advance uh, the likelihood of collisions, and it kind of drives itself reasonably well. What happens here is that you have to realize that this car, uh, all of those cars have kind of recorded trajectories, and this car is driven by our agent, and so it's invisible to the other cars. It, the, the blue car is, is not seen. It's kind of like one of the James Bond cars, right? You hit a button and it disappears. So you're driving traffic. Uh, imagine you drive here in. Ahmedabad, and, and your car is invisible, right? I don't think it would work in, in India. Um, so here's another example. This is the, the yellow car is recorded. The blue car is started from the same location as the yellow car, but it's being driven by your agent. And now it gets squeezed, because uh, the other cars don't see it. So you know, they, they kind of squeeze it, and it has to kind of escape. Um, Here's another scenario where you know it's more, uh, more reasonable. Okay, so my take-home messages. Um, if the slide wants to switch, so supervision, in my opinion, is the future of, of AI, or some form of unsupervised 
uh, uh, learning. And this will allow us to learn hierarchical feature, uh, features for low resources tasks. Uh, and will allow us to train massive networks because data will be very cheap and very high dimensional, very informative. It will allow us to learn forward models of uh, the world and allow us to perhaps come up with sort of very good control systems that we can train because they have models of the world. And my money is on energy-based models uh, and uh, you know, within variable models and things like that, which I talked about. Now, I get asked the question a lot, like when will we have machines that are as intelligent as humans? And people sometimes call this artificial general intelligence, AGI. I think it's a complete misnomer. There is no such thing as artificial general intelligence because there is no such thing as general intelligence. Human intelligence is very, very specialized. We don't like to think about that, right? We'd like to think that our intelligence is general, but it's not. It's very, very specialized. In fact, if there is some evidence for this, it's, it's how badly we get beaten by AI systems for games like Go or chess or other things. We really suck at those games. We're really not very good. Um, the best Go players before AlphaZero and before the, the sort of you know, AI revolution in Go, the best Go players thought they were like, very close to the ideal player that they call God. Okay? Maybe two stone handicaps, which is kind of very, very close. In fact, no, humans are very bad. Even humans are like very, very far away from kind of the ideal player. Um, they get beaten by machines with like many stone handicaps, the, the best uh, grandmasters. So we're, not, we're just not very good at it. Um, there's a lot of things we're not very good at. And, and we're very specialized. So let's not talk about human level, in, hu, about hu, uh, artificial general intelligence anymore. Let's talk about human level intelligence. That's a more interesting concept. Um, there's a bit of, of a question as to whether deep learning so far is a sort of empirical science, which is a polite name for um, alchemy. Okay. Um, there's been this criticism that uh, deep learning neural nets are basically alchemy. It's kind of a black art. And it was for a while. I think we understand a lot more now, but, uh, but there's still a, a need for theory. But it is very common in history, in the history of science and technology, that the invention of an artifact has preceded the theory that explains it. For example, the steam engine was invented in the late 1600s, and it took until the you know, early 1800, mid 1800 for thermodynamics to be formulated. Uh, you know, Carnot cycles and, and you know, free energy and entropy and stuff like that, right? Um, so, and, and it's happened for a lot of different things in the natural sciences, in electromagnetics, in optics, and you know, various other things where, um, you know, the, the artifact on the left here was invented way before the theory. Uh, you know, the computer was basically invented before computer science was called computer science, like 15 years before. Uh, teletype and, and digital communication was invented before information theory was uh, formulated. So, you know, it's very common. So what we need to do now is uh, basically find out what is the equivalent of thermodynamics for intelligence. What is the theory behind intelligence, be behind learning? And we can get inspiration from biology, but we don't want to be copying biology because by copying biology, we run the risk of being hypnotized by details that are irrelevant. And for that lesson, I'm going to use a, a particular example uh, that I like, which is uh, this guy, uh, uh, Clément Adair, uh, I didn't write his name here. Uh, you can see his name here. So in the 1800s, the late 1800s, he built those airplanes that were steam powered. And one of his airplanes called the uh, Eol actually took off from the ground in 1893. And uh, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, 1893. And 1890, actually. And uh, it flew for you know, about this high for about 50 meters and then kind of crash landed. So this guy was a genius at designing steam engines, but uh, he didn't quite care about you know, stability and controllability and stuff like that. He just copied bats, right? So this plane looks like a bat. It even has like, you know, folding wings. Uh, and it was the first plane to take off from the ground on its own power, and you probably never heard of it, right? Who's heard of Clément Adé on his airplane? Oh yeah, the other talk, of course, yeah. Uh, I talk about this often, so if you've seen one of my talks, you've probably heard this. Um, now, he's 
pretty well known in France. And part of the reason he's well known is because the, the name he gave to one of his uh, airplanes was L'Avion. And that's actually, that became the name that we use to designate airplanes in French uh, as well as in Spanish and Portuguese. So that's his legacy. But other than that, he's completely forgotten. And you know, he, he copied biology too much without really sort of understanding the underlying principles behind it. And he had you know, some level of genius. He also invented color photography and a bunch of other stuff. Um, so let's not copy biology too close without understanding why biology does it when in a particular way, because the details, you know, otherwise we're going to build uh, airplanes with feathers. Um, OK, so um, I mentioned three problems, uh, learning without labels, self-supervised learning, reasoning through vector representation, so allowing learning system to reason. And then the third problem, learning hierarchical representation of action plans. I didn't mention this, but I have no idea how to do this. And so it's not worth mentioning. Thank you. <laughs> and I spoke too long, as usual. So we'll have about two questions. I think we are, yeah, a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, my question is that whenever we uh, uh, try to train a deep learning model, so uh, there is a problem we often face that is called as a vanishing gradient descent. So is there any model which can improve this uh, problem? Sorry, I'm creating issues with the audio. Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Uh, uh, whenever we try to uh, train our deep learning model, so we often find and face a problem with the vanishing gradient vision problem. So is there any model or architecture which is available to solve that thing? OK, I have to apologize because there's so much echo that I have a very hard time understanding. Did you get the question? No, I didn't get the question. Hello. Oh, vanishing gradient. OK, all right. Uh, yeah. So vanishing gradient problem. So it's the problem, uh, for those of you who don't know, when you have a very deep network, when the weights of that network are very small, every time you propagate the gradient uh, backwards through those layers, the, the norm of the gradient shrinks. And by the time you get to the first layers, there is no gradient left anymore, and the system doesn't learn. So uh, there's a number of different solutions that have been proposed to this. Probably the best solution we have at the moment is the ResNet architecture. So ResNet architecture has those kind of skipping connections uh, 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 across pairs of layers. So they basically say a pair of layer by default implements the identity function. And what the neural network actually does in between is computing a deviation from the identity. And so that partially solves the, the vanishing gradient problem. Uh, there are other sort of more exotic solutions that have been uh, proposed uh, in terms of like normalizing, normalizing uh, or initializing the weights properly. Uh, other solutions for recurrent nets that have been proposed to kind of uh, do kind of spectral normalization of the of the weight matrix. The weight matrix. So you make sure the weight matrix has, you know, uh, uh, singular values that are all one, for example, or, or perhaps minus one. So you force it to be an orthogonal matrix or unitary matrix, and you start having neural nets that look like quantum mechanics a little bit. Um, so, I mean, there's a number of different solutions, but ResNet really is what everybody uses, and that's what allowed us to train networks with 50 or 100 layers, uh, which really was not possible before. Yeah. Um, sir, thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, I'm actually from a physics background, and uh, you had actually mentioned in the talk about a few uh, physics applications of AI, and I've seen that a lot of applications are coming in these days. Like, uh, as you have mentioned, they have come in simulations and uh, applying deep learning to do predictive stuff. But also, they have done some uh, good work in uh, like uh, trying to use optimization techniques to come up with uh, new quantum states, like exotic quantum states with desirable properties, engineering right. new quantum states. Right. And I've also seen another type of work happening, which is like uh, uh, coming from uh, Max Tegmax group which is to try and uh, distill laws of physics from like uh, mixed data and trying to see what are the laws of physics that can uh, fit these like models which can accurately pre uh, fit the data that is given and symbolic regression and so on. 
So my question is actually, um, what do you think are the components that are necessary for us to come up with uh, uh, th like machines that can make theoretical modeling, like complex abstract theoretical modeling, mathematical? Right. So I mean, there's, there's like it's a vast topic which I find absolutely fascinating. Uh, so as you said, there are those, those really sort of interesting work. I, was, I gave a series of talks at, uh, uh, in the physics department at Harvard a few months ago. And pretty much every experimental physicist there uses deep learning in one way or another because they have, uh, you know, some of them are material physicists, some of them are cosmologists, but material physicists observe properties for which they have no first principle explanations. For example, you take a single monoatomic layer of uh, graphene you put another one on top, and you twist them by 3.12 degrees or some magic number, and it becomes superconductor. Um, we don't know why. I mean, it's some worry effect or whatever, but um, it's very mysterious. And so people are trying to kind of train neural nets to kind of uh, produce phenomenological models of, th of those things, and sort of uh, by differentiating, you can sort of try to optimize the property of the material you want. Uh, so I think the, the future of deep learning in, in material science is enormous in chemistry as well. So people are trying to find like, ways to predict interactions between proteins, or uh, binding free energy between protein and chemical compounds. Or Alain Espoorguzic at uh, University of Toronto is trying to find a uh, process where the, your, the input you're looking at is not a regular grid. So it's not an image, for example, which you can think of as a function on a regular grid, uh, but it's a function on a, on a graph, any graph. It could be an irregular graph. And it sort of generalizes the notion of convolution. Uh, and uh, so some people call this geometric learning, some people call this spectral neural net, some people call this graph CNNs. I mean, there is different names for it, but it's all the same type of idea. There's very good work also by uh, Max Welling at University of Amsterdam for this. Um, this is a fascinating area. I think there's a, a very bright future for those methods uh, and uh, you know, very, very, very exciting. Uh, there's really interesting work, uh, more to your question, uh, in the context of machine learning. So people who are trying to build neural net architectures that have particularly like physical properties like energy conservation, for example. So uh, energy conservation is due to uh, you know, basically time reversible uh, equations or conservation of energy can be, uh, can be formulated in sort of Hamiltonian form of mechanics, right? You, uh, the you know, elementary coordinates are derivatives of the, or gradients are updated with gradients of the Hamiltonian and the momenta. Uh, are also derivatively Hamiltonian with respect to the first uh, component. So it's called symplectic, symplectic property. And uh, my colleague, Leon Botou, with uh, some students, has developed a, a type of neural net called symplectic neural nets, uh, which has that property of kind of preserving energy. So you can so simulate physical systems, you know, like a bouncing ball. And it will actually simulate the bouncing ball without you know, the ball going crazy because energy is not conserved. There's similar work uh, from Google. Uh, that they call Hamiltonian uh, uh, neural nets, uh, which kind of a, a slightly similar idea, although they don't have all the tricks. Uh, so uh, Danilo Rezende also at DeepMind has kind of similar, similar work. So all of this is really fascinating, and I think it's uh, promised to a very, very bright uh, uh, future. Uh, it is clear that I think we'll, we can have really interesting questions and really fascinating answers from uh, uh, our speaker, but unfortunately we have to move on. And on behalf of ACM India, I would like to present to our speaker a token of our gratitude.
Okay. We move on to the next talk, and this is the part of the program where we move from rock music to classical music. Um, from a modern hot topic to uh, classical foundational area of computer science. Our next speaker, Professor Susanne Alvers, um, is a specialist in the area of algorithms, especially online approximation algorithms, algorithmic game theory, and experimental analysis of algorithms. She has done her PhD, uh, or the German Habilitation, in uh, Saarbrücken and Max Planck Institute. And um, for her PhD work, she won the Otto Hahn Medal from the Max Planck Society. So this is one of the common features we have been, it's been observed that most of our annual speakers win the best thesis awards. So it gives you the, you know, the role models to follow for the distinguished doctoral dissertation awardees. So after her PhD, she has um, worked in various universities in Germany, in Dortmund, uh, at the University of Freiburg, at Humboldt University, uh, leading groups in the area of algorithms and complexity. And she has won the Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Prize, the highest award given by the German government for uh, researchers, and also the advanced a uh, grant from the prestigious European Research Council. And today she'll be talking about algorithms beyond the worst case. Please join me in thanking Susanne. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference, Professor Ranade, Professor Misra, and their teams uh, for inviting and hosting me. Thank you very much to ACM and ACM India. It's really a great uh, pleasure and an honor uh, to be here. This is a talk in the area of algorithms. I would like to study refined and uh, alternative approaches, different from standard worst case analysis to evaluate the performance of algorithms. Sometimes uh, a worst case analysis with adversarial input is overly pessimistic. So the goal of this line of research is to develop more realistic and robust algorithm analysis that explains phenomena that are observed in practice. I will survey uh, some results known in the literature and will also present some research results of mine that were obtained together with uh, PhD students uh, and postdocs. Let me start with some uh, motivation. Traditionally, as you know, the performance of an algorithm in terms of uh, running time or solution quality is evaluated on a worst case input, input instance uh, that triggers the worst performance. This approach has uh, pros and cons. On the positive side, it often identifies uh, useful, useful and meaningful algorithms. Good candidates are algorithms that we find in undergraduate textbooks. Also, algorithms with the worst case guarantee work well in every, in every domain. We don't have to worry in which specific domain and algorithm is being executed. On the other hand, uh, worst case analysis is, as I said, sometimes overly pessimistic. Uh, worst case instances are rather contrived and hardly occur in a practical environment. Moreover, worst case analysis sometimes fails to discern, to differentiate between meaningful algorithms. It ranks two or more strategies equally. The algorithms appear to be equally good while in practice uh, one algorithm is uh, superior. We can take a look uh, at a few classical problems where worst case analysis fails. A first very basic problem, uh, you all know it is a classical sorting problem where we wish to sort n, uh, n elements or n keys. Uh, the famous quicksort algorithm is the fastest one on average, it has an, ex an excellent general purpose uh, sorting algorithm. However, its uh, worst case running time uh, is, uh, is quadratic, which is not optimal in the comparison-based sorting uh, model. 
Similarly, insertion sort has a quadratic running time, but works well on almost sorted uh, data sets. By contrast, merge sort and heap sort do achieve an optimal worst case running time of n log n, uh, which is um, optimal in the comparison based model, but both algorithms are typically slower than quick sort, at least if, uh, if the data fits into uh, main memory. Another prominent failure of worst case analysis is linear programming. We wish to optimize uh, a linear objective function, let's say, with, uh, with an variable subject to a set uh, of uh, linear constraints. Many optimization problems can be formulated in this framework. Uh, already in the 1940s, Danzig uh, developed the famous simplex algorithm for solving linear programs. Um, the simplex algorithm has an excellent performance in practice. It can solve extremely fast, huge instances with millions of variables, millions of uh, constraints. Basically, the algorithm uh, performs uh, a local search on the vertices of the boundary uh, of the polytope, the feasible region, which is a convex polytope. Uh, however, in the 1970s, Klee and Minty showed that the simplex algorithm has an exponential worst case running time. There exist fairly specific linear programs known as the Klee Minty cube, where the algorithm uh, performs an exponential number of uh, pivoting steps. Uh, in contrast, uh, interior point methods, which approach the optimum solution from the interior of the polytope do have uh, a polynomial worst case running time, but at least the ellipsoid method by Kachian, a breakthrough result at that time is much slower than uh, the simplex algorithm on practical instances. Uh, another fundamental problem in data science these days is uh, clustering. We are given a set of data points in d-dimensional space and want to partition them into sensible uh, groups. In a more formal problem definition, uh, we might want to find k cluster centers, c1 through ck, minimizing uh, the sum of the distances between the data points xi to their nearest cluster. This is the uh, so-called k-median objective, and in k-means, we are interested in the squared distances. Uh, both problems uh, are NP-hard while real-world instances can usually be solved extremely fast, or not only fast, it can be solved very well. In particular, Lloyd's algorithm produces uh, very good clustering. The algorithm repeatedly assigns data points to their best to their nearest cluster and then updates uh, the set of cluster centers. This suggests that uh, clustering is NP-hard on instances that uh, really do not matter in practice. And the final uh, example I want to discuss here in this talk, I will also turn to this problem later on, is a fundamental memory management problem, paging and caching, a problem that is also studied in undergraduate courses on uh, yeah, hardware architecture, operating systems, and algorithms. We are given uh, a two-level memory system, small fast memory, large slow memory. Fast memory, as you know, can be uh, the main memory of a computer. Slow memory can be a magnetic disk. The memory is partitioned into pages uh, of equal size. Now, as, uh, as input, we receive, the system receives uh, a sequence of requests. It is generated by a program running on the CPU. Each uh, request specifies a page uh, in the memory system. A request can be served immediately with zero cost if the reference page is available in fast memory. Here we have memory hits on the first five uh, accesses, first five requests to pages DC, ABC. A so-called page fault occurs if the reference page is not in fast memory. Here we have a fault at the request uh, 2F, and now the missing page must be loaded from slow memory into fast memory so that the request can be served. At the same time, the page must be dropped, must be evicted from fast memory to make room uh, for the incoming page. And this decision, which uh, page to evict on a fault, must typically be made in an online fashion, online without knowledge of any future request. The goal is to minimize the number of page faults. As later and Tarjan, who founded the theory of online algorithms, streaming algorithms that have to handle input without knowledge of any future input portions at any given point in time, um, 
analyzed uh, popular page replacement strategies. LIU is a popular page replacement strategy, always evicting on a fault, evicting the page whose last reference is longest ago, was requested least recently, page first in, first out, would drop the page that has been in fast memory longest. They showed that there exist instances, worst case instances, where the ratio number of false generated by LRU divided by the optimum number of false can be as high as K, where K is the number of pages that can simultaneously reside in a fast memory. This is a huge uh, ratio because a real fast memory can store several hundreds or thousands of uh, pages. On the other hand, in practice, both uh, algo same result holds not only for LRU but for FIFO as well. Uh, in uh, practice, on the other hand, both algorithms have an excellent performance. Their performance ratios are small uh, in the range between two and four, so there is a huge gap between the theoretically proven and experimentally uh, observed performance guarantees of the algorithm. So for these reasons, there has recently been quite some inter research interest in analyzing algorithms uh, beyond their worst case. Uh, to come up with more robust, realistic algorithm analysis. The general goal is to identify uh, properties of real-world input, come, to come up with a suitable model, mathematical model, ideally, to, and then to evaluate the performance of algorithms in these frameworks. Again, we want to mathematically prove uh, guarantees, as before, which is a tradition in algorithms, but uh, meaningful ones uh, that are consistent with observations in practice. In this context, uh, Tim Rafgarden has uh, recently published uh, a survey article in the communications of the M. A very recent uh, article, very pleasant read. Um, basically, there exist, in the literature, there exist uh, two approaches towards uh, a modeling of real world input and the refined algorithm analysis. First of all, there exist probabilistic approaches which assume that uh, input uh, to some extent to some extent is random and secondly there exist uh, deterministic approaches so called deterministic approaches here for a specific algorithmic problem un under consideration one tries to develop an accurate uh, specifically tailored uh, model that would capture properties of real input in the following i would like to address uh, both of these approaches, and let me start with the probabilistic ones. Again, for the uh, probabilistic approaches, there are three main directions. Uh, one could classify them uh, into yeah, an average case analysis, smooth analysis, uh, and semi-random models. I have prepared slides for each of them. Average case analysis is not new. It was extensively studied in the 1970s, roughly speaking here. One assumes that uh, input is generated according to a probability distribution, and then one analyzes the expected performance of an algorithm on such uh, random input. Uh, a well-known result is, or in the sorting problem, we could assume that uh, a random permutation of the input number needs to be sorted. A well-known result is that a quick sort in this setting has an expected worst case running time of uh, n log n, which is uh, optimal in expectation. A major concern regarding this uh, type of analysis is that uh, input that occurs in computer science in practice is not random for many problems. Uh, real world instances uh, have very little in common with input that is generated according to probability di distributions, and even if uh, there is an underlying di probability distribution, it might not be known. So uh, there are concerns regarding this uh, direction. A second, uh, more recent and modern uh, approach is uh, a smooth analysis pioneered by Spielmann and Teng about 15 years ago. The intuition is again that randomness in the input rules out uh, pathological worst case instances, but randomness is introduced in a more sophisticated and subtle way. More specifically, one assumes that uh, an adversary, classical framework, chooses an input instance, and then the uh, input elements are slightly perturbed by Gaussian uh, noise. So consider 
uh, an input element and for simplicity assume that it is a real number. To this input element, we add uh, a Gaussian random variable with mean zero, standard deviation uh, sigma. Breakthrough result by Spielmann and Tang is that in this framework, uh, the simplex algorithm for linear programming has polynomial smooth complexity, assuming that uh, the coefficients, the coefficients of the constraint matrix in the linear program are slightly perturbed by Gaussian noise. This is the running time now. It's polynomial, as you can see, polynomial in the number of variables, n, the number of constraints, and in one uh, over sigma. There exists further work in this framework. For instance, uh, Röglin and co-authors analyzed the clustering problem, showed that Lloyd's algorithm indeed has a uh, a polynomial uh, smooth complexity. Its worst case running time is super polynomial, but looking at smooth complexity, Lloyd's clustering algorithm is again polynomial. Uh, Bertolt Föking and others uh, analyzed the two op heuristic for the traveling salesman problem. This local search uh, algorithm, given uh, any two, always replaces two edges so as to obtain a better tour. Again, worst case running time, but in, in the smooth setting or in this perturbed setting, it has uh, a polynomial running time. Uh, the semi-random model, the search direction, go a bit further, go one step further in blending uh, adversarial and probabilistic features in the uh, input. Perhaps down here, first, Feige and Kilian proposed uh, uh, interesting so-called planted graph model that applies to fundamental graph problems such as independent set, graph coloring, and graph bisection. Uh, on a high level, first, uh, a solution is uh, picked, is chosen, and then extra edges, it's, it's a model that is really tailored to graph problems, then extra edges are rendered in a fa random fashion or by an adversary. In the independent set problem, for instance, first, an independent set of a certain size uh, is selected, and then edges connecting the vertices of the independent set to the remaining vertices are added in a random fashion, or also by an adversary in graph uh, coloring. Uh, first, uh, a partitioning of the vertices into color classes is selected, and then uh, edges connecting vertices from different uh, color classes are added either at random or by an adversary. Um, the, in the following 10 to 15 minutes, uh, I would like to focus on the random order model. It's a very popular input model these days. Uh, many algorithmic problems uh, in the recent theory conferences, algorithms conferences, have been uh, studied in the random order model. Uh, it's also very effective to overcome negative results implied by standard worst case analysis on a high level in an input. The input elements arrive in random order. So a bit more, to be a bit more specific. Again, it is assumed that an input instance may be chosen in an adversarial fashion by an adversary. And then the input elements do not arrive in a worst case order, but in a, a random uh, order. This framework is quite universal. That is probably a strength. can be applied to a large class of algorithmic problems. And I would say it is sensible if uh, input characteristics are unknown or just too complex to be modeled by a more accu accurate uh, mathematical uh, model. Uh, the prototype problem to illustrate the random order model is the secretary problem, again, uh, a problem that uh, people like it, researchers like it. It's uh, extensively studied these days, but it's in fact a very old problem, first uh, examined by Dinkin and Lindley in the 1960s. Suppose that you want to hire a new uh, secretary, a new assistant for your office. There are N uh, candidates that are interviewed sequentially, one by one, during each interview. Or let's say each, uh, each candidate has certain qualifications, a value that becomes known during the interview. Uh, after each interview, uh, an immediate decision must be made. The candidate can be accepted or discarded, rejected. 
irrevocably without knowing any uh, future candidates, and the goal is to uh, maximize uh, the value of the selected uh, candidate. Uh, more formally, more abstractly, we are given n input numbers, v1, v2, up to vn. These numbers arrive over time, one by one, sequentially one by one. Uh, and whenever an input number has uh, arrived, it can be accepted or rejected immediately without knowing, without seeing any future input numbers. Our goal is to maximize the value of the selected number. This is a fundamental problem in stopping theory, in decision theory, with uh, a range of applications apart from hiring uh, an employee. Perhaps we want to sell a house or valuable item. We receive uh, offers. Or we would like to accept an offer in a sequence uh, of offers that is uh, revealed sequentially over time. We have to accept at a given point in time, perhaps the data center uh, can accept uh, jobs to be executed, each bringing a certain uh, profit. We would have to accept or discard those incoming requests. The recent uh, interest in uh, secretary type problems is, is based on its applications in internet advertising, uh, uh, sponsored search auctions, mapping uh, advertisers to users as they serve the web include uh, sophisticated secretary problems. Uh, so the secretary problem, actually like the paging problem I showed you before, is an online problem. We receive the input as a sequence of input portions, I1, I2, and so on. At every, any given point in time, T, input portion IT, uh, comes in, and the algorithm has to produce output, uh, accept or reject in our case here without seeing any future input portion. Despite the handicap of not knowing the future, we would like to design algorithms with a provably good performance guarantee. Here an online strategy, an algorithm in red, is uh, compared to an optimal offline algorithm, all powerful strategy that knows the entire input sequence in advance and can produce an optimum solution. We say uh, that uh, an algorithm, online strategy, achieves a performance ratio or in terminology C competitive, factor C, if for all input sequences, solution constructed by A, secretary is a maximization problem, so the value obtained by the algorithm is at least a factor C times the optimum solution. Now, if we divide this inequality by op, then we get a ratio, the algorithm's value for secretary divided by the optimum value. This is a performance ratio, and of course, value maximization, we want to maximize this uh, ratio. Now, it turns out that in the Standard worst case set, uh, setting for the secretary problem, no online strategy can achieve a bounded performance guarantee strictly greater than zero. This can be seen as follows. Consider the following input sequence, first uh, consisting of n minus one numbers, each having a value of uh, one. And now there are two cases uh, to distinguish. First case is that the algorithm uh, has accepted one of these input numbers of value one. Then an adversary, a cruel adversary, will present a final value, capital V, a huge value. The online return is one, while the optimum return is capital V. And as you can see, this relative ratio, one over capital V, can be arbitrarily close uh, to zero if, uh, as V increases. On the other hand, uh, if the algorithm has not yet accepted any of the first uh, input numbers, then an adversary will present a final value zero, and now the ratio uh, zero by one is exactly equal to zero. So in the worst case, we cannot hope for anything provably good. In the random order model, when a random permutation of the input numbers uh, arrive, one can do better. Consider the following uh, algorithm consisting of a sampling phase and uh, a selection phase. In a sampling phase, the algorithm rejects the first incoming numbers, T numbers for a suitably chosen T. T is the length of the sampling period, but notes down all of the numbers are rejected, but we note down the maximum value encountered during the sampling phase. And then in the subsequent selection phase, we accept, we're happy to accept the first number strictly greater than m. Again, uh, pictorially, in red, a sampling phase. We observe the input numbers, discard all of them, 
t, the lengths must be chosen appropriately. We note down the maximum value we encounter, and then subsequently in the selection phase, we take the first number that beats uh, the factor, uh, the, not the factor, that beats the value of uh, m. One can show, uh, this was done uh, by Dinkin and Lindley, that in the random order model, the expected value attained by the sampling algorithm is at least a factor one over e times the optimum value on the sequence, e being the Eulerian number, one over e roughly 0.37. Uh, so this is a bounded performance guarantee, and the length of the sampling period is roughly number of input numbers n uh, over e. There exists uh, much much further work in this context. Colleagues, people have looked at generalized uh, secretary problems, packing problems, bin packing, and uh, the knapsack problems have been looked at. Facility location, online matching in uh, bipartite and general graphs have been explored. Facility location and also scheduling and load balancing problems on parallel uh, processors. In this uh, context, I would uh, like to show some results of ours that were obtained together with PhD students and a former postdoc, Arindam Khan, now at the Indian Institute of Science. We have uh, studied a K-secretary problem, generalization, where instead of a single a number k uh, elements, k numbers can be selected. We have looked at the famous knapsack problem and also at uh, a load balancing problem. Maybe we can quickly go through these results uh, to illustrate. So in the case secretary problem, as mentioned before, again, a stream of uh, input numbers. And now we can select k of them to as to so as to maximize that. Some of this is probably the most natural, uh, most immediate generalization of the classical secretary problem. Again, with a range of applications, we might want to hire a small team, uh, a small team of employees. Perhaps we have to sell a small set of valuable items. A data center can accept a set of jobs uh, to be processed over a time horizon. And also in a sponsored search auction, advertiser will probably issue bids in a set uh, of auctions and uh, similarly uh, a small set of ads is displayed uh, in response to a user search. Uh, the case secretary problem was first examined in, uh, in a paper by uh, Kleinberg, JACM 2018, and the authors propose an algorithm called uh, optimistic that achieves a performance ratio of one over e, the same ratio as for the classical secretary problem, looking at the, at the case secretary problem, so no better guarantee is uh, obtained. In an earlier paper, Kleinberg had uh, presented an algorithm with a performance ratio equal to this green expression. This is asymptotically tied. They showed, or this is actually a single author paper, he showed that the performance ratio for K-secretary is exactly equal, asymptotically, 1 over 1 minus theta, 1 over root K. Uh, the drawback of this result is that for small values of K up to 36, this green ratio is strictly smaller than uh, 1 over e, meaning that for small values of k, no algorithm was known beating the factor, the classical ratio of 1 over e. So in our paper, we uh, present the first improved guarantees for small values of k, which are uh, rather relevant in practice. Let me show you the optimistic algorithm, the generalization of the sampling algorithm we have seen before. Again, the optimistic algorithm consists of a sampling phase followed by a selection phase. Maybe we can look at the picture down here again during its uh, uh, random order model, of course. Again, uh, the algorithm during uh, the sampling phase, shown in red, uh, observes the first t input numbers for a suitably chosen T, all of these numbers are discarded, are rejected, but we note down the K best elements we have seen and let S1, S2 up to SK be their sorted order. Then in the subsequent selection phase, the J's except is the first number strictly greater than SJ, meaning that first we are happy to accept uh, a number beating the smallest value. We have seen from the sampling S1. Second except is uh, a number beating S2 and uh, so on. We have analyzed uh, this algorithm here in red is our 
let's say, main results, we can show that for k equals 2, so for two secretary, this uh, gives a ratio of 0.41. It's a numerical value. Eating 1 over uh, e first guaranteed strictly above 1 over e sm for small values of k. Uh, one can also show an interesting relation, uh, namely the probability that this optimistic algorithm accepts the second best item in the input stream is equal to the probability that the classical secretary accepts uh, the best item. For larger values of k, this algorithm is hard to analyze because one has to keep track of k reference values, which is difficult in the analysis. All these analyses are difficult because uh, one has to yeah, analyze an arbitrary random permutation and then take the expected value. So k reference uh, values are hard to handle, and therefore we have proposed a simpler algorithm that works with a single reference uh, item only. This is why the algorithm is called single ref. So again, in sampling, uh, we discard the first p input numbers and note down the r's best value we have encountered for an integer r in the range between 1 and k. And then one accepts uh, any number that beats this reference item and, of course, up to k numbers uh, may be selected. We can analyze this algorithm in closed form. This is the competitive ratio. You don't need to look at the detail. It's basically an expression that, depending on probabilities, that the maximum value in the input is taken as j's uh, except this level of detail seems to be necessary to actually beat uh, the factor of 1 over e. And this plot, uh, as a summary perhaps, um, shows the comparison of uh, our single ref algorithm as compared to Kleinberg's algorithm. The main two findings uh, are that uh, for small values of k, but uh, we are always above 1 over e, and uh, the ratios also better, significantly better than the former guarantee by uh, Kleinberg. Together with uh, Arin Damkan, we extended this uh, line of research to the classical knapsack problem. You are familiar with the knapsack problem. We are given n items, a set of n items. Each item i has uh, an individual value and uh, a weight. We have a knapsack with uh, a weight bound of uh, capital W, meaning that items up to a total weight of capital W can be filled into the knapsack. The goal is to find uh, a subset of the items observing the weight bound, the knapsack capacity, and that uh, maximizes the accumulated uh, value. This is a famous np hard optimization problem. If uh, all items are known in advance, in fact, it's one of the first problems that Richard Karp identified as being uh, NP hard in the 1970s. Here we are interested in the online setting where again items arrive over time, one by one, and whenever an item comes in, we need to accept it. We can pack it into the, nap into the knapsack or we can discard it immediately and irrevocably. Natural application is the packing of containers, trucks, or uh, cargo aircrafts. Uh, the online knapsack problem is a generalization of the uh, secretary problem, so that again, in the worst case, no algorithm can achieve a bounded performance guarantee strictly greater than zero, even in random order. In the random order setting, the problem is difficult, and the previous best guarantees in terms of num numerical values were uh, small. Kleinberg et al. Uh, showed a ratio of 1 over 10e which is 1 over 27, a tiny ratio of working improved this uh, to 1 over 8. Uh, we were able uh, recently to improve this uh, to 1 over 6.6. Uh, it's a small improvement, but it's based on a, algorithmically on, based on a new approach of partitioning items into classes according to their weights and to, then to pack them sequentially. And the problem also extends to a generalized assignment problem where multiple knapsacks, multiple containers need to be packed, and the value and weight of items may depend uh, on the knapsack. I have a high-level overview of the algorithm, but perhaps in the interest of time, I will skip it. It's, again, based on sampling. Then the algorithm would pack a large item. An item is large if it's 
uh, weight, its size exceeds W over 3, meaning that at most two items can be filled into the knapsack. And then uh, in the remaining rounds, small items are being packed. And here you might have seen this one resorts to a greedy packing for the small items where small items are sorted, items we have seen so far in order of decreasing ratio value by weight and this sort of perfect greedy uh, packing, one packs these items until the knapsack capacity is exhausted, taken as oracle whether or not to accept an item. Don't need to look at detail. A final uh, problem I want to study in the random order setting is uh, a famous load balancing problem on parallel machines. It's a so-called make spin minimization problem, one of the most basic uh, problems in scheduling theory, basically every textbook on uh, scheduling operations research would cover uh, this problem uh, already as an abstract formulation. We are given m identical parallel processors or uh, machines. As input, we receive a sequence of jobs, j1 up to jn. Each job, ji, has an individual processing time. pi jobs have to be assigned to the machines so as to minimize the make span, which is the completion time of the last job that finishes in the constructed schedule. It's basically the height or end of the schedule. If you look at this small example here on the right-hand side, we have m identical machines in parallel. The blue rectangles represent jobs. The height of a rectangle corresponds to its processing time. And the green line here, up here, that marks uh, the make span. That is the height or the length of the schedule. And minimizing the make span, our objective, is basically equivalent to uh, a balancing load among the machines. And this is also a reason why this problem it actually uh, has real-world applications uh, in the uh, yeah, resource management and the load balancing of, of parallel machines in uh, data centers or compute clusters. It's uh, a classical problem already in the 1960s. Graham proposed a famous greedy uh, strategy, which is the sim most simple rule that comes to mind, simply place an incoming job on the least loaded machine in this particular configuration. A new additional incoming job, JT, at time T, would be placed here on the second machine as it has the smallest current uh, load. Graham showed that this algorithm achieves a performance ratio of two. So let me remind you, so far we have looked at uh, value maximization problem, secretary, make spend minimization is a minimization problem, same concept of evaluating an algorithm, but with minimization, algorithm is C competitive, has a performance guarantee of C if for all inputs. The algorithmic solution is upper bounded, is at most C times the optimum solution. So Graham, that is a famous result, showed that this greedy strategy is too competitive on every worst case sequence. The make span produced by greedy is at most uh, twice the optimum uh, make span, and indeed, this ratio is uh, tight. This is proof uh, by a small example here. Consider uh, an input sequence which uh, first consists of many small jobs, each having a processing time of one. After Greedy has placed these small jobs, shown in blue, on the M processors, uh, it has a perfectly balanced flat schedule, shown in blue here, of height M minus one. So we have m times m minus 1 small jobs distributed on m machines gives a load of m minus 1. And now a final large job will basically ruin the entire configuration. A final large job of size m produces a make span of uh, height to m minus 1. On the other hand, an optimum solution can uh, select or can reserve one machine for the large, the red shop, and distribute all the blue jobs evenly among the M machines, giving a height of M. And as you see, the relative ratio to M minus 1 over M is basically too arbitrarily close uh, to 2. People, colleagues, have tried to improve uh, this ratio. This slide shows the landscape. Progress was made in relatively small uh, steps from our greedy solution, factor 2, down to the best guarantee currently known, 1.92. This is small progress <laughs> in terms of numerical values, but all of these 
papers, appeared in very good conferences, the top conferences, stock fox. So there's also a lower bound known indicating that in the standard, this is all standard worst case analysis, no deterministic algorithm can have a guarantee smaller than 1.88. In random order, in the random order setting, only one uh, prior result was known. Osborne and Torng showed that, unfortunately, in the random order model, greedy remains too competitive. So greedy is not better than too competitive, even in the random order model. In ongoing work, uh, we are about to send a submission, we present the first guarantees for the random order model showing an algorithm with a ratio of roughly 1.84 random order setting. Uh, yeah, this is the first guarantee better and it is also strictly below this lower bound of 1.88, the lower bound for deterministic algorithms in the worst case setting. I can show you just on a high level, a few uh, pictures, no calculations, uh, what the intuition of this algorithm is. So remember, uh, the bad situation for greedy is uh, if the algorithm has uh, in blue a flat balance schedule, and then one big job would kill uh, the entire configuration, produces a high make spend relative to the optimum. So the intuition of the improved algorithm is to try to avoid uh, a flat, even schedule and rather tries to maintain an imbalanced schedule where uh, some machines are lightly loaded and others are more heavily loaded. In such a configuration, an incoming large job can always be placed on a lightly loaded machine without increasing the make spend by uh, too much. And yeah, an incoming job uh, is now, as, as an algorithmic, uh, uh, policy is now placed on one of three candidate machines in order to maintain an imbalance schedule. We would first try to place it on a highly loaded machine if the resulting make spend perhaps is too high. Whatever this means, it all has to ma be made specific. If this is too high, uh, the algorithm would probe an intermediate machine, machine of an intermediate load in case the uh, resulting make spend still would be too high a placement uh, on the least loaded machine would be taken. And then, yeah, the task is, uh, mathematical task basically is to analyze such a scheme on a random permutation. In the agenda, this uh, concludes what I would like to mention about probabilistic models. And then in the perhaps remaining 10 to 15 minutes, I would like to look at uh, deterministic approaches in input modeling, uh, as mentioned earlier, for a specific algorithmic problem under consideration. Uh, the scientific task is to identify properties of real data sets to come up with a suitable uh, mathematical model that hopefully accurately describes those properties. Again, as an algorithmic person, one likes to, one uh, has to analyze the performance of algorithms in such a setting. Turns out that such an approach is uh, typically feasible if real data sets can be, are available that can be inspected with respect to the desired properties. Um, in the literature, again, the algorithms literature, three problem classes have been uh, examined uh, extensively. There exists a considerable body of literature on memory management problems, paging and caching. Data structuring problems uh, have been explored. We also have work in this context and uh, clustering problems have been studied. In the next 10 minutes, uh, I would like to go uh, through paging and caching, fundamental memory management from this line of research defining a suitable input models for memory hierarchies was initiated in a seminal paper by Borodin. Uh, at all, uh, Christoph Papa Dimitriou has done some work on it, and I would like to report, show some uh, results of a recent study together with Dario Frascaria, a combined theoretical and experimental study. So, memory management, uh, we have seen that problem before, paging and caching, just in a brief, uh, a two level memory system, small fast memory. Large slow memory system is presented with a sequence of requests. A page fault occurs whenever a reference page is not uh, in fast memory. Now the missing page must be brought 
into fast memory in return or at the same time a page must be dropped to make room for the incoming page we want to minimize uh, the number of page faults. And the decision which page to evict, it's again an online decision, must be made without knowledge of any future request. Again, this is a cost minimization problem, so competitiveness means algorithm, algorithmic solution is upper bounded by factor C, our performance guarantee, times the optimum solution. In a seminal paper, Slater and Tarjan showed that both LIU and FIFO are K competitive. Again, K the cache size, the number of pages in fast memory. I mentioned already uh, this is a big gap. Ratio of K can be huge. Several hundred, several thousand of pages fit into me uh, main memory. Both algorithms, LIU and FIFO, have an excellent performance, be range between two and four. So a huge gap between theoretically proven and experimentally observed guarantees. Another drawback, I haven't mentioned that so far, another drawback of competitive worst case analysis is that it ranks uh, both strategies equally. Both algorithms appear to be or equally good. Both algorithms are K competitive, wherein whereas in practice LIU is strictly superior than uh, FIFO. Uh, the reason for these shortcomings uh, should be clear. A worst case analysis, a competitive analysis admits arbitrary input sequences, whereas uh, request sequences that occur in practice have a special structure. They exhibit uh, locality of reference, meaning that whenever a page is currently accessed by a program, it is likely to be accessed again in the near uh, future. So the scientific task is uh, to model uh, locality of reference, to come up with suitable models for locality. Several such models, or many such models, have been proposed. This list is not complete. There exist more, but here for the purpose of this talk, Borodin et al. introduced excess graphs modeling the control flow of programs. Papa Dimitrio, they looked at uh, or defined a so-called diffuse adversary where a uh, request sequence is generated uh, by a probability distribution that comes from a relative small restricted family of distributions in uh, Markov paging a request sequence is generated uh, according to a Markov chain. So in summary, there exist several sophisticated models for localities, but uh, a drawback is that in all of these models it is difficult or in some cases even impossible to explicitly quantify the performance of algorithms and even if it is possible to quantify, evaluate the performance of algorithms and the gap between theory and practice, theoretically proven and, and uh, uh, theoretically proven and experimentally observed performance guarantee remains to be uh, linear in case. So in our recent study, uh, we come up with a very simple uh, model for locality of reference that I'll show you in a moment. In this framework, we are able to explicitly quantify uh, for the first time the performance of algorithms in terms of locality of parameters. We have yeah, mathematically analyzed uh, the optimum strategy, LIU, FIFO, uh, flush when full. We have also done a comparison between these uh, strategies and it shows that there is indeed a, a sharp separation. LIU is strictly superior, mathematically LIU is strictly superior on inputs with a high degree of locality. That explains why LIU is better uh, in practice than other uh, replacement strategies and we have also done an expensive, extensive experimental study with traces from benchmark libraries and it shows for the first time that the mathematically proven guarantees are very close to the experimentally observed ones up to a small uh, constant factor. So I will uh, quickly go through these results. It's pretty late now, so just a short uh, look, a quick look at it. So our task is to uh, model locality and uh, we propose a framework that is based, it's uh, not difficult, it is based on inter-request distances. Intuitively in locality when a page is accessed by a program, it is likely to be accessed again in the near future. So this, therefore it is natural to consider distances between pairs of requests to the same item. So we consider distances between uh, request pairs, uh, pairs that reference the same object. 
So in this small sample sequence, we could take a look, for instance, at the references to page A, which are shown in red. You see that uh, they are separated by three requests, three pages, B, C, and D. The inter-request distance is three. Then for the next pair to uh, pages A, we have a distance of zero, a distance of two, a distance of three, and so on. And similarly, we can look at the inter-request distances for all the other pages as well. So consider an uh, arbitrary input sequence consisting of a series of requests. We say that request I of T issued at time T is a distance L request if the reference page, let's call it A, has been requested before in the sequence. Let's say it was most recently requested at time T prime. And in the interval uh, between T prime and T exactly L distinct pages uh, do occur. So for a pair of requests, we inspect how many distinct pages uh, do occur. Now we build a locality model that is basically a skeleton or fingerprint of the inter-request distances. We assume that feasible input is defined by a so-called characteristic vector consisting of vector entries C0 up to Cp minus 1, where P is the total number of pages ever requested. And now in an input, in a feasible input characterized by C, there are exact, exactly CL distance L requests for variable L between 0 and P minus 1. So note that such a characteristic vector limits the family of feasible input, but it still defines a spectrum, a family of inputs, each having input sequences, each having the property that the number of distance L requests is exactly equal to CL. Now, given a characteristic vector, the cap cap uh, competitive ratio, capital R of an algorithm, is defined as the maximum ratio number of page faults generated by the algorithm divided by the optimum number of page faults for the input when focusing on inputs that are defined, that are specified by this characteristic vector. It turns out that this is a very sensible model for locality. We have done an experimental study with traces from Benchmark Library that was made available by Kaplan et al., specifically designed to evaluate uh, memory hierarchies. The library consists of 15 files with uh, sequential logs of memory excesses made by various programs, uh, standard applications, uh, standard programs from the Linux and Windows uh, operating systems have been uh, used. Uh, this, uh, so in the experiments, in a first step, we have extracted, for each of the files, we have extracted the underlying characteristic vector simply by counting how many distance L requests do occur. And this plot shows the result uh, for the execution of a C compiler. And here on the, on the horizontal axis, we have the distance values L ranging from zero. The largest distance is roughly 450. And on the uh, vertical axis, we have uh, the vector entries, CL, the counts, how many distance L requests do occur. And note that this is a logarithmic scale. And as you can see, a quite impressive in my opinion, the vast majority of requests are distance L requests for small values of L, L between uh, 0 and 10. This is the execution of a C compiler. Same behavior shows for all the other files as well. Just to show you execution of an internet browser, again, almost all requests are distance L requests for tiny values uh, of L. Then in the paper, our scientific or mathematical task was to evaluate various algorithms. This bound in blue shows a lower bound on the optimum number of page faults given any input characterized by C. You don't need to look at the detail. This is a lower bound. It's basically a linear combination of the vector entries, which are scaled by a factor depending on L. Uh, the bound looks a little complicated, but it is actually nearly tied up to a small additive constant. Using this bound, one can basically immediately derive an upper bound on the competitiveness of LIU simply by noting, uh, if you would sit down, then you would realize it, that the number of page faults generated by LIU is simply the, uh, the sum of the vector entries uh, in the characteristic vector where the counting or where the summation starts at K. LIU will never have a page fault on a distance L request when L is smaller than K. One can show 
complex expression, but it is in between uh, 1 and k. And now in the experiments we have compared my last technical slide, we have compared uh, the theoretically proven bound here uh, to the experimentally observed one. As the size of the fast memory changes, so on the horizontal axis we have the cache size from 0 up to 450. In blue, the competitive ratio. Uh, uh, on the vertical axis, the competitive ratio. In blue, we have the theoretically proven bound I showed you before. And in red, we have the experimentally observed competitiveness. As you can see, the gap between theory and practice is very small, a factor 2, a factor 2.5 at most as compared to the gap of k we had seen before. This is the execution of a C compiler, basically the same for the Netscape uh, file. Uh, with this, I would like to uh, conclude. In this talk, we have yeah, visited uh, various approaches in analyzing um, algorithms beyond the worst case. The probabilistic approaches are very universal, can be applied to a large class of problems uh, applicable in many domains without have to worrying. Deterministic approaches are always tailored to a specific uh, algorithmic problem, memory management, uh, data structuring or clustering, and since the models are typically tailored to a given problem, one gets, uh, it's a bit uh, of work, but it, one gets uh, excellent, accurate results in the comparison between theory and practice. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Okay. So thank you. I was wondering, are there any implications this to of undergraduate applications? It seems to me there's quite a steep access and maybe the, the language to, to uh, develop these ideas uh, is highly mathematical. Do you see these things working out in uh, undergraduate algorithms? Undergraduate, I haven't tried. I have uh, used some of the material in more advanced algorithms classes, and I found uh, that uh, uh, students uh, liked it. In undergraduate courses, uh, I have not done it. Um, as you say, the <laughs> mathematical analysis are typically involved. That might be a, a major drawback. It's pretty heavy machinery uh, involved in uh, particular these random permutations. So that might be harder to access. Uh, perhaps one could present it in one of the f uh, final uh, uh, classes, the final sessions, once one is through the material and maybe as an outlook or a, a future perspective, the last one or two sessions could be devoted without uh, bothering people with, with all the exact mathematics possibly, yeah. Any other question? So I have a question. Ah, um, so you listed uh, this various examples in the beginning where there is this gap between theory and practice. One prominent example is SAT. SAT, yeah. Uh, um, you are probably uh, more familiar with this than I would say one or what has been very successful, uh, probably you, you could better report on this, are these fixed parameter algorithm, right. isn't it? Uh, I'm not into that, but uh, there are uh, algorithms that, yeah, you could explain it, that are basically polynomial and only, ex the running time is only exponential in a small input parameter. And uh, I was always very impressed in uh, seeing these uh, SAT improvements, basically exponential time algorithms, but uh, the exponent small and so on, yeah, this is, yeah. yeah, I haven't shown this, but yeah, it's absolutely also a classical problem set uh, with a different approach, a fixed parameter, a fixed parameter tractability. Okay, so we are already running late, so we thank Susanna again. Thank you. Um,
on behalf of um, ACM. This is a oh, thank you very much. Wow, token. this is this is a land. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. So, thank you. Thank you. Oh, this is too much. <laughs> thank you so much. Oops. Um, Okay, so we stop for the lunch break, uh, requesting all the participants to have their lunch outside the hall. The first three rows, uh, please remain seated so that there's no congestion while exiting. Other participants from row number four till the end.
Singh, who has been of the National E-Governance Division, NEDG. He is a 1995 batch IAS officer of the Nagaland Cadre. He will talk today uh, briefly about the Global AI Summit 2020, which is going to be held in New Delhi in April 2020. So over to Mr. Abhishek Singh for a couple of minutes, then we'll start the session. Thank you. It's an honor and privilege to be amongst here when we are discussing how AI and technologies can enable humanity. So in this context, I just wanted to share that Government of India is organizing the Global Summit on AI with the theme of AI for social transformation, inclusion, and empowerment. And the objective for doing this is to bring together all stakeholders, the researchers, academicians, students, industry, policy makers, in order to evolve a strategy for using emerging technologies, especially AI, for improving lives of uh, citizens. And uh, I was just listening to the talk of uh, Mr. Professor Jan Likun in the, in the morning session. And one remembers the quote that he uses, that, that what distinguishes us humans, intelligence is what makes us human. And what artificial intelligence does is to add to this quality and uh, makes us more humane. So in this context, this uh, summit will bring together all the minds from across the world to brainstorm on how we can use AI for improving healthcare. And we saw how it helps in improving cancer diagnosis and improving uh, treatments. And we'll be listening to Shwetang with regard to how AI has revolutionized even basic healthcare. So we intend to showcase technologies being developed world over, especially Indian startups, in using AI for improving agriculture, improving health, improving social mobility, improving uh, smart, uh, improving lives of citizens in cities, and also address issues regarding ethics related to AI and policy and how the future of work will look like, what AI will impact on this. So the event will be live on uh, webcast all over the world. The portal for the event will be ai.gov.in. And, and the students, especially those who are present today, they can share their ideas and their thoughts with regard to what all should be discussed, what all should be deliberated in the, con in the, in the contest on the MyGov platform, where the URL will be ai.mygov.in. So we invite all of you to give your suggestions, give your ideas, give the themes in which they are there, and participate in the event. So that's all I wanted to share, and now I would request the organizers to go on to the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abhishek. So we'll move on with the sessions. I will hand over the mic to Ms. Dr. Heman Pandey and requesting all the enthusiastic student community to kindly maintain silence when the lecture is going on. Please don't talk amongst yourself. If you wish to discuss, please go outside and discuss. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. As, uh, as you can see, we are uh, surrounded by electronic devices. I'm right now, I have a microphone in my hand. I have my smartphone. There are cameras everywhere. I mean, this laptop has a camera. So wouldn't it be nice if we use these devices, the sense, uh, mic is not on. OK. Wouldn't it be nice? Um, Shall I start all over again? I mean, OK, now what I said is that we are surrounded by devices. I have a microphone which is now working, which probably was always working. I wasn't holding it right. So there is a microphone. There is this smartphone with me. I have a laptop in front of me which has a camera. This has a camera. So all these things have sensors of some sort. So wouldn't it be nice if we use these sensors or if we have additional sensor capability for some specific constructive purposes, such as for healthcare, um, which would, um, which would uh, use the data that uh, is gleaned from uh, just by casual use of these for screening for possibility of diseases and things like so. My point being, 
use these ubiquitous devices now for such constructive purposes. So I won't give away too much of uh, what uh, Shwetak is going to talk about, but I'm very, very feel privileged to have Shwetak with us, who's going to share his research uh, on uh, related things. And I'll leave him to talk about those things. But let me tell you a little bit about, about Shwetak, and he can talk about his, his work even, I guess, more effectively. So uh, I can read out things from here. Uh, we all know him as uh, the recipient of computing prize. Uh, but that has, like, in, in some sense, culmination of a lot of um, uh, research that he has done. Uh, so, and he's been an entrepreneur, as you can see from the thing. Anyway, so what I'm doing, and I actually have Shwetak's consent on this, is not talk about these things which are on the on the slide, but talk about certain things that are for you only. Uh, that he wants to share here, okay? Um, so, uh, despite what the name suggests, or what the surname suggests, Patel, this is his first visit to Gujarat. And <laughs> so, <laughs> and he says he has come specifically uh, to interact with, with, with students, okay? So uh, we thank you very much uh, for that. So again, um, he, his parents, he's not lived in, uh, in India. His parents moved to the US uh, in 60s uh, and uh, motel business. So one of the things that is not very well known is that he can do a bed professionally in less than 30 seconds. He can make a bed in less than 30 seconds. And apparently in motel business, there is a competition. And he believes that he can win that competition hands down. Um, on academic side, I'm just talking about his, um, his um, uh, certain rare characteristics. He finished his bachelor's in, uh, from Georgia Tech in just two and a half years and moved on to do PhD immediately after that. Okay, uh, but um, in addition to academics, he does snowboarding and um, he's also a plumber and electrician. So we have a person who is like multifaceted. Uh, one of the things that I must share is that uh, he is a licensed crane operator also. So when there was some construction going on at Georgia Tech, he operated the crane. He, there, there was a two month uh, delay in the construction, which he claims was not because of him, but he was trying to bring the project on track. Anyway, I think we have heard a lot about him. I think it's time to hear about his research. So again, Shwetak, it's a privilege having, having you here, and uh, over to you. Great. Thank you. All right, can you hear me? So, Kem Cho, hello. Uh, this is an honor and privilege to uh, give this talk um, on the soil of my heritage and my family. Um, I told my mother and father that I was going to Gujarat. First thing that they said was, are you going to meet the family? It's like, I'm here for two days. My priority is actually the students right now. Um, I'll actually be back in December with the family, so I'm actually going to do a proper family trip. But, uh, but this is such a great honor. Um, so what I want to talk to you about um, is kind of what Jan LeCun actually kind of teed up for me, is you know, he talked about how AI and deep learning can save lives. Well, hopefully what I can show with some of this work is that it does save lives. Um, a lot of the work I've done has been very applied. So I use uh, machine learning, sensors, uh, tools in computing as a way to solve interesting problems that I find fascinating from a social good standpoint. So I'm very applied. Um, a lot of the work I've done spans from energy monitoring, which I won't be able to talk about today, but looking at how do we leverage sensors that are low cost to basically monitor one's energy in a home and a building to make better decisions about how we build um, buildings in a much more energy efficient way. Um, a lot of work in healthcare, which I'll talk about today. 
Low power sensors, so my group has done a lot of work in looking at how do we build sensors that are so low power that it could run off you know, a single battery for 20, 30 years, or even sometimes don't even have a battery. Um, and also looking at new interaction techniques. You know, we're moving away from the desktop and um, laptop model and going into mobile phones and things that are on your wrist. How do you adapt that interaction paradigm? So my group has been very broad in terms of the types of research that we focused on, but really the core of the work that we do is looking at how do we solve uh, problems that or societally relevant. So I'll focus primarily on my health research, but I'm around today, so if anybody wants to talk about any of the other research or some of the talk, work I talk, um, I talk about today, I'm happy to answer those questions. So one of the things that I'm really passionate about is looking at how do we leverage computing and then sensors to be able to try to make a dent in healthcare. Healthcare is one of those things that really has been changing very slowly. If you think about it in the US or India or even parts of Europe, there's all these different challenges that we have. And one of the main challenges is that healthcare is not actually owned by a particular individual. It's hard for somebody to say that, hey, I can take control of my health because these are the things I need to do to actually make a difference in my own personal health. The problem is the technology doesn't exist and also the societal structures and the infrastructure in healthcare isn't really set up to actually enable one to take, uh, uh, one to take ownership of their own healthcare. Uh, so before I dive into that, you know, uh, one, of the thing that's one of the things that's interesting is that you know, um, Jan is the recipient of uh, the Turing Award, the, the highest prize in our field. But one thing I want to point out is that um, uh, uh, Turing's second highest cited paper, or sometimes the first highest cited, depending on what year you look at, was actually an application of computing in health. Uh, so one could argue that some of the work in computing and health actually dated back when Turing was doing some of his earlier work. Uh, this was actually work that he did was he was trying to model biological processes to basically try to figure out, you know, when doing the embryonic process, like how can I have a mathematical formulation to predict what happens there. So one could argue that this dated back then because I often get criticism saying that computer science and health, why are you doing that? Well, think about it. Some of our, uh, the fundamental work actually came back, came start, started in the, the predated computer science. So one of the things, if you think about healthcare, is there's all these ma major paradigm shifts that happen. You know, you can, you can look at drug uh, therapies, you can look at all kinds of things. Uh, but one interesting example is um, this thing here, which is an ultrasound machine. So point of care diagnostics is one particular major revolution that happened in the healthcare field. The idea that you can actually diagnose and screen somebody at the moment that the doctor sees a particular patient revolutionized care. You didn't have to wait for a lab result to come back. You didn't have to send out for another screen or, or go out and have somebody else do that particular diagnostic. That really changed the prognosis of a lot of these conditions where you can actually manage one's condition at the time you see them, that completely revolutionized healthcare. Um, these days, the, the ultrasound machines are much smaller. This is you know, uh, probably about 15 years old. But you can imagine what you could do with devices that can do diagnostics at the time that you're trying to see somebody. And then there's this oh, other, uh, another paradigm shift that's happening. This is actually a pulse oximeter. It's a device that connects to a mobile phone to basically give you pulse oximetry information. Um, the idea here is that you can leverage the networking capabilities on a phone um, and the computational power, and you can offload that on this existing device, but you only need this low-cost device connected to it. So this is a world that we're starting to head into. And on top of that, you have this whole wearable movement. You see these devices that are on your wrist and your heads and on your shirts. Um, these are actually every, these are devices that I've actually worn at some point. Everything from a smart watch to a smart hat to a smart shirt to get bio signals 24-7. This is a new area that we're looking at in computing where wearable devices can potentially offer the opportunity to capture longitudinal data about your body so you can start to make better decisions or maybe inform when a condition might be happening a, before, uh, before a condition gets serious. So th there's this whole paradigm shift shift in computing, the question is, well, how does this map to some of the advances in healthcare? Or how do we enable advances in healthcare? So one of the areas that's interesting is if you think about mobile health, so either phones or these wearable devices, it opens up this huge opportunity to figure out how can we use one of the most ubiquitous devices, mobile, the computing platform out there, which is a phone. You know, there's about 7.8 billion people in the world. There's actually 5 billion phones in the world, of four, three and a half to 4 billion of which are actually smartphones or emerging smartphones. So you can imagine the breadth of computing power that's out there, even technology that you can leverage to actually make a difference. Um, and so you can use these, because these things are so personal, if you think about a phone, like you, if you leave your home and you forget your phone, you'll probably go back and go get the thing. Right? You can't operate uh, in, in a lot of environments without that, without that capability. Uh, so it also gives you the possibility to do population health monitoring. So because you have this thing that's so ubiquitous, you can start to get a sense of how things are happening at a, at a population level. Um, I also contend that you can actually start to enable new diagnostics. 
Now, you know, diagnostics are typically this one-time thing where you see a physician or a doctor, you do this scan and you read it and you get this result. Um, it's very much a one-time thing. The, I, uh, you know, one of the things that's often ignored is the longitudinal data, the, the time series that you might get could be used for diagnosis. And then also improving treatment. If you get discharged with a medication, how do I know it's actually working? How do I know what to do if I don't know it's working? And then what are some of the signals I can use to know that uh, the thing actually has the efficacy that we think it has? So one of the things that I've been particularly interested in is that you know, mobile phones can actually play this critical role in many different ways. Um, in a way, I often think about the devices actually leapfrogging the healthcare industry um, in, in many parts of the world, just how mobile phones leapfrogged landlines. You know, a lot of parts of the world didn't go to landlines because the mobile phone industry had actually caught up and that was actually where things were scaling. So I think we can actually have the analogous type of argument for healthcare is can we introduce ways to enable personal health monitoring so you completely leapfrog that, the healthcare systems of what um, we're used to in much more of the developed countries. So one of the thesis around this is continuous monitoring. You know, if you look at how often one interacts with a physician, it might be once a year, it might be once every three years. It might be the, only the time you get sick. But what about 99.99% of the other times where you might want to look at what's happening? So the problem is, is that clinical science has stagnated because we don't have access to continuous data. It just doesn't exist. And we have very little information about that. And the problem is, how do you capture it? You're not going to be wearing all those wearable sensors that I showed you with the shirts and the wearables everywhere. So we have to start somewhere. And the work that I looked, have been looking at is how do we leverage the mobile phone as a starting point to get access to at least some of these biosignal uh, signals, physiological signals, in such a way that we can start to do prediction so that we can get ahead of disease and start to do diagnostics much more effectively. So, um, so you know, the phones have already been used in the healthcare space. You can, um, in, in, in many parts of the world, you can actually do a video conference with your doctor if you can't get there. Um, there are a lot of apps that can help track what you're doing. So if you have diabetes, you can track your, your um, glucose levels by typing it in. You might have a journaling application where you look at what you're eating for, for, um, uh, for nutrition. But one of the things that the phone doesn't do, it doesn't tell you anything about yourself. It's all manual input. But at the same time, the phone is still a useful tool because it can still be a, a, a ubiquitous device that can you use to capture this information. And so what I've been looking at for the last uh, a decade or so has been looking at how do we leverage the sensors on phones for doing physiological monitoring. If you look at the phone, you often take for granted what's on there. You know, typically we're doing these selfies or we're taking pictures, you know, we're doing uh, reading, remote um, uh, conferencing with, with the phone, you're talking into it, you've got accelerometers to tilt the phone, you can play games with it. But the, the richness of these sensors are so profound that you often take for granted what they can actually do. Because if you think about the biometric sensor on the phone, the, the capacitive touch sensor, you know, that's designed for a security reason so they can authenticate into the phone. But because the price points have been driven down because of the scale of the phone market, you can actually start to repurpose these advanced sensors in ways that people never thought before. The camera on a phone is so advanced these days that it's designed to take that perfect picture, that perfect selfie, but it turns out that the side effect of that is that you actually have the ability to use the capability that's built into that sensor for something that was never even designed for what it was done, uh, used for. And, and in fact, because of these uh, ulterior, uh, alternative use cases, you can start to drive other use cases like healthcare. So one, of the, so one of the things that we've been looking at is how do we use these existing sensors without modification? So you take the camera that's on a phone, the microphone that's on a phone, even the accelerometer and gyro, and use those sensors for physiological monitoring. So instead of manually entering the information in there, how can I use the same thing that's either in front of you now or in your pocket or in a purse and use the device as this to basically monitor and manage your health, be it a chronic disease or an acute condition? And I won't be able to go into all of these, but this just gives you a sense of the kinds of things that we've done. So just using the sensors on the phone, we've actually been able to build tools in a variety of different areas. Everything from pulmonary screening to non-invasive blood screening, so you don't have to pull blood out of the body. You can actually use um, the phone in non-invasive ways, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Cardiovascular screening, and even disease-specific things like sleep apnea or osteoporosis. Right? And so what I'll do is I'll go through this journey with you in terms of how do you actually think about using the phones for these kinds of use cases. And really the crux of this is really rethinking how you look at physiological monitoring. And this is something that, uh, that really cuts across all the work that we do is, you know, the, the medical industry is a way to start. 
but you don't want to get stuck in terms of the dogma in terms of how things are done right now. Just because blood pressure monitoring is done at the, at the, in the arm doesn't mean that you need to build a phone that goes on your arm. That's just one way that they've done it. There are many different signals out there that you can get at the same information, and the question is how do you take this creative approach to get there? So one of the first projects we did was um, measuring lung function. So if you think about poor air quality in certain regions of the world, if you think about asthma, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or cystic fibrosis, these are all ailments that actually causes issues in the lung. So in the United States, the number one um, cause of mortality is actually um, cardiovascular disease or heart attack and cancers. In other parts of the world, like China or India, um, one in two is actually not cardiovascular disease, it's actually pulmonary diseases. So in parts of the Asia, pulmonary diseases are actually one of the biggest reasons for mortality in, in the country. And so one of the ways that you mo monitor and measure your lung function so that you know if it's healthy or if you're not is something called spirometry. Think of it as like an EKG or the echocardiogram version of your lungs. So on the left is a, 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 a clinical device. It's a big refrigerator looking device. You put it in your mouth and you blow as hard as possible. And you try to push out as much air as you can. And you try to look at that waveform, basically the amount of flow over time that's coming out to get an assessment of how your lungs are doing. The one in the middle is a, more, is a digital version of it. Uh, the, the one in the middle is probably a 10,000 US dollar device. The one on the right is a home device you can buy, which might be about 100 US dollars. But the problem is, is that these things are done in clinic. Typically, if you look at pulmonary diseases, these things manifest themselves in many different ways that you might not actually be in clinic or might not even have the ability to get to clinic to be able to do your assessment. And so one of the things that we did uh, was we wanted to see what does this device do. So what a, a spirometer does is basically it shows you how much volume of air comes out over a certain amount of uh, time. Um, and so, for example, if you look at this plot, um, a normal flow kind of looks like this little um, mountain uh, peak. Um, if you're obstructed, you get this scooping effect, and if you can't get to the peak, you're restrictive. So basically that signal tells you if you have some kind of a pulmonary ailment. Um, and the idea was that could we use a mobile phone to do this without any um, external devices. And so we built this tool that actually uses the microphone as a spirometer. So essentially trying to create, replicate what you would actually do with a clinical spirometer using a, a phone app itself. And the way this works is that you take the phone, um, you hold it in front of you, and then you blow as hard as you can at the face of the phone. Um, and you actually don't need a, um, a mouthpiece. Uh, what it does is you, you just look at the face. There's a visualization that forces you to keep pushing out as much air as possible, and then it actually gives you a result. Um, and it's actually very similar to what you would get from a clinical uh, spirometer, which I'll talk about in a second. But the idea is that you use the microphone, which is technically an uncalibrated pressure sensor, to basically do the same assessment. Typically, we use it for a speech, but the pressure sensor or microphone is actually the same thing you might find in a regular spirometer. The question is, how do we calibrate this and how do we actually infer the actual flow volume curves from that sensor? So the way this works is that um, traditional spirometers have a turbine in it, so it's got a little wheel in it, and so as you blow in it, it spins faster and faster as you blow harder. Um, more advanced uh, clinical spirometers have a pneumatac, so it has a, a wire in it, and as you blow air across it, you, as you cool it down, it infers the amount of air that's going past it. But in our case, we don't have that. We don't have a pneumatac. Uh, we just have a microphone that's air coupled to the, basically the mobile phone. So what we did was we actually um, looked at this space and we said, hey, we don't have a sensor. We, uh, sorry, we don't have a flow sensor. We have an uncalibrated pressure sensor, so we need to get flow out of there. And so what happened here was we actually dug deep into kind of the, 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 the mo we modeled kind of the lung function of what happens when you actually blow out and what happens there. And it turned out the vocal tract resonances, this is work that was done in the uh, speech recognition community for many years, where for years what they try to do is cancel out the, the vocal tract resonances. So when you have you know, a, a speech recognition algorithm, the resonances, the kind of the, 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 the choppy sounds that come out from the vocal tract were actually causing problems with speech recognition algorithms. And so they spent years trying to remove that particular noise. It turned out that that noise, that vocal tract sound, is actually directly related to the flow coming out of your, um, out of your vocal tract. So when you blow out of there, that noise signal that's been trying to, that, that the speech recognition community tried to cancel for many years was actually proportional to the airflow coming out of it. And that was the initial insight that we had where, hey, the body itself is the best sensor. When you blow out and you have an obstruction, obviously the sound's gonna be different. So just think about a pipe, and if you obstruct the pipe and then you have the same amount of flow coming through it, or you have reduced flow, the obstruction is gonna change the output of that signal. 
And that's what we did. So we actually modeled the entire vocal track. So we went back old school. We went to, back to Flanagan's theory on um, vocal track modeling, where we basically said, look, you can actually create a, a, a capacitive resistive model to basically uh, uh, infer how mu what the sound looks like. So from the sound, we can reverse engineer how much restriction there was. So basically, from the output, we can reverse engineer what the restriction of, of the flow was. And so we use this to basically create a forward model or a physics model to basically infer the lung function. So one of the things, we, so the other thing we did was, so we, not only did we build a smartphone app that did this, what we realized was at the time, most of the world actually didn't have smartphones. So this was about six years ago. And one of the things that we did was instead of building a phone app, we basically said, how do we make this work on any ordinary phone? So the thing on the right is a, a feature phone where it's not necessarily a smartphone, but it has at least text messaging capabilities. Um, so we built a centralized capability where you could actually dial a toll-free number from anywhere in the world, and you can do the maneuver from the cell phone without ha having to be a smartphone. Um, and one of the things that we did was we actually enabled this after we had published the paper, and in a 24-hour period, we had about a quarter of a million people dialing in to measure the lung function. And we had a ton of inbound uh, uh, diagnostics that were coming in from parts of India and Bangladesh. And so what happened was we actually collaborated with a number of those groups. So on the right are clinics, some clinics in India and even in, in Bangladesh that actually does their entire pulmonary screening, the pre-screening, using a phone. So in the past, if you had a pulmonary clinic, which was in, in, a, in a remote village, you could probably handle maybe 10, 15 cases a day, but now they can handle about 1,000 to 1,500 cases a day. Because now every ASHA and community health worker has a phone, and they can in parallel triage all of them, and then only the 10 or 20 or maybe 100 emergent cases actually sees the pulmonologist on the right. Because most of them, they can actually either give them uh, albuterol or other things before they actually go down to that path. So you can just imagine. So a phone has a microphone, and you can actually either calling a number or in an app diagnose or screen for pulmonary ailments. That's literally 5 billion screening tools in the world right now that can actually assess lung function. All right? That's the kind of scale of, um, of, of impact you can have when you marry machine learning and inference and computer science with a ubiquitous device like a mobile phone. So we did a clinical study on this. So we actually did an evaluation of 10,000 patients where we took an expensive $10,000, US $10,000 clinical spirometer and a phone app. And we basically said, well, how well does it work? Um, so to give you a bit of context, so the, the blue uh, is basically local recording. That means if you had the best audio possible on a mobile phone. And then the green is basically if you did a voice call. So if I basically you know, called a 1-800 number or a toll-free number, um, and what, what kind of accuracy would you get? So these are PEF, FEV1, FEC, those are all the metrics that pulmonologists care about. Um, and, and what to look at is what the error was compared to a clinical device. You know, clinical gold standard device that's regulated by, the, by ISO or CE, CE marked or FDA cleared and how well that worked. To give you context, um, the FDA in the United States recommends that these devices have an error of about 7 to 10%. So all of these features are actually below 10%. The reason why 10% error exists is because of not the device error, it's because of reproducibility. So if I blow into the phone or into a spirometer, it's going to be different every time you do it. So you average three readings. So we were already as good as a clinical spirometer that's regulated by the Food and Drug Administration in the US or by CE in Europe and Asia. Right? So this, and this is a phone app. So we went to the regulators. We basically said, hey, all right, now we have a device. We have a clinical study that we did of 10,000 patients where we proved that this is as good as that. We go to the regulators, and they, we show them the phone app. They're like, it's a phone. How, how do you do this? They're like, sir, let me see the device. No, there's no device. It's actually a software tool that does this. So this was actually one of the first tools that we built, which was um, FDA cleared in the United States as a software as a medical device, where the software is regulated, but not the device itself. And I'll talk more about that in, in, in a little bit. So we took this work a little bit further. We said, hey, now we've built a tool to assess lung function. The other thing we wanted to do was actually study a bunch of other pulmonary uh, conditions. One was in particular studying cough. And I talked to my colleagues, and they're like, why do you care about cough? Cough is boring. Um, and th this is coming from a, a clinician. You know, what, the hypothesis for, I had was, hey, cough is a common symptom. You know, that's something you hear often, um, but it, it's not quantifiable. Like, I can't say how many times I've coughed and what kind of cough it is, but it's an indicator that something's going on in the body, and it manifests itself externally. So you can actually have technology that can look at that and see what's going on. Um, and my hypothesis was that the cough can actually be more indicative of a disease than anything else. 
or, or sorry, it can be indicative of a disease than what most people think. When you talk to a pulmonologist or a clinician, you tell them, hey, I'm going to build algorithms around analyzing a cough. Their first response is, that's like the worst idea ever, because I can't hear what happens with a cough. If you cough in front of a clinician, they're like, okay, that's a cough. They might know it's a wet cough versus a dry cough. They might know it's a wheezing, but that's about it. Can they diagnose that it's tuberculosis from that cough? They're like, no, there's no way I can do that. But if I took that approach, then I would never have gone down this path. The reason for this is that the human ears are designed to tune out certain things. So you can probably hear the buzzing lights that are happening or the HVAC that's going on. You don't quite uh, hear that because you're kind of tuning that out. It's in the background. If somebody's coughing, you can't do a full spectral analysis in real time in your head to know what frequency bins are being activated. But a machine learning algorithm or a computer algorithm can actually do that. And so that's the, that's the difference. You know, a human is not going to be able to say that cough has tuberculosis, that's a TB cough or not. But this is an opportunity where machine learning and even deep learning could actually play a role. And so this is something we've been investigating for a while. So one of the first projects we did was, hey, we got to know how to do cough analysis very well. So if you think, if you look at what a spectrogram of cough looks like, so x-axis is time, uh, the y-axis is the frequency, and the color is the intensity. Um, so a cough is on the left, which is only about 300 milliseconds. When you cough, it's a very short period, but it has, it's very easy to model. Just like how I showed how you can model the vocal tract, you can actually model an enti entire uh, pulmonary function, or sorry, the entire lung system. So you have this you know, explosive maneuver that happens at the in big beginning. So you take a deep breath in, you have this big loud sound, and then you have this tapering effect that's happening when all the air is coming out of the lungs. And so we basically created both a physics model of what a cough looks like, and then created an, uh, a machine learning algorithm that essentially identifies coughs in the presence of throat clearing speech, backfiring cars, or doors banging and opening and closing. And so that was our first, uh, just first attempt, which was just ca classify coughs. The reason for this is cough frequency is actually a fairly interesting indicator. So if you could count how often you're coughing at night, which actually some people, most people can't say that, like you know, you're sleeping or, or, or your or, or sleep partner might not actually know how many times you're coughing. But evening coughs is actually one of the best indicators for pulmonary exacerbations, which is basically mean you're going to have something relating to the uh, pulmonary system. So if you have asthma or COPD, and over a course of a week period, if you see your cough frequency is going up, at some point during that week, you're going to actually have a major event. But now we can actually see that trend changing, because this is a subconscious thing that you often don't think about, but now we can quantify just with that algorithm. So we actually partnered with the Gates Foundation to actually dive deeper into this. We actually wanted to start to uh, um, investigate infectious diseases, um, particularly the spread of TB. So even to this day, we don't actually know how TB is spread. We, we know it's spread through either coughs or sneeze or other ways that it aerosolizes out of the body, but we don't quite know, is there a single super spreader or is it a lot of different people that are infected that are infecting people? We actually don't know uh, to this day. So one of the things we wanted to do was, because we know cough is the main source of aerosolization, so when you cough, that is where you're most infective. Um, looking at how do we use the cough information to be able to identify how TB is spread. And on top of that, could we use cough to use it as a way to see if we can diagnose and screen for tuberculosis? So to do this, we actually had to do this pretty um, radical study where on the left, we built this box. This is uh, kind of like a telephone box. It's a big box that has a bunch of sensors in it. It has an impactor in it so that it, a, a, it captures all the air particles. It actually does an analysis on the air particles. So basically, if somebody with TB goes into that room, we close the door, and as they're coughing naturally, we actually capture every TB particle, and we confirm that it, actually they, they do have tuberculosis. So we have a chest x-ray, a blood test, and we actually capture that. And inside that room is a microphone. So we have the ground truth, and we actually have the microphone data of them coughing to basically correlate that information. We actually had people that were healthy that went in. We had people um, that were uh, early diagnosis of pneumonia. So we actually had all the other um, you know, uh, uh, cases also covered, where it was healthy coughers, but also people that had other kinds of pulmonary ailments. And the hypothesis was that if you look on the right, um, uh, if you have a healthy lung, and then if you have a lung where somebody's infected with TB, you have these things called granulomas that form. So when you get, uh, when you get diagnosed with TB, you basically have your white blood cells that are engulfing these infectious areas. And what happens is these holes form, which are called granulomas. And so intuitively, if you have these holes in your lungs, and as you're breathing out or coughing, the sound has to change. It inherently changes. If you think about a, a musical instrument where you basically have a certain amount of air going out of it, and you have um, obstructions, or if you have bubbles, or if you had uh, other perturbations that you put on the instrument and you push out the air, it's going to sound different. 
And so that's basically the idea that we're working on here is that the sound has to inherently be different because the entire pulmonary system is now changed from a healthy individual. So what we did was we actually um, built a cough identification algorithm where we have a corpus of about a, uh, about a half a million cough samples that are correlated to a particular disease outcome. And so one of the first things that we did was we basically um, built this CNN that essentially identified coughs with as high a level of accuracy as you can. So with 90% accuracy, we get very low false positive rates. And so what we've done with this, actual, this tool is we actually deploy this in, in parts of South Africa and India where people that are treated with tuberculosis so if they're diagnosed with tuberculosis, they get a nine-month um, the therapy regimen. So it's a chemotherapy regimen. It's nine months. You have to take the pills. The problem is that after about four or five months, if it's not working, how do you know when to go back and actually see you, can, you, you need to change your regimen? The problem is a lot of the drugs that we have right now are resistant to some of the TB uh, infections that are out there. So what we did was we had this little tiny phone app that basically runs at night, and so we can actually see if that treatment is working or not. So within a month or two, if the treatment's not working, they can go back to the clinic and get another therapy, rather than waiting nine months, all right? The other thing we did, which I, I can't show the results right now because we're still in the midst of, of doing the final analysis, is actually the analysis that I just I mentioned earlier, is can a cough predict tuberculosis? And some of our early results show that you can. So with about 80% sensitivity and specificity, you can actually, from the cough, say that's a TB cough versus a healthy cough versus a pneumonia cough. Even if you got pneumonia and TB wrong, wrong from each other, it's still fine. It's pneumonia. It's not TB. If it's TB, it's pneumonia. You at least caught something. So if you clustered pneumonia and TB together from a healthy cough, you have AUCs of 95 with sensitivity of 95, 90, uh, 95% and a specificity of 95%. So just put that in context. Um, a, a, a device called a gene expert, where you cough up sputum and you put it on a device and you put it in a machine, only has an accuracy and sensitivity of about 75%. The reason for that is to cough up phlegm and sputum is really tough, because you've got to get low into the lungs to be able to cough up enough sputum to do that. Here, we're actually getting better accuracy because we're listening to the manifestation of the TB externally. Um, and so you can actually do a better job of screening. And blood draws don't work in, the, in India because everybody's TB positive because at some point you've been exposed. So now you, TB, so you, blood draws don't work. Sputum tests are inaccurate. This is probably the only way you can pre-screen for tuberculosis. And on top of that, so a lot, there are a lot of cases where people are infected with TB and co-infected with HIV. So if you're HIV positive, the granulomas don't show up on a le, uh, lung x-ray at all. So in fact, a lot of people get misdiagnosed that they don't have tuberculosis because an x-ray doesn't show the spots because they don't have enough white blood cells that can be produced. And the only way to actually screen them is acoustically. All right? So this is what we've been working with the Gates Foundation for the last few years to basically scale some of this work uh, all across the world. So we're, we have tools that are uh, screening tools that uh, community health workers use, and we also have assessment tools that we've built uh, post-discharge after you have a, a therapy. So that's in the audio space. That's what you can do with a microphone. And that's just scratching the surface. Um, and so we've done a lot more other things in the microphone domain. But let me switch over to the camera domain. So the other area that we've been really interested in is if you look at the modern smartphone, um, it has a really interesting uh, camera subsystem where you have a flash that's a broad white color. It's because you want to take that best picture when you take a picture of, a, of, of, of something. And you have a pretty good camera. So it turns out if you, use, if you know the properties of the light properties of the, cam, uh, the, the, the flash, you can actually start to model what kind of light is being absorbed and reflected on depending on what you're actually pointing it at. So one of the first things we did was we actually built an app called uh, BillyCam, which basically assesses newborn jaundice. So jaundice is basically what happens is you, you get this yellowing of the skin as a result of, of uh, a bilirubin that's not being broken down by the liver. So when a baby is born, their organs are being developed. And sometimes the organs don't quite develop fast enough. And the dead red blood cells that get garbage collected by the liver um, don't quite develop. And so they're not gar being garbage collected as fast enough. And so it builds up in the body. And it's actually devastating. So what that leads to is connectoris or brain damage. Um, uh, so some of the highest rates of mortality in India and other parts of the world is bilirubin, high levels of bilirubin, because we don't screen for bilirubin in many parts of the world except for maybe Europe and, 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 um, and the US. And so this is, and the problem is that you've got to do a blood draw. And so we wanted to build a screening tool that community health workers and midwives could actually screen a time a baby was born to at least get an initial assessment of what might be happening. 
So the way that bilirubin is now uh, screened is that you use a blood draw. You pull blood out of the body, you send it to a lab, and then you get a result. Um, Philips actually made a, a non-invasive device. They actually made a device to hold it up to uh, the skin, and it basically, at the subcutaneous level, uh, tries to identify bilirubin using some of the uh, uh, optical properties of what bilirubin responds to. And that's something that we actually started to build on top of. So there actually is a non-invasive device, but obviously you have to have access to the device, and it's a fairly costly device. So bilirubin, um, uh, it's really important about um, one, uh, one day of life. So, so uh, when, in, in many parts of the country, if you have, if, in many parts of the world where you might not have a baby born in a hospital, you don't know actually when to screen them. Even if a baby is born in a hospital, the bilirubin doesn't peak until day three or four or five. The baby's already discharged and they're already at home. And, and often a, a pediatrician asks the parents, hey, can you just let us know if the baby looks yellow and so that we need to screen for them? Yellow? I mean, first of all, I'm, we, I just had a baby. And now you want me to know that if the baby looks yellow, like how yellow, little yellow, they always look yellow. And so you can't actually use visual assessment. And that's the gold standard right now, is you look at a baby and say, does the baby look more yellow six hours ago? Maybe, it's hard to tell. And so what, what we did was, we looked at, the optical, pro looked at the, uh, the optical properties of bilirubin itself. And it turns out bilirubin absorbs blue light. All right? And so you see this peak that happens at about five, uh, 475 to 500 um, nanometers. And it turns out that the white light in a phone is actually broadband. And so if we knew what the output properties of a phone were, we can actually figure out how much bilirubin is being absorbed in the body. And so the way it works is you actually point, point the phone at the sternum of a baby where it's the cleanest part, and you flash the light. And the moment that the light is flashed, you take a picture of it. And what you can do is see how much blue light is absorbed, how much red light is absorbed and reflected, and you just take the ratio. Uh, and so we did a clinical study where we basically took 530 babies that were born that we, that at the time of birth. We took their blood draw, and we took a, uh, a picture with our tool where we had created this, uh, this model of basically assessing bilirubin from the phone app. And you can see the correlation here where basically if you look at um, the, the, the Billycam device itself versus the, um, uh, the, the blood draw, it's, it's 0.91 correlation. If you look at the Bland-Altman plot, you're still within the limits of agreement for this thing to be a screening tool. Um, the TCB is that expensive Philips device. So this is just as good as that non-invasive device. Um, so this is another th tool that we've built that is already going through the FDA clearance process as well. So this is also one of the first software as a medical device tools that was that uh, it's going through the FDA device that uses the phone camera as a screening tool. So one thing that we did as a follow up to this was after we built Billycam, we had a lot of inbound interest from clinicians that said, "Hey, you know, one of the things we often notice for uh, patients with pancreatic cancer is that uh, their eyes, the, the white part of their eye, the sclera, tends to get a little bit yellow or a little bit jaundice." Um, so Billy, uh, sorry, uh, pancreatic cancer is an um, it's often labeled as the silent killer, where you know the five five year survival rate is very low, six percent. The reason for that is for people that are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, they're symptomatic way late. So what that means is by the time they're symptomatic, the de the, de the uh, disease has already progressed so much that you can't do anything about it. So there's been a lot of research to figure out how do we get ahead of this? So how do we pre-symptomatically see if somebody is actual, has pancreatic cancer? Because if you can identify that early, you can do things like a Whipple procedure or other things that can actually increase their prognosis. Um, and so what, this, this has been a big effort around the world to try to figure out how do we pre-screen for this? So one of the things that we did was, um, based on this hypothesis, we said, OK, can we just use the Billycam application, that concept, and use it on the sclera of the eye? So we built these set of tools where we basically 3D printed a box. You put a phone in it just to um, block out the light just so we can get clean data. Uh, we did it with calibration glasses and all kinds of things. But the idea was from a selfie, if you had a flash in front of the camera, could you identify how much bilirubin is actually building up in that a person's body, and, um, and can we use that for diagnostics? And the idea here is that in adults, um, people's bilirubin um, doesn't manifest themselves in a coloring, color change of their body, because adult bodies are, uh, the, the percentage of change in bilirubin is a lot smaller than a smaller baby. So you, uh, people don't look yellow when they have high bilirubin, but what you see is in the white parts of their eye, slight amounts of color change. So we actually did a study where we took people that were diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, where they had elevated bilirubins, took their blood draw, took the selfie picture, and tried to figure out if we could have inferred their bilirubin in their body. And so one of the studies that we're actually doing 
is in collaboration with uh, the Google Photos team, is actually looking at for people that have consented their home photos um, that have actually been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So you might have a family where they might have lost someone through pancreatic cancer. They, they donated all the photos to us. And it turns out about six months to a year in, in it, before they were uh, symptomatic, we could actually see the increase in jaundice in their eye just from the family photos. So, so if you think about it, six months to a year in advance, if you could diagnose this a year in advance before they're symptomatic, the prognosis is completely different. So this tells you what you can actually do with longitudinal data. If you have access to information like this and you're able to do screening kind of in, a, in, in, in real time behind the scenes, you can start to intervene and start to do something well before somebody is sim uh, uh, symptomatic. We actually built this other tool that we started to look at. Where can, what are the things can we do? What are the non-invasive blood constituent analysis could we do? So we built a tool called a HemoApp that was a hemoglobin tool. Uh, so the way this one works is you put your finger over the camera and flash, and, uh, and it tells you how much hemoglobin's in the blood. Um, and, and the way it works is that the light comes on, we have a model of the light properties coming out of the phone, and we basically look at a couple of different frequencies of the light that are being absorbed, and instead of bilirubin, which is two different frequencies, we actually found hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is a, just shifted over from the spectral properties of bilirubin. Uh, hemoglobin is basically tells you how anemic somebody is, you know, how much red blood cells are you producing. So this is relevant for people with sickle cell anemia, malnutrition, pregnant women that might be suffering from, from uh, anemia. And so the way this works is basically the same property, but we actually look at different frequencies of light. In this case, we look at it at the finger, because you've got a lot of perfusion at the fingertip. And you put it at the place of the finger, we basically look at two colors of light and then do a ratio just like we did with, Billy, with the Billy Rubin. So one of the things that's um, interesting here is that uh, you could do this anytime with your own phone. Do a video recording of your finger and you'll see the slow throbbing. That's actually your heart rate. So as the cardiac activity is happening in the body, as the heart is pumping, the v v volume of blood gets to your fingertip, and every time the heart pumps, you see that volume increasing each time, and that's actually your heart rate. This is my intro to computing class assignment, is I tell my students, you're going to build a heart rate monitor with your phone. They get scared, but it ends up being 10 lines of code. All it is is you look at the peak color, and you look at how often is it flashing, and that's your heart rate. So you can write that with 10 lines of Python code if you want. Um, and so one of the things we wanted to do was this had to be skin tone agnostic. We can't just be looking at the skin color because a lot of times the pigments actually causes problems there. And so what we do is we actually just sense when there's a heartbeat. So when the heart beats, the only thing that should be changing is the volume of uh, blood because of the heart beating, not because the finger's gonna instantly change color. And so that's how we can actually uh, isolate the skin tone and skin color from the blood actually contributing to the color changes and not the, uh, not the, not the pigment of the skin. Um, so basically, we sense when the resting and when the heart beats, and that, that's how we can do that. So it's very much skin tone, skin color agnostic. So again, we did a clinical study. Um, there's a device called the Mossimo Pronto device. So they made this non-invasive hemoglobin device, and so the tool works as good as this device. So this is, the accuracy of this isn't as great as the other tools that we've built, but 80% accuracy is actually really good for a screening tool. So, so knowing that somebody has low hemoglobin, now you can actually have a fairly confident, be fairly confident, do I need to send them to get more lab work done or not? So it's still a useful pre-screening tool, but we're still trying to get there where we can actually be a primary screening tool. So what we did with this is uh, we actually worked with the Ministry of Health in Peru. So the country of Peru reached out to us and said, hey, look, we have a big pandemic where 70% of the kids in Peru are anemic. 70% of their kids are anemic. And, and that's, the reason, that's because of poor, poor nutrition, there's, uh, because of certain diseases in the region. But what they needed to do was they needed to screen every kid to see what their hemoglobin levels were so that they knew to, where to actually put all the more expensive resources. Because sending these blood draw trucks out into the jungles of Peru was very difficult. They couldn't get to all the kids. And so what we did was we built this tool that basically was pushed out through the community health workers. And in a matter of a three to four um, week period, we could pretty much reach most kids and screen all the kids within a month period. All right? Just, there's no way you could actually do that with an existing device or even with a conventional truck roll that you might do with a, uh, with a, with a lab um, um, in a car. And so this was a way to basically figure out and triage where they needed to send the resources and actually send the kids to um, uh, another location to be able to get further screening. But this was a way that we could quickly diagnose and screen for uh, at least hemoglobin and anemia in, in Peru. So another tool that we've looked at, I won't go into a lot of detail here, but I just want to just tell you that there's other things you can do with phones, is using the accelerometer gyro in a unique way. So one thing that we've been doing is trying to see how can we infer bone density. 
So basically the hollowing of the bones without having to do an x-ray. So the way that you diagnose for uh, osteoporosis right now is you take an x-ray of the bone and you look at the density of that image to see, oh, there is hollowing or basically you have a reduction in density and you're actually susceptible for, for your bones to break or you have osteoporosis. The problem is that, you know, first you've got to get an x-ray or if you want to longitudinally track this, so people that are at risk of osteoporosis, you're not going to do an x-ray every six months, you're barely going to do it every year. So could you create a screening tool to tell you, oh, now we need to go get the x-ray? And, and it turned out that there was a paper in the 70s that my students and I found where there was a physician that created a, um, a, um, a, a, a tuning fork where you took the tuning fork and you would hit it on your elbow. And if it made a sound, that meant that your, your, um, your bones were dense. That means there was no issues. But if it didn't make a sound, it was actually suspicious of osteoporosis. And the idea behind that was that if you took a solid um, surface and you actually hollowed it out, it's going to resonate differently. So they had a, the person actually built a mechanical bone density checker. Um, at the time, they didn't have phones or accelerometers that could sample at 1,000 hertz, but now we do. Right? In most of the phones that are out there, the gyro and accelerometer can be programmed to sample at a kilohertz. So you can actually do this very fine-grained analysis at high frequencies. And so that's what we did. We basically replicated the tuning fork experiment using a phone. So you take the phone, you grab it, and you, you tap the elbow. And then based on the resonances that get to the phone as it's vibrating, you can get, basically classify if it's dense or not. And that's all you really need to do is do you see a change in the density? So if the density values are declining, then you can actually alert somebody that they should do a screening tool or actually go and get a, uh, an x-ray for, for being uh, screened. So you can kind of see on, the, on, the, on, the, uh, on this example here, if you have a healthy bone, um, you see all these sub 400 hertz resonances happening because you've got the solid structure. It's basically going all the way through. But if you, have if you take an osteoporotic bone where you have these holes in it, what happens is these high frequency resonances come up because you're able to couple a lot more of the high frequency sound from that broad impulse response when you tap your elbow. And so that's what's indicative that there is an osteoporotic bone there. So this is just an example to, to demonstrate that you can go well beyond some of just the other sensors that you typically take for granted. So there's a lot of considerations for this work. You know, one is the regulatory space. It, I had to fight tooth and nail to be able to get the regulatory industry or the regulatory uh, uh, regulators to think about how do I clear one of these things. So in the mental model of a, a medical device is that, oh, you have a device, you lock it down, and then you test it, and if you ever change it, you retest it. The problem is you can't lock down a phone. A phone is a very personal thing. What we're trying to do is leverage something so ubiquitous that people are going to already have with them that we're going to build a tool on top of it. So there are a lot of regulatory challenges, but these these things are actually starting to move forward now because what we've been able to demonstrate with some of the work that we could do with just the software and not even modifying the hardware itself. Safety and trust. One of the biggest issues I ran into was that that's an app. Apps are uh, uh, attributed to being cheap, right? Oh, you have a free app, 99 cent app. How can this cheap app be as good as this $10,000 clinical device? And so there's this perception that an app can't be good because it's cheap. So there's this, these mental models that we have to break. The other one is the patient-provider interaction has completely changed. Now you're arming um, uh, users with this capability that might usually only reside in the clinic. So how do you change the dynamics between the patient and the provider in those cases? The other thing that this work is doing is, hey, it's on a phone. It's not perfect, but it's actually informing new medical devices. Now you can, and some of the things that are happening based on the work that we've done is they're actually building lower cost devices because they use different sensing techniques now. You don't have to build a $10,000 clinical spirometer anymore because the sensor, it can be very different now because we uncovered some of these things that never would have been uncovered before because we asked the question in a different way. Um, and then there's all the other things we got to think about. This is just one area that we're focusing on, which is screening and diagnosis of disease. But there's other things that we have to think about too: social determinants of healthcare, food insecurity. You know, obviously there are broader issues in healthcare that we have to deal with. But this is just one area where, if we can have at least a little bit of data and information, we can start to make inroads there. But I just want to make sure that everybody realizes this is just a tiny part of the healthcare problem. There's many other areas that we have to think about beyond screening and diagnostics. So the last thing I want to just talk about is just reflecting for, for the students. Um, you know, so the work that I do is very applied. It was very interesting. When I started at the University of Washington, one of the, uh, one of the interesting areas of feedback that I often got or even criticized for is like, oh, he's too applied. He's not a real scholar. He's not a real scientist. And for me, what mattered was I'm solving real problems that are actually having actual immediate impact in, on society. And so for me, it was really around, hey, the breakthroughs in computer science will come because I'm asking questions in a different way that the research contributions 
in terms of computing will come out of that. You know, I talked about the voice, uh, the, the voice recognition work where we use the noise to cancel out, uh, or the noise is being canceled out that, that people often did, where we use that noise signal for, for pulmonary assessment. Those papers actually ended up getting cited by the speech recognition community later on. So it's just odd to see a speech recognition paper citing a medical paper, but that's what happened, because we stumbled across something that they borrowed again to make their algorithms better. So the scientific contributions in computing come out of it. You don't have to force yourself or pigeonhole yourself to say, oh, I gotta make sure I have my computer science contribution. The world has many problems. The problem shouldn't be that, oh, you have a perfect computer science contribution. Your, 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 your drive should be around solving a problem that you're passionate on solving, and the other things will fall into place. Um, and the other uh, thing that I really want to make sure that everybody works on are problems that come from the heart. Just, you, you don't want to do or work on a project that's just because your research community says that this is the project or problems that are being defined. Yes, you can get inspiration from there. You don't need to force yourself to be pigeonholed as a theoretician or as a database researcher or a systems researcher. There's many different ways to cut across those disciplines, and you want to basically drive yourself in terms of what's personally motivating and passionate for yourself. Um, and the final thing is that all of you are at an incredible time in society. Unfortunately, we have a lot of challenges with climate and global health, health disparities, but you also are, are, are in your careers at an incredible time where computing technology is just unprecedented. The tools that you know, Jan LeCun and colleagues have built, the, the mobile phone, the sensors that are out there, I mean, this is an unprecedented time to actually take action and solve some of these major global problems, and you all are the ones that are going to be able to do that. So I just want to make sure that you, know, you realize that you're in an unprecedented time, and I think you all are going to actually define what happens in the next few decades. So with that, I thank all my grad students and my, uh, all the students that have graduated from the group, and thank you for your attention. So we'll take a few questions. So a lot of your uh, apps that you develop, so because there's so much variation in the sensors from phone to phone, and when you want to deploy through cloud, you now how do you account for it? Because they could create a very different, so they are all self-calibrated, or how do you work on Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, um, phones to phone, there's a lot of variation. Um, so one of the things that we often do is, uh, you probably notice in the Billy Cam app, there was a calibration card. So, t so one of the things that we've done is we've done one-time calibration sequence. So if you have a model of a phone or if a community health worker has a tool um, that they want to deploy on their phone, when they download the tool, they do a one-time calibration to make sure that they calibrate that phone. Um, some of the things I didn't talk about with some of the audio work is you can actually pay the, play the uh, audio out of the speaker and listen to it through the microphone, so you can do a lot of self-calibration. Um, so a lot of the stuff we've done, we've tried to do the calibration techniques that are one time or self-calibration. But there are things like the accelerometer. It's hard to calibrate uh, unless you have some kind of a gold standard. Uh, but you're right, that's one of the challenges. Um, and so I think this is one of the ideas around, if we think about mobile health as a, uh, a platform for healthcare, uh, there might be some standards we can start to design around. Um, but in general, a lot of the sensors, there's only a handful of sensor manufacturers, so there's not a lot of variability there. The bigger issue is not the sensor, it's actually the, the operating system, where um, you know, iOS and Android will actually federate the sensors in different ways, the sampling rates are different, um, they might cut off, they might put bandpass filters in it that we don't know about. So those are usually the big Bigger challenges is the operating system actually limit things in, in ways that we don't often predict. So that's a great question. Um, so I was just wondering two things. One, uh, of course, first of all, absolutely uh, amazing works. Thank you for what whatever you're doing. Uh, we've seen a lot of people trying to do this, uh, you know, on a piece of paper, figure out the blood, this, that, whatever. Yeah. Things haven't worked very well, but you know, this seems to be. Uh, one of the comments that you made early on was uh, more about, I mean, and this is more of my concern. I have also read these stories of a uh, lot of diagnostics do not actually do very well. Like for instance, yearly uh, scans have actually proven to be doing worse than you know, not doing those scans. There were, there were these uh, research. So um, if I'm just sort of thinking out aloud, uh, if I have something on my phone which keeps on telling me every day, look, you know, uh, does it necessarily mean uh, a better health outcome one? And, and the second thing I would worry about, um, 
you know, all this stuff sitting on the phone, which means, uh, you know, whatever you want to call them, privacy. Because Google, you know, if now Google has all my, uh, you know, health data in some sense or the other. So do you face, uh, you know, issues there also? So two, two of those. Yep. No, that's a great question. Um, so one of the things that you can think about is that, you know, the, the goal is not to necessarily have these screening tools that are running constantly on the phone, because you can actually start to do, um, you can stratify an individual based on kind of what their predisposition is for a particular condition. If they're at risk for cardiovascular disease or pulmonary diseases, then you can start to kind of hone in with that particular individual. Um, so I think that's the, the, really the goal is that you don't have to have these things run. Like for pancreatic cancer, you actually have a family history or genomics test that can, can say, hey, you know, you're, pre you're predisposed to pancreatic cancer, so you may want to use this tool. So I think there's a lot of ways that you can actually enable certain populations to, be go, to go down that path. Now from a, from a private privacy standpoint, th this, that's a fair point. So a lot of the tools that we've built are actually all on device. So very little of this data actually goes off the phone. So most of the phone, so the audio data for the spirometry work, the pictures that you're taking, are all locally processed. So most of those networks are actually designed in such a way they can run on the phone. Um, and so the idea there is that you own and control the data, so you can delete that personal health information yourself. So it's actually not connected or mined in, in a way where it's connected with another piece of information. And that's something we designed from the get-go, where if you do a audio-based analysis, we don't want that data to ever go to the cloud. So what we do is we locally process that. Um, but that's a, that's a good point. We have this tension that we need to deal with where, you know, does the capabilities of diagnosing and screening a disease outweigh the privacy that one gives up, right? And that's a tension that we'll always be um, thinking about. And I think what we have to do is try to figure out what's the efficacy of that. Like, if, if you can save one's life, how much privacy do they give up for that? But for, for in the interim, what we've done, especially from the work that we're doing with Google, uh, all of it's on device. None of it goes to the cloud. In fact, it's not even linked up with your uh, Google account. It's all independent. Uh, hey, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, fabulous work. So, just a quick question. You said at the start of your talk that um, you were essentially leveraging the fact that these sensors are now very good and cheap because of the scale. Right. Um, and I'm wondering if, you know, that for, for large subgroups of, of the population, like, let's say, senior citizens or yep. new moms and babies, is there a case and have you, have you tried going to device manufacturers and saying, hey, you know, rather than just fortuitously repurposing these, you know, explicitly yep. putting in sensors. Yeah, um, so, I mean, so if you look at the, uh, the latest Pixel phone, it actually has radar built into it, for example. Um, so some of these uh, phone manufacturers are actually informing the design of their sensors in a way that actually can start to do some of this stuff. So, so the Pixel phone already has health capabilities. Uh, the next generation iPhone will as well. Um, and in fact, they're, and a lot of those two, the, the, the things that they're doing is they don't actually have to make a decision on the chip. It's actually what I talked about earlier is actually having the right hooks into the operating system and making assumptions that, um, that a, 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 an API developer might think that you, you might only be using it for one reason, but there's other things you can do with it. Uh, the prime example for this one was um, we actually, because the spirometry work was uh, early enough that there was actually uh, 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 Microsoft phones around. That was when Microsoft had their own phone. Um, it worked on all phones except the Microsoft phone. And the reason why it didn't work on their phone is there was an assumption made that you don't need to sample the microphone more than um, uh, 24 kilohertz because audio spoken words are at the low frequencies and ours requires us to sample it all the entire 48 kilohertz. So they made a assumption that, oh, only people are going to speak into it. They're not going to do anything else with it. So that's a prime example of those kinds of things. So, um, but yes, this is a way to kind of inform the design of those things. And it, like I said, it also goes the other way around where you can also take these capabilities and build dedicated devices that are lower cost and more effective too. We'll take one last question. I okay. Think. Fantastic work. Thank you for this excellent uh, work. Yesterday, you talked about impacting your childhood, you know, your childhood dream of impacting a million people, yep. and you ended up impacting 10 million. So what are your thoughts of impacting a billion people? <laughs> Uh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, one way to think about it is, uh, you know, I, I started out by saying there's, um, you know, three to four billion phones in the world. And so one of my goals is to basically, in a unified operating system like Android, if we can actually get health sensing features in Android, you already ha you have a billion people impacted right there. So that's one of the things I'm working on. Yeah. Thank you. It's, uh, it's truly amazing to see use of exact exi existing technology for significant effort. Thank you. And uh, as a token of our appreciation, we have a memento <laughs> of this visit. Oh, yes, I get one, too.
So I think let's give him another big hand. Thank you, Shweta. We're heading for a break. You know that we're running half an hour late, so um, we will keep the break to about 15, 15 minutes. Let's be back at 3.50. And uh, as usual, just for ease of um, operation, uh, except the last three rows, the other rows will proceed first uh, outside. And there is, uh, for first three rows, the Wheelchair passengers stay back. So, so everybody from the first row, let's uh, let them leave first. That's what I've been told. And let's be back at uh, 3.50, right?
good afternoon and welcome to this last session of the ACM India annual event 2020. And we will be ending on a high note with a presentation by Professor M. Balakrishnan, who, as most of you already know very well, has made pivotal contributions to computer science education and research through the entire country. So Professor Balakrishnan showed his academic prowess early. He graduated at the top of his class, uh, undergraduate class in Bits Pilani. This was in 1977. Then he moved over to IIT Delhi, where he received his PhD in 1985. Subsequently, he worked in various labs and universities in the, both Europe and the US before coming back to his alma mater, that is in IIT Delhi. This was in 1988, and he has been there, there ever since. So in IIT Delhi, Professor Balakrishnan's ability to organize and to educate the community at large was recognized very quickly. So he rapidly rose through the ranks, re initially becoming the head of the computer science department, then moving on to become the dean, and then now to his current position as deputy director of the institute. Something that not all of you would probably know is that he will also is currently in the process of transitioning to becoming the founder vice chancellor of a new Satya Bharti University or Institute of Technology that will be located in Mohali. So in the morning, we heard Jan tell us how technologies can be used to control our cars. Subsequently, in the afternoon, Shwetak told us how we can use technologies to control our bodies. Now, Professor Balakrishnan will tell us how you can use technologies to control the environment around us. Specifically, Professor Balakrishnan has been working on developing various kinds of assistive devices for the physically challenged uh, 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 brethren. And this work has been going on for s uh, the last couple of decades, and it has received uh, several awards, culminating last year in his being awarded the extremely pre prestigious International ACM Eugene Lawler Award for Humanitarian Contributions. <laughs> so in this talk, Professor Balkrishnan will tell us about specifically assistive devices that have been developed in his lab for the visually impaired people, and also chart the trajectory of the work that his lab has done in this particular space. So with this brief introduction, here is Professor Balakrishnan. First of all, I would like to thank uh, ACM India for giving me this wonderful opportunity to talk to you. From the morning, we have had you know, excellent lectures from three very important you know, uh, computer scientists who have contributed. When Shwetak talked about that uh, people had problems, you know, what is he doing with computer science with his work, then I have very serious problems I should face. Yeah? But uh, as you say, World over, just like you know, we say James Bond has license to kill. Professors all over the world has a very unique license. They can do whatever they like. Okay, and so this is actually that flexibility that comes to professors like James Bond, that you know permitted me to do what I am able to do, because clearly you know so this work is on margins of computer science. There are, of course, very good applications of computer science in this work, but there are also applications of many things. It could be mechanical engineering, it could be design, it could be user studies. Because when we start looking at problems, you know, I'm sure Shetak had to collaborate with a lot of people in health practitioners, health sciences, to be able to understand how do we diagnose diseases. 
when it comes to areas like this, you have to talk to the users because those users are the ones who are actually facing those challenges. We cannot even appreciate what are the challenges that ha they have. Very early in the game, I started on this almost 17, 18 years back. Very early, I actually wanted to say that, okay, I will produce a solution for this because I think that this is something that a blind person needs. Very often I was proved wrong because that is something they were extremely comfortable to doing and they didn't need any actually assistance to do that because our perception could be very different, especially when we are not ourselves the users. The startup community understands this very well. They always go for user validation, user functionality, and so on and so forth. Some bigger corporates sometimes get it wrong because if you do not talk to the users often enough. So I think one of the learnings I would like to leave it with the younger people here, younger faculty as well as the students is, this is something that I can claim that we have actually learned. You know, it was a hard learning, but this is something we have learned and we, I would like to share that experience as we go along already mentioned, so I am also in, in a transitioning phase. And <laughs> so the focus of our work is on people with visual impairment. It's a fairly large community, 5 million plus by 2011 census, and it does not include people who actually are visual impairment because of the fact that they are very old. So that's not included here, the way the census actually works with this. We are focused on two things, independent mobility and education very fundamental to inclusion of any person in the society. As far as we are concerned, independent mobility we even put higher than education, but clearly in a technology-driven society like today, education is absolutely critical for inclusion, because at least for vocation. But the problem with independent mobility is, without independent mobility, even education is not possible. A person who is born blind, congenitally blind children, have really very little opportunity to go to school. There are very few schools. There are some schools which have boarding and which are, you know, but these numbers are very small and even people don't have resources to get there because the number of children who could be. And this problem becomes very serious in countries like India and other developing countries where the volume is very large, the number of children who have required this help is very large and whereas the society provides for very limited resources to be able to handle. Education, of course, we all understand how important education is. So what are the independent mobility challenges? And this was what actually triggered us to get into this. This, this problem was actually posed by a blind person whom I came across in a very different context. And he said that the problem we face is we use this white cane, and we use this white cane and which is used globally but when we are walking, suddenly something comes, which I cannot detect with the cane, but it actually projects onto my upper body, and I go and bang onto it. Because I cannot detect it with the cane, because the cane is swept on the ground, I get hurt, and if people get hurt two, three times, they actually lose confidence to even have independent mobility. They don't want to venture out independently. Later on only we realized, at that time, of course, we understood what the problem was, and then he, of course, said many things. And many of these things are unfortunately associated with unstructured environments like ours. It is not a problem. Why is this problem has not been solved? Because rarely occurs in US, Europe, Canada, Japan, where the safety norms on public spaces are much higher. Can you imagine, you know, we do it all the time. We buy an air conditioner and put an air conditioner on the window and block one third of the corridor. Very often, we do it. Even, you know, if you look at a campus, it is happens even in a campus, you know, even in academic spaces, which are the most structured places. Places like IIT are the most structured places. Buy a room cooler and it projects outside. Imagine if there's a corridor and the corridor has been defined by structure to be of a certain width. That's how the architectural drawings have been approved. You have actually no right to block that corridor. You cannot make a corridor which has four feet actually only three feet because you put an air conditioner. It's not allowed. But you know, these are not the norms we are actually used to following. This creates additional problems. On the public roads, we have very often trees, which are trees are outside the footpath, but the, actually the branch that uh, what I have shown is a picture from within the IIT itself. So these are something which is very, very common, and this creates a lot of upper body injury problems. <coughs> Dog sleeping on a road. Not an uncommon sight, uh, I'm sure in many places. So now, 
The way the cane works is it works by contact. The only way you can detect is you make a contact with that particular object, then you know that. And of course, from the contact, the blind person actually can know a lot about the object also, how strong the object is, you know, what is the strength, you know, whether hitting a wood or whether it's a metal or whether it's hitting a surface. All this information is tuned uh, when the person does it. But unfortunately, if you, let's say, want to touch a dog, you do not know what the response of the dog will be, and you also don't know where you are going to touch the dog. So this actually needs a non-contact detection. This is, of course, from IIT Madras, where you could also find a deer, not just a dog, OK? So knee above obstacle detection and knee non-contact detection, these are the two functionalities that we started working on. These are the two important functionalities, which actually white cane does not satisfy. It's a contact detection, and it doesn't detect obstacles above the knee. <coughs> so we came up with this device. Fairly straightforward in terms of physics involved, the science involved. So it's an ultrasonic ranging device. It can work for around three meters, it can detect. And instead of an audio feedback, because uh, user trials very clearly said they don't want any synthetic ad audio. When you are in a public space, outdoor space, they want the out sounds that are surrounding sounds are so important for safety, they didn't want a chattering box here telling two meters, one meter, 1.5 meter. That will be very disturbing. So it has to be much more intuitive. So we have vibratory, <laughs> the handle itself has a vibratory pattern, and the pattern actually gives you an idea of the distance of the obstacle. This complements the white cane functionality. We do not, whatever can be done by white cane, we are not det detecting a puddle, or we're not detecting, uh, let's say, the undulations that are on the road. Those things are still present. Those are all still detected by the white cane, because that's not a problem that they face if they have a trade. <laughs> it's a detachable handle. Canes are very inexpensive in our country, but the canes are also break very often because they are inexpensive. They are made. It's a household industry which makes the canes. There are no stand, you know, strong manufacturing standards, which means that can break. So we didn't want that our device has to be thrown because if the cane gets broken. So it's a detachable handle, suitable for all grips. So this was a very interesting. The software part of it, the electronics part of it, we solved it pretty quickly took around a year and a half to get there, uh, because we are working with undergraduate students. So this is another thing I will talk about in the end. They're also doing their coursework and so on, and some validation trials. But the grip faced a lot of problems, because people hold the cane in many different ways. Just like in all other spaces, in India what happens is when a child or even an adult or whatever, if somebody has lost his eyesight, he or she is just given a cane. There is no training, mobility training that is given, which is fairly standard. You have mobility trainers, and we also have mobility trainers, but we have very few mobility trainers. So only if you happen to be in a metro close to a very good NGO, which has this mobility trainer, you may have access to a mobility trainer. Otherwise, you will get a cane, but you will not get any mobility training. So which essentially meant <coughs> that people hold the cane the way they like. Okay? There are three or four major grips. And we have to adopt our, because we didn't want that once we give this device, they have to actually change the grip that they hold, because that will, then they will not accept the device, because that means that they are used to holding a cane for many years, and now we say that your grip is changed. Making a grip actually, which actually is suitable for all the way that they hold the cane, was actually one of the biggest challenges that we faced in making a device which is acceptable. And there were a lot of you know, interesting uh, molding ideas, mechanical engineering thing that we went. Of course, this low power and chargeable, this is, of course, the part of the research that I used to do in embedded systems. So this was something that we could apply all the low power techniques that are known for such an embedded device and make this fairly um, low power. Once charged, it works for around 14 hours, and then it needs recharging. Normally, two to three hours per day is what they use. So once a week, charging is what was required. The second thing about this is will be of interest to people who would like to get into such you know, device prototyping as well as into large scale production. So one of the challenges was starting from uh, 2005 when we start, first started with a device which looked like you know, a box and not stable and so on and so forth because we were working with students and students had no design idea and even we didn't have much of a design expertise at that time. Finally, we launched the device, which actually looks like this in 2014. Three years of student development, three years of 
user trials and uh, let us say validation with users and all the modifications with the working with the manufacturer to make it production uh, <coughs> both reliable production as well as cost effective but three years was in funding this is a big challenge in this space that getting translational research funding is a very big challenge research funding is not a problem today you can get to the prototype stage but to go from a prototype stage to the stage where it can be manufactured most of these devices require a fair amount of investment and that was a very hard problem but today it's very satisfying you know, satisfying to know that this is what is coming out of an assembly line in chennai so these devices come out and then you know manufactured in batches of 2000 or 3000 and then get distributed and sold both in india and outside to get there we had to do a lot of work which is actually getting braille manuals, actually getting manuals, audio manuals in different languages, which people can download, partnering with NGOs who could do translation in their local language and things like that. So this was all part of the uh, journey. And you know, what did we achieve? Of course, when we started, we didn't see any commercial devices. But we later on realized that a commercial device was launched in UK. Again, from a university, transferred to a company. But uh, for three years, it went out of business. And after three years, it reappeared. Except that their device was at 680 pounds. At the time, pound was around 100 rupees. Now it's, of course, a little lower. And we launched the device at 3,500. So there was absolutely no comparison, and which essentially means they sell number of devices in a year in hundreds, and we sell in 10,000. 10, so that's the type of a difference that comes. And this is something, because they have low volume, because there is a lot of development efforts, costs that are gone. And uh, of course, the fact that we also got uh, charity funding to do our translation research helped to keep the price low. That is very, also very important. Point. Let me move. The other device that I would like to talk about is a device that we developed for public boarding by blind of public buses, boarding by a public buses. Now, we all understand if you are living in a town, if you are even living in a city, the cheapest way to transport all over the globe is actually public buses. Metros are coming, metros are still much more limited, but buses are there all over. And when it comes to buses, you need a solution. How do we I independently board a public bus? Number of bus users who are blind bus users in this country is minuscule. There are only some cities in India where blind people are able to use buses. They just are not able to use. What's the challenge? The challenge is twofold, actually. One is, one thing that we all understand, one problem is I go to a bus stand, and a large number of buses could come to that bus stand. I have to ask somebody what is the route number that has come. I know that I have to go to and for 450, this is the bus I need to take, but I have to ask. You can say it's a simple problem, and mostly this is the way it works. But please remember one thing, and this is something I actually came to know only after engagement. Next time you are asking a question in any public space, just imagine how much profiling you do of the person before you ask the question. Mentally, you do a profiling of whether this particular person is likely to answer your question know the answer, he is in a good mood, he is not irritated, and these days everybody is on their mobile phone in a public space. A blind person doesn't have this luxury. So he has to ask a person, whoever he feels somebody standing, he will ask him, and the responses could be anything. Very irritated, sometimes helpful, sometimes the other person feels empathy, and we also actually seen cases where it has been wrong. People have been put on, just irritated. Tumhari bus aagai. Whichever is the bus, he hasn't even seen what the route number he wants to go. So even that can happen. So this is one challenge. Second challenge is even more complicated and which is very, so this is a type of a situation you will find if you're traveling in Europe where there are lots of buses. This is a type of situation, even if next bus comes, it actually waits behind this bus and once this bus has moved away, it comes and stops at the bay. So the place where you are standing to the entry door of the bus is only a few meters. And more or less, it's in a very small range. Metro is, of course, exact. Even in India, the metro is exact. You stand there, and the gate will come. But even for public buses in developed countries, where there are a lot more 
but that's not the case. This is a situation in Delhi. You can see where are the people standing and where the entry door of the bus is. The other bus is there, this bus just stops behind and then you will pull on to the right and just leave. This is what will happen. And of course the route numbers. And I can assure you this is not the stop with the largest number of route numbers. This is a little bit high, but you could have 70, 80 route numbers coming on one stop. So this is the challenge. And we had done videography of people boarding the bus. And if you had to cover around 95% of the journeys, you had to cover, account for 20 to 23 meters of walking from where you are standing to where the entry door is. How do I cover this 22 meters distance? Unaided, I do not know where the entry door of the bus is. Even let's say somebody has told me that this is your bus has come. How do I actually move? And whether the bus will stop till I actually are able to board. So this is the problem that we looked at and we solved this in a very interesting manner. So, <laughs> we done some very uh, extensive trials on this particular device. So, first of all, what the solution is? So, the solution is a small handheld device. <laughs> the visually impaired person, so we are talking of somebody who can hear, is only a visual impairment. He can hear the, yeah, she can hear the bus coming, approaching. Presses, this particular device has only, it's of the size, it has only two keys. One is query, another is select marked in braille. Query actually does, queries all the buses in the neighborhood. There is an RF communication that happens. All the neighborhood buses respond. It's a small slotted network protocol. Collision detection and avoidance, all of this happens. There's a multiple broadcast if there is a collision. We can handle around eight to 10 buses in the neighborhood. It's all collected. This device speaks out the route number. If the route number is of interest to the person, he or she presses the select button. And if the person presses the select button, the speaker on the bus gives the audio cue by speaking out the same number, and that actually knows that the, this is where the entry door of the bus is. If the bus is moving, it has still not come to the stop, he or she also knows about it because the audio cue also moves. And he can, each time he presses the select, he can get the select button and get the information again and again. So this was the trials which was done in Mumbai. We installed it on 25 buses with 21 users. And the way that the, we conducted the trial, so this is all you know, learning on the fly. How do we actually conduct the trial? There's no documented way of doing trials for this type of a solution. So what we said was, so first we did what's called supervised boarding. We took these people. There was a volunteer along with them and both taught them. We took only those users who are using the public bus. Bombay has a very interesting system. Mumbai police actually helps people, blind people to come. Churchgate and VT is manned by police for the blind people to transfer from trains to buses. So Bombay has a reasonable population of blind people who are using the bus because of the efforts of the Bombay police as well as the municipality or whoever put up the system. So we took those users because otherwise there's liability issues. If they are not used to the bus itself, then there is a problem of conducting the trials. So we did this what's called supervised boardings. We took them, or 100 supervised boardings around these 23, 22 users. And then we said that you go to this particular bus stop. We installed it on two lines, which are running both from Backbury Depot. On two of them, this... Uh, you know, all the 25 buses, 12 buses on one route, 13 buses on the other route, we installed this device. And they said, you go there, note down the time you reached, note down the time you boarded the bus. In the evening, they had to report all such boardings. And if, let's say, it's a 20-minute frequency bus and they waited only for 12 minutes, that means that they boarded the first bus on the line. If they waited more than 20 minutes, that means they missed one bus and then they took the other bus. 92 percentile. 92 percentage of the time, 350 boardings gave us information that they boarded the first bus by themselves. So this was the success of actually conducting the trial. We actually expect that our failure rate was less than 8 percent because the best, the bus company, sometimes changes the buses because of breakdown, because of some other factors. So some of the buses which went on the route may not even have the device. That means that these people would not have been able to find whether that particular bus came. So, but still, 92% success for a blind person to board 
globally this is the first time any such device actually has been developed which allows uh, such a blind person to board the public bus. In Delhi we repeated this, uh, more limited number of users in Delhi who use the public buses is very, very small. We had to figure that out and we had done that in Delhi because clearly all of us who know Delhi and Bombay, we know the difference between the buses in Delhi and Bombay. I'll just show you a small video of the trials in Mumbai. Go back. So this was one of our users who are independently boarded a public bus and we had a number of such recordings available on YouTube also. So this was an experiment and then of course uh, we've been struggling to get a citywide installation done. We still consider to be a synthetic trials primarily because all these users who are working for us. We just want to install it in one city. Users use it for their own day-to-day -day work so that we get a much better uh, evidence. And with that evidence, we have to go for regulation because clearly in this space, only thing that finally works is regulation. It has to be a regulatory requirement to make buses accessible. The government talks about transport being accessible. And so in this particular audience, if anybody knows who is actually help us with CSR or any other funding to be able to go there, we'll be happy. Yeah. So let me switch gears and talk a little bit about our work in the education space. So in education, <coughs> we all know about Braille. I'm sure most of you would have heard about Braille. So Braille is, of course, a script which you can touch and read. Okay. So this script is very popular. You know, it's known that around 240 languages globally use Braille. So if you consider the number of languages which use Braille as a script, perhaps is the most popular script in the world. But what is good about Braille is it's good for text. And so a lot of uh, Braille usage is popular. Of course, it has certain issues because you have to print and read. Now electronic Braille is coming. I will also talk about it. But what is not good about it is it has no mechanism to show diagrams. When we started working in this space, one thing we realized traveling outside, because we also made some contact with uh, organizations in UK like RNIB, which is a, globally it's a very highly technology advanced organization, APH in US, American Printing House. We found lots of books for blind children, right from, you know, grade one, you know, all types of diagrams, all types of maps, all types of science and maths books. And the situation in this country is that government has invested a lot in Braille presses. So you have a lot of science, maths, uh, not science, a lot of books available for children which are in Braille. No dearth of it, highly subsidized, but all of them has no diagrams. No investment has gone into making diagrams for the blind people which essentially meant that today for a blind child in this country to pursue science education, management education, economics, geography, all of this is almost impossible, almost. So people who have succeeded, we have very some cases, we have very, really succeeded. It is the perseverance of their parents that they have succeeded. If you come from a family where parents are educated, they are well off and they put in all their efforts, at least one of the parents really spends time then only a child can actually pursue science education. So the fraction of students who are actually pursuing science education is minuscule as far as the blind is concerned, primarily because there's no material available. And the reason was, this is the American Printing House map book that uh, they have made, and this costs 150 rupees per page. So you can imagine if there are 40, 50 pages of diagrams, and diagrams are exploding. Today everything is becoming visual communication. Even if you look at a second standard book, there are lots of diagrams. Because you know, everything is going from text to you know, images. So, <clears throat> so we started that it was absolutely important for us to work in this space. So we started working in this space. And developed, went end to end. By this time, we were so 
let's say, uh, with the community, we got so involved. So we don't see now, once we see a problem, we try to find collaborations, try to find solutions for that particular problem. Not really bother about how strong CS computer science it's going to be, okay. To be mechanical, it could be designed because we try to house all the people under one roof. And today we have a solution and I will tell you the solution that comes. So it has software component. We had to do some of the techniques that we use for actually <coughs> image processing. It has a 3D printing component. It has a material selection component and many such components actually today has resulted in this. And uh, what is interesting is we have actually managed to create a non-profit startup which is now producing these books in volume. And you know, today you can go to this website, order it, you can also, if any organization wants to produce a book, if let's say Gujarat wants to produce a book in uh, uh, mathematics or science for their 9th, 10th, their state book, we can actually produce them. So we have an organization, around 12 people who are fully working on this pro particular project. It was the last, uh, 2018, August, inaugurated. Now we have at least 150 volumes, some very interesting books, for example, a menstrual <coughs> education for blind women. We have produced 3,000 copies for a UN agency and distributed all over because these are all big challenges in terms of how do they teach these aspects in a particular school or in a, you know, in, in a social environment. So this is the second, pro uh, in the education, this is one project that we are very proud of. We have completed and now it has gone beyond the lab in terms of a startup. Let me talk about the last project that I want to mention. <coughs> I talked about Braille. So Braille is, of course, printed, and clearly we can't print everything. We can't, if you get an email, we can't print it and then read. Nobody does it, okay? Nobody can do it. Data is vast, and printing is expensive, time-consuming, and that's not possible to, for any person to do that. Everything remains electronic. Of course, they have a very good option of sound. Text to speech, today the screen readers, what are called screen readers, are become integral part of all electronic solutions. Your mobile has automatically now comes with a screen reader. So that has become a very common way of reading for visually impaired people. Blind people all over the world, so if you send them a message, they will just listen to it. Problem is when it comes to education, all scientific studies very clearly show reading and writing are complementary skills. You cannot completely do your education just by listening. A lot of things like mathematics and all will be impossible for, we just want to listen equations or make derivations. So it's not really possible to just work with. So this electronic braille. Electronic braille is something which has been there, not today, for at least 30 years. These are called refreshable braille displays, and they have been available to children in the Western countries for 30 years now. People have this, you know, Braille displays which are very popular. Of course, very expensive. The problem is, when it goes to the disability space, these manufacturers are small. You know, big companies like, they are not like big companies like Sony or Philips or Samsung or who are making these. These are all very small companies. Costs of technology, they are small market. And and very proprietary and patented. So it is very hard to break this barrier. So the Braille displays that were available in the market, they were at least $50 per cell. So that means if you had to have a Braille display which is 40 cells, that means you can read 40 characters in one row. It was not available for anything less than $3,000. And in countries like India, not even schools had it. Forget about children. Even the schools have not seen this electronic braille because they were just too expensive. So we had to absolutely start from the scratch because even the cell, because there are only two manufacturers of cell, one Japanese and German, and all the device manufacturers using those cells and putting them together. And again, because of this patenting, so we started working on a completely different technology using shape memory alloys. We actually, with some very bright mechanical engineering students from IIT, worked for many years, and today we have cells which are, you know, <coughs> we are hoping to reduce the price in the market by at least a fourth to what is done. And these are the two devices that we launched uh, in February of this year. Production volumes are still a challenge. We are getting there. We are today having a very small volume production. But by summer, we are expecting that we will be able to get them out in larger volumes. There's a lot of demand. A lot of people want it, even you know, outside. So this is what you see on the 
left is a 20 cell display and what you sell, see on the right is a 40 cell display. So these are completely standalone. They can work, you can do document editing, you can do web surfing, you can do all of this. With te textual data you can do uh, internet surfing and so on and so forth, email and so on. So it's like a small laptop for a blind person who wants to use the braille, okay. <clears throat> Again, so that's the price differential that we are talking about to be able to make. Even at 40,000, it's very expensive. It's not still cheap, but we are hoping that this will actually help us to get at least to a larger volume than uh, what we have. And of course, there are people who are ready to help in terms of CSR. There are a lot of other works we are doing, which are still in the lab, which is sort of not reached the user. So I'm not spending, going to spend much time on it. But what we learned in doing this was users were extremely important. So in all this, user-centric design is something, you know, it's not custom design. So this is another problem that we have. We have actually going around, because now I've been in this space, so I get invited to many conferences, even many design contests, awards, and so on. There are a lot of people who have actually created very nice solutions, sometimes out of student projects, sometimes some professionals. But they are custom solutions, they are made for one individual. Because I get attached, maybe it is somebody I know, or somebody I come across, and uh, I am technologically savvy, so I create a solution. But the problem is, those are not scaling. Those are all only, that only helps that particular person. Of course, somebody spent time to actually create a custom solution. So there is a lot of, both information, there's also funding, there's also a lot of the ecosystem for actually scale such solutions is also one of the challenges that we face. Where the demand is very high, the number of people who need these solutions is very large, but we are not able to do that. Affordability is a huge challenge. And <laughs> infrastructure, this is again, when you talk about mobility, I talked about the bus and I talked about the smart cane. Clearly, these are not solutions which are going to come from outside this country. Reason is very simple. They don't face the problem. Why would they solve if you are not even aware of what the problem is? How it is. So that way, I would say there's a huge, for the students in the audience, there's a huge innovation space here. There is a set of problems that are awaiting for your, <coughs> both knowledge as well as your enterprise to be able to solve them because they are not going to be solved by anybody else because they occur in situations which are our situations. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, there are challenges, but there's also a lot of opportunities, and those opportunities are unique infrastructural challenges. I talked about high volume, developing innovation and startup ecosystem is an opportunity today. And policy environment is getting better. There's definitely some improvement in terms of policy environment, because today we have <coughs> government has created certain reservation, affirmative action for people with disability in banks, in insurance companies, and so on and so forth. So today, if some, there are people who like to learn it because then they can get employed and they can actually get a job and make their own livelihood, not being dependent. Because our estimate is almost 98% of the blind people today are just not there. They are outside of the scope of the society. They are at their homes. They are being supported by their family to be able to live in an almost like an isolated environment. This is the type of a situation that exists because they are not registered with any organization. No NGO knows about it, nobody knows about it, and they're just sitting, and so that's, you know. <clears throat> so one of the issues that to take these solutions to the, <clears throat> one of the problems that we faced right from the beginning was very unorganized. There is no organization who knows the names, addresses, and so on and so forth of people who have the disability. So, and all the NGOs are pretty small. They have some intellectual capital. They have some people who can actually look at these problems and help them, and they have some funding channels. So they all work with 200, 300, 400 people in their particular city. Are. So we created a huge network of NGOs across, and these are all investments that we have made with our smart cane, which have actually helped us in taking other things, like tactile diagrams today, for example, are going through the same channel partners that we have been able to create. I would like to sum up. So today, is the, for the smart cane, the first device I talked about, we have 70,000 devices which have been sold in India. Around 3,000 devices outside India. We don't have a big uh, market outside because we don't have the type of partners to train and so on and so forth. 
1,500 devices in 22 other countries. <coughs> on board, I talked about, we've done a pilot on 25 best and 15 DMTS buses in Delhi, waiting for funding, tactile diagrams. So we have an incubated company, and today, by this time, we have at least created something like three to 4,000 tactile books. Uh, <coughs> and braille displays, we are looking at volume, production, and design. Many, many people, this is clearly not a work that, you uh, know, these are just the important people or critical people who have come into, <coughs> I come in contact, they help me, they associate it. The Pender Manocha is very important, he's a blind person but extremely technologically savvy and he has mentored, he has created, he has actually given us the problems and he vetters the, you uh, know, he runs a now uh, NGO called Saksham Trust. Initially he was with NAB, National Association of Blind and really helped. Rohan is one of our early students. Today he is my colleague. He's a faculty member in computer science department. <coughs> but he was an st undergraduate student when he started this work, and he has been very committed throughout his education, even after he left IIT. Mohsudan Rao is a mechanical engineering professor, and there's a very interdisciplinary work. So a lot of these things happen only when you jump across the departments. And Shashi is a manufacturer in Chennai, took a lot of personal initiative, and IIT Madras alum, <coughs> Pulkit and Suman, some of our, you know, Pulkit is a B.Tech mechanical, many opportunities, but stayed back in the lab for the last five years, working with us to work on this. And <coughs> Piyush is a PhD student who is just graduating now, has been the manager. Just to end my talk, I started as finding solutions, started working with undergraduates. I liked it because undergraduate students were extremely clued into it. They enjoy doing this type of a work because we are building projects, we are trying to make a difference in the lives of the people. But over a period of time, we realized that there are also deeper problems that need to look, be looked at. So today we have four PhD students who are working in various aspects of, <coughs> again, all of them in the space of trying to make the lives, education and mobility of the visually impaired. So <coughs> from uh, navigation issues, for the visually impaired because even the type of landmarks to be detected, everything is different when it comes to a blind person. So what works, uh, <coughs> Google Map, which works extremely well for it, is actually, does, it has some help, but it is not of a big help. Even with a screen reader, it's not effective. So we're looking at those issues. Uh, Richa has looked at tactile, how do we make these tactile diagrams effective? We have a very nice project with University of Birmingham now on accessing maths by visually impaired. And indoor lake localization and navigation for the blind is another challenge that I have another PhD student. Yesterday I was asked what is the goal, and I said that I will put it on my last slide. So this is the goal that we work with. So we like to make a difference. So Shetak, of course, has already achieved his landmark of millions. We are very far from it. We are at 120, 130,000. But we would like to make a difference in a million people, in blind people, all over. So uh, thank you, Professor Balkrishnan, for an extremely inspiring and literally illuminating talk. So I think we can host a few questions uh, from the audience. If you raise your hands, we can bring the mic over to you. So really inspiring talk. Uh, my question is, uh, you know, we had a talk earlier today by Jan about uh, the uh, ML for uh, vision. So uh, it seems to me that there is a lot of opportunity there uh, to help these people. So what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so there are a lot of research happening in the lab. I collaborate with uh, Professor Chetan Arora, who works in computer vision. And today we have a device. <coughs> we call it mobility assistant for visually impaired. Prototypes have been tested. And uh, next testing will happen on roads which can you know, do something like what we're saying. It can detect a dog, it can detect a cow, it can detect the type of environment. It can read our multilingual signboards, which are hand-painted signboards, so the normal fonts don't work. So this is a device which we are working on. Ravi is a project on reading assistant for visually impaired. We are using many AI techniques to be able to classify documents and to make, you know, for example, if I had to read a scientific document, and there is a lot of mathematics onto it, rendering it in a form which is actually comprehensible by a blind person is a big challenge because you cannot just read linearly a huge equation. It's not possible. On the fly, you have to decompose it, form, 
structures and then read it out so that it, so this is a problem that we are looking again and image processing, AI based image processing techniques to do that. Camera being, you see after all finally the vision is all about, visually impaired is not about and the camera being so inexpensive today and so much of compute power, it's a huge opportunity to work in this space. But then the challenge is to produce something which actually is usable. <laughs> Lab experiments and to show that it's relatively easy but working with the users to be able to make usable. And this is a space that we have made some progress. Today we are two blind people who work in the lab. They are able to test whatever we do. And that's an ecosystem that we have been able to create. But yes, I know considerable, you know, enormous opportunities to use the uh, AI techniques, especially related to vision, because that's, and also other sensors that Shetak talked about. There's a role for everything. So when you are doing indoor navigation, so the thesis that is happening in indoor navigation actually uses all the sensors. It just doesn't use the vision because <coughs> for a blind person, it is not enough to say that it is 30 meters. You have to go to the, let's say, to the, take the lift and it's 30 meters is not good enough because the orientation is itself is a challenge. Because when I can see, I can know that, okay, 30 meters I have to go. But let's say if I'm standing here and 30 meters, I will, blind person will go 30 meters in front. But how do we know that is the direction? So accelerometer and, you know, gyro and all of this comes extremely handy to be able to classify and give an orientation. So as soon as you translate into visually impaired, the challenges are there. And these are solutions which are actually you know, wonderful opportunity to work on it. But solutions which will actually work on the field is a challenge because there are a lot of testing and validation that need to be done with the users. Uh, so I actually had a question. Uh, clearly the work that you did was, uh, was an excellent example of interdisciplinary synergy because you brought in materials engineering, mechanical, electrical and so on. But what is the mantra to get a team of people working together because they're coming through very different uh, backgrounds mm -hmm. and uh, demographics and zones and interests and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you keep them sustained over a long period like what you have done? I think right partner, I have had right partner. So of course, you know, in academics, you know, you know, two professors working together itself is a huge challenge. Okay, so this, you know, we all understand, you know, so I think our citation index and our ego index are both of them sometimes match very well. Okay, <coughs> so the challenge is, is, of course, the advantage is once you get into this space, and initial days were difficult. There are some students who are really got into it, and that's why I put this Rohan slide. You know, they're the type of people who somehow, from their background, you know, so not surprisingly, both his parents are AIMS doctors into public service and grew up as a child as a person who wanted to be in public service. Okay, so those are coincidences. But now what I've seen is I get connected to people I have my students as well, my staff coming from all over because they just heard that this is happening. There's some urge in them. So I have, for example, the person who is working on reading assistant is actually a person who came to my lab when he was losing his eyesight. And he has a degenerative disease and it was made very clear to him that over a period, it may be six months, one year, two years, three years, he would actually become blind. Okay, that's very clear to him. And he did in electrical engineering, but he came to know to the lab to use the tools we had in the lab, and then finally decided to join for a PhD program with us. And today he's doing wonderful work in making, because I have now a person who has actually done differential equations, a blind person, or almost near blind person, who actually has studied all the you know, electrical engineering differential equations. So now he actually understands how the equations are. And now rendering it and working on rendering it is much more easier with him than to take any arbitrary person and make it. So he has a problem, he has also has experience. So you get, do get connected to people who are wanting to make a difference and that's an advantage that you have. And IITs provide that opportunity because they have a, you know, both a visibility as well as. Okay, so let us thank Professor Bhaktishan again for a wonderful talk. that showed how blind we are to the opportunities around us. Okay. So as a small token of appreciation from the organizers, I'd like to present you a memento.
Uh, we will now move on to the last session, which would be by Maria Chaudhary. So all good things have to come to an end. On behalf of ACM India, I would like to thank each one of you for taking the time to be with us here today. I would like to thank our ACM HQ team. They had to leave early today, but uh, they traveled all the way here. Our ACM CEO and Executive Director, Vicky Hansen, President Cherry Pancake, uh, she was also a speaker at the ACMW event that was held here. We would also like to thank Pat Ryan, and the CEO of ACM. All this is possible through all the volunteer effort. We would like to thank ACM Ahmedabad and Gandhinagar chapters and the office bearers for spearheading this initiative of having the ACM annual event here at Gandhinagar. Thank you very much. I, I would also like to thank the director and dean of IIT Gandhinagar, Sudhir Jain, Professor Neil Dara, for all her efforts. And the the CS department, all of you lovely volunteers, and the institutional support staff. <laughs> On the ACM side, I would like to thank our ACM India CEO, Shekhar Sir, uh, our Executive Director, Hemant Mandi, Professor Abhiram Ranade, the President, and all the council members and the committee members. Thanks very much, everybody. We would also like to thank all of the speakers who are here. I'm not naming each any specific one, but all the speakers who have been here today for the IRIS event, ACMW, as well as the ACM and today's event, the annual event. Thank you very much for all the information and the info, informative insight you provided to all the kids. This is like, has, has been a big eye opener for all of us. Thank you very much for all the research you all are doing for the community. For the IRIS event, I would like to thank the steering committee headed by Professor Giant and team. I would like to thank the IRIS program committee and the local organizing committee. A big thank you to the ACMW team. Aarti Dixit, who especially came here from the US. Hina Tamani, who's heading the efforts here. ACMW chair, and all her ACMW council, who have helped provide a new sense of direction to all the girl students. Thank you for setting an exemplary standard for us. <laughs> we would also, the strength we would like to thank the industry for contribution towards this event. Our notable sponsors, TCS, Persistent Systems, Google, iCertis, and MSR. Our strength lies in our numbers and in the ability of our ACM chapters both students and professionals to work together. I will encourage each one of you to be members of ACM, form student chapters. Each year annually, ACM hosts a chapter award for students with an award of one lakh. I would encourage you all to try for that. And last but not the least, I would like to call Professor Neldara and the entire team of volunteers to be with here 
on the stage today. Please give them a standing ovation. I would like to uh, ask our ACM uh, leadership team to also come on stage. ACM India chapter members, as well as the Ahmedabad and Gandhinagar chapter members, please join us on stage. As well as our sponsors. I think there's some people at the back. <laughs> Thanks again for all your efforts. We would also like to uh, have the ACM team on, on the stage for a group for a photo. especially our industry supporters. Please come and join us on stage. Isertus, persistent. Right. Yes. PGN, please join us on stage. We're missing you here. Professor Madhavan, we're waiting for you. Is right there. Thanks once again, and we close this session. So, one quick announcement for the students before you leave. Okay. Professor Shwetak Patel has very kindly agreed to have a session with the students, as he was saying in his speech in his talk also. He is here for the students. Uh, so, we'll be heading now to a breakout room, block 5202. You can follow all of us and Professor Shwetak Patel. Uh, he wants to have a chat with you to, to know more about your work and I'm sure he'll share a lot of good tips with you. <laughs>